Section 16 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Wednesday 4. I preached on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, at Maybury's Chapel, made anew, now 60 by 25 feet. I was a preacher here before the first house was built, 30 years ago. First an addition was made. Now it is rebuilt in another form, and a gallery added for the blacks. I rode home in the rain with Peter Pelham. Here is death temporal, and life spiritual. Thomas Pelham was converted, and is dead since my last visit. And there remain three living children, newborn babes. Thursday 5. I preached at the camp meeting house, and on Friday at Hobbs Chapel. Although very weak, I administered the Lord's Supper, after preaching a sermon on Titus 3, 8. I went in the evening to the widow Weiches. Saturday 7. At Wolsey's barn, I spoke on 2 Corinthians three twelve. There were few people. We had a stormy day and a poor, weary preacher. I dined with Ira Ellis and rode up to Edward Drumgould's. The wife of my old friend is lingering out life. Virginia, Sunday, 8. I spoke on 2 Peter 3, 7-11, through 11, at the Olive Branch Chapel. I am taking leave of the people every visit. I have made up 1,000 miles from Augusta, Georgia, to Brunswick County, Virginia. In old Virginia, I have administered the word 30 years. There is a great mortality amongst the aged. Our old members drop off surprisingly. But they all, by account, die in the Lord, and in general, triumphantly. Now I have finished my awful tour of duty for the past month. To ride twenty and thirty miles a day. To preach, baptize, and administer the Lord's Supper. To write and answer letters, and plan for myself and four hundred preachers. O Lord! I have not desired this awful day, thou knowest. I refused to travel as long as I could, and I lived long before I took upon me the superintendency of the Methodist Church in America, and now I bear it as a heavy load. I hardly bear it, and yet dare not cast it down, for fear God and my brethren should cast me down for such an abandonment of duty. True it is, my wages are great. Precious souls here, and glory hereafter. Tuesday 10 Our Virginia conference began in Mecklenburg County, Salem. We sat six hours a day, and wrought with great application. We had an addition of fifteen preachers, besides two dead, seven located, one expelled. So there was a gain of eight. I liked what was done. Only... The preacher's experiences, the state of the work, and the circuits were not given. So we concluded to recommend a session of six days for the next yearly conference, appointed to be held at Edmund Taylor's, North Carolina, March 1, 1805. What I have felt was only known to the Lord. What I have done was for God and His Church. We have added, after a great mortality, 1,000 members to the Virginia Conference Bounds. Saturday 14. We came away with Elders Jackson, George, and Pinnell. On the Sabbath day we stopped at John Rogers's, Brunswick County, and I preached from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. After sermon we rode to Peter Robinson's, Nottoway County, 15 miles. Monday 16. We stopped at John Morgan's, Amelia County. Serious times in this family. Two sons dead. Young men. We put in for the night at Nathan Anderson's, Chesterfield County. Next day, a long ride of 45 miles brought us to Elisha Maxey's. We have lately had moderate rides, but heat and dust. Our meetings were small, as the people had but partial notice. I ordained Elisha Maxey deacon. Wednesday 18. 
We crossed at Judah's Ferry, upon James River, and came on to Goochland Courthouse, forty-five miles, and lodged with Joseph Perkins. Next day brought us to John Lasley's, Louisa County. On Friday we had to be at the hills of Orange and Madison counties, to Robinson River, and once more sheltered under the roof of our brother, Henry Fry. He was laboring under a weakness of his bowels. I gave him Father Gill's recipe. It is thus. One ounce of bark, half an ounce of rhubarb, three nutmegs, all boil together in a gallon until reduced to two quarts. A wine glass of this to be taken every two hours. On Saturday we had a powerful rain, but we were under the lee of a good room. Part of the Sabbath day was taken up with a short ride of fifteen miles to Nicholas Robler's Culpepper. I have read John Smith's view of the Last Judgment. I think it elegant and spiritual. Monday evening brought us to William Suttles, in Prince William, thirty-five miles. And on Tuesday we reached William Waters's, after a ride of nearly forty miles without food or rest, as we were disappointed at the place we had expected to get our dinner at. I had heedlessly thrown off my top coat for a few hours, and caught cold. Friday 27. Our conference began in Alexandria. On Saturday I preached in the new chapel. The business of conference was taken up on Monday and Tuesday, and conducted in great peace. On Wednesday we came to Georgetown, and I visited Wilson Lee, ill with the bleeding of the lungs. We lodged at Biggerley's. On Thursday we came to Baltimore. Maryland, Monday, May 7. Our general conference began. What was done, the revised form of discipline will show. There were attempts made upon the ruling eldership. We had a great talk. I talked little upon any subject, and was kept in peace. I preached but twice. Thursday 24. I came off to Perry Hall on my way to Soudersburg to meet the Philadelphia Conference. The Lord did not own the ministerial labors of the General Conference. It was a doubt if any souls were converted. This made us mourn. I prayed for hundreds, but God did not answer my prayer. Pennsylvania, Friday 25. We came to Jarrett's and dined, and continued on to Benjamin Manifold's. On the Sabbath we crossed the Susquehanna at M. Call's Ferry, and came to Martin Bohm's. I preached at Bohm's Chapel, and then came away to Soudersburg. The conference opened on Monday morning, 28. We had great order. We sat five days and a half. There were 125 preachers present whose characters and experiences were brought before us. I preached twice. Saturday, June 2. I rode through the rain to the valley, twenty-eight miles. On the Sabbath day I reached Radnor. Here my little Jane was horned by a cow, and lamed. She is done, perhaps, forever for me. But it may be all for the best. I am unwell, and the weather is bad. But, except my feelings for the poor beast, I am peaceful and resigned. I was able to write, but not to preach, on the Sabbath day. On Monday morning I desired Isaac James to ride thirty miles, going and coming, and purchase me another little Jane, at eighty dollars. He did so with great good will. I came to Philadelphia and found that Richard Allen had bought me a horse for ninety dollars. So I had two one to sell for sixty dollars. So much for my haste. New Jersey. On Tuesday I dined at Burlington and lodged at H. Hamilton's. Wednesday evening brought us to Joseph Hutchinson's. At Brunswick we dined next day, stopping for the night with Mr. Flat, Rahway. And on Friday passed through Elizabethtown and Newark, and reached New York. New York, Saturday 9. Busy answering letters. On the Sabbath I preached in our house in John Street, 
on Hebrews 10, 23-25. It was an open season. Monday 11. We spent some time in social conference with the preachers. Today Mr. Thomas Lyell spoke out in a letter to me, saying that he wished to be located. I thought that I had discovered his designs, and those of Mr. Dashiell, during the sitting of the General Conference in Baltimore. I am willing that he should belong to the church people. I believe they have more need of him than the Methodists have. I answered Mr. Lyell by telling him that I would do what I could to procure him a location at the Boston Conference. It may suffice to say that our present conference was a happy one, and a conference of great business. We had sermons every day at noon. Fourteen deacons and eight elders were ordained, these last at the Bowery Church, where I preached upon 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. By hard labor I read off the stations on Saturday night, and our conference sat on Monday. We proclaimed a fast, with prayer, for the Methodists, the health of the city, the general church, and the continent. N. Snethen gave us a melting, nervous discourse on the occasion. Wednesday 20 and the next day I was kept by a storm within doors, at the widow Sherwood's. I wrote letters. I read Brother Thatcher's answer to Mr. Taggart's book. It is said there is a special call for learned men to the ministry. Some may think so, but I presume a simple man can speak and write for simple, plain people, upon simple, plain truths. Friday 22. It still continued to rain, but I felt uneasy and came down three times to move eastward. William Thatcher came home and told me Sylvester Hutchinson had brought his horse over the North River, at seven o'clock last night, to accompany me. We set off and called in our way at Mr. Sheets and breakfasted. We found Sister Bassling sick. Connecticut We dined at Byram, drank tea at Stamford, and lodged with Brother Day at Norwalk. The rain made the ride painful. Saturday, 23. We rode to Brother Wheeler's, dined and rode on to New Haven. We have a good turnpike to travel on, and a good bridge to cross the Housatonic. Sabbath Day 24. I preached to a few souls in our small house on Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. My chief suffering is from riding. I am under the necessity of riding soft, fearful as I am of worse effects, and my blanket makes me gall sadly. As yet I have been little affected with the piles, thanks to my good God. O New Haven, thou seat of science and of sin, can thy dry bones live? Lord, thou knowest. Brother Branch preached this afternoon, and Brother Hutchinson at night. I have little leisure to journalize. My soul has constant peace and joy, notwithstanding my labors and trials and reproach, which I heed not, though it come, as it sometimes does, from the good, when they are not gratified in all their wishes. People unacquainted with the causes and motives of my conduct will always, more or less, judge of me improperly. Six months ago, a man could write to me in the most adulatory terms, to tell me of the unshaken confidence reposed in me by preachers and people. Behold, his station is changed, and certain measures are pursued which do not comport with his views and feelings. Oh, then I am menaced with the downfall of Methodism, and my influence, character, and reputation are all to find a grave in the ruins. First, my hill is made so strong that I shall never be moved. Anon, O man, thou hidest thy face, and changest thy voice, and I must be troubled, forsooth. But I am just as secure as ever, as to what man can do or say. Should this journal ever see the light, those who read it when I am gone may perhaps wonder that ever I should have received such letters, or had such friends. Yes, gentle reader, both have been. Whom then shall I believe? 
and whom shall I trust? Why, whom but a good and true and never failing God? On Monday the 25th, we took the path to Durham. Here we stopped, as there was room for us in the inn to lodge. On Tuesday we passed through Middletown, and found that our brethren were about to purchase a lot on which to build a chapel on a small scale. We rode on to Hebron. I have made four hundred and twenty miles since I took my departure from Baltimore. At Canterbury we lodged at Captain Lyons's. The day's ride brought us through Wyndham and Scotland. Friday, 29. We came through Plainfield, Stirling, Skituit, and Coventry to Cranston, and stopped at General Lippitt's. Sabbath, July 1. I preached to a few people at Lippitt's Chapel. My subject was 1 John 1, 3-7. It was a gracious season to the speaker and the hearers. Sylvester Hutchinson, my traveling companion, gave them a sermon in the afternoon. I came this way only to hear how the preachers had conducted their work. Rhode Island, July 2. We rode through Providence, dined five miles beyond, towards Attleboro, and housed with a Mr. Guilds. Massachusetts, Tuesday 3. We journeyed through Rentham and Medfield to Needham, nearly thirty miles, without food or rest for man or beast. We passed Weston, and came into Waltham in the evening. On Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday I rested and read and wrote as my failing eyes would permit. My soul is in great peace. Saturday 7. A very sultry ride of twenty miles brought us to the pleasant town of Lynn. On the Sabbath day I preached upon 1 John 3, 1 through 3. The state of the society in this town is more pleasing than formerly. Peter Jane, brought up amongst them, is an acceptable preacher. A house is begun for the preachers to live in. Sylvester Hutchinson preached in the afternoon. I spoke also, and read letters giving an account of the work in the South. Oh, when shall we see such things in New England? Monday 9. We rode to Salem, Beverly, Wyndham, Hamilton, Ipswich, Rowley, and Newburyport, and so on to Salisbury. We had flies, mosquitoes, Heat, dust, and weariness. We lodged at the sisters' Eaton's. New Hampshire. Passing through Seabrook on Tuesday, we saw one, once of our despised order, robed in his gown, and sitting in his house like a gentleman, whilst we were beating along like Jonah. Well, the end is all. Our route carried us through Seabrook, Hampton Falls, Exeter, where there is an elegant meeting house, and Epping. Today and yesterday we dined at taverns. Wednesday 11. At Epping I preached on Acts 26, 18, 19. We had an open time. Thursday brought us through Lee, Dover, and Berwick to Alfred. On Friday we passed Doughty's Falls on the way to Standish, and landed at Buxton. Saturday 14. We opened our conference. We admitted and elected nine deacons and two elders. We had preaching on Friday and today. Sabbath 15. We opened by prayer and exhortation at eight o'clock. At half after ten o'clock I took my stand in the woods, but in about forty minutes the rain fell. There were powerful exercises in the meeting-house, until near six o'clock. The Lord appeared. Several souls were brought under distress. I trust the fruits of this day's labor will be seen in eternity. Monday 16. We had preaching and the ordination in the woods. My subject was Second Timothy 3, 1-7. It was an open time and the work of God broke forth upon the right hand and upon the left. On Tuesday we hasted the work of the conference, and concluded, after appointing our next session at Lynn, 
July 12, 1805. Wednesday 18. It is reported there were fifty souls converted to God. The work continued last night. This morning we took our departure, came to Lymington, crossed Saco River, dined at Dr. Cochran's, and came on through Limerick to Effingham, the first town in New Hampshire, putting up for the night at Lord's Tavern. On Thursday we passed Ossipi Bridge, and came nine miles through the woods. We dined at Knight's House, and kept on to Sandwich, rested a while at William Webster's, and then pushed on to Center Lake and Harbor. We had four hours of heavy rain, and rocks, hills, and dales to Chamberlain's. We started away through New Hampton, Bridgewater, and New Chester, dined, and went forward to Alexander and Grafton. We felt willing to stop at Deacon Hoyt's for a night. The morning found us under way over the Isinglass Hills, which furnished the windows of the country with lights. It was cold to purpose. I could have borne a third coat very well on this July 21st. We dined at Mr. Haynes's in Canaan. At a short warning, I spoke to about fifty or sixty souls, on 1 Timothy 4, 7, 8. We came on through Enfield. Upon the banks of the pond I saw the settlement of the Shakers. Poor souls! They have landed where all other sects have landed. Oh, this love of the world! But the Shakers are near the end of the world. They forbid to marry. They are as the angels of heaven. I came to Hanover Town, and lodged at Mr. Hall's. I have traveled, by computation, 746 miles from Baltimore. O oh, New Hampshire, thy perpetual hills and rocks! Alas, poor people! Alas, poor, suffering preachers! Sabbath 22 I preached in the evening at Hanover, on Philippians 3, 8, 9. On Monday we came on through Lebanon and Plainfield, and crossed Connecticut River into Vermont, at Heartland. Vermont We called at Windsor, a beautiful town upon the river, of about one hundred houses. Mr. Spooner entertained us with pleasure. We passed through Wethersfield and Springfield, and stopped at Rockingham, lodging with Captain Williams. Forty miles today. Tuesday, 24. We came in haste to Westminster, to breakfast. This is another pleasant little town. It may have fifty houses. At Putney we found a stream, mills, a store, and a tavern. Passing over a slate ridge, and through Damerston, we came to Brattleboro, which we found a pleasant place, with the advantage of a stream, well employed as a mill power. At Guilford we rested with Mr. Jacobs, from three o'clock in the evening until Wednesday morning, at five o'clock, when we took our departure from our host and from the state of Vermont. At Greenfield in Massachusetts we breakfasted, having passed Barnardston, the first village we entered in the state. We started away again to Deerfield, and Conway, and Ashfield, and Plainfield, and Comington, and Windsor, and Dalton, and Pittsfield, and Richmond, and so out of the state. But I was glad to stop fifteen miles short of Pittsfield, after riding over dreadful hills and rocks forty-five miles. We lodged at a tavern, weary, weary enough. We took our breakfast with Robert Green in Pittsfield. Here we crossed the head branch of the Housatonic River, that winds its way by Stratford down through Connecticut into the sea. New York, Thursday, 26. We lodged at David Wager's in the state of New York. Next day we directed our course through Claverack, and came into Robert Sands's, Rhinebeck, about five o'clock. My mind hath been cheerfully happy, and mostly in prayer. I was sometimes ready to wish I had no company, and no observations to make, to hinder my constant communion with God. I suffered from hunger, and was skinned several times. Since I left New York, I have spent fifteen dollars, feeding man and beast by the way. 
and my companions were also obliged to do so. I have seen the sufferings of our preachers, and they have awakened all my sympathies. Seventeen times we dined, fed, or supped at taverns, and well it was we had these to go to, else we had been starved. We have crossed the east and west ends of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and have ridden about three hundred miles in the state of New York. Saturday, 23. I preached in the chapel at Rhinebeck, on Psalm 126, 3-6. It was a good beginning of the quarterly meeting. I visited the family of F. Gerritsen. Sabbath 29. We had our feast of charity, and the Lord's Supper followed. I preached in an orchard upon Matthew 11, 3-6. We had about 1,000 hearers. I rested at Brother Garretson's. On Tuesday we rode forty miles to Oliver Ledoux's Fish Kill Hook. We called up the family at nine o'clock, and went to rest at half after ten o'clock. Wednesday, August 1. We rose at five o'clock, and rode, fasting, over the rugged hills of Peekskill and Fishkill. But we were willing to walk at times. We breakfasted with William Lickley, from Aberdeen, Scotland. He has been about forty years in the New World. We came on to Esquire Kirby's, and, having dined in haste, pushed on, and came, an hour in the night, to my home at the Widow Sherwood's. We have ridden fifty miles today, over a path so rough and uneven we could not get along fast. This hasty work interrupts that close communion with God my soul longeth after. I have made, I judge, one thousand and fifty miles since I left Baltimore, and there still remain one thousand miles between me and Mount Gerizim, the seat of our conference, for the first of October next. Thursday and Friday I devoted to rest, reading, writing, meditation, and prayer. On Saturday I came alone to New York. Sabbath 5 I preached at the North Church upon Matthew 16, 24, to the end of the chapter. I felt some opening. At the old house in John Street, my subject was 1 Timothy 6, 6-8. through eight. York, in all the congregations, is the valley of dry bones. O Lord, I lament the deplorable state of religion in all our towns and cities. New Jersey, Monday 6. We crossed the river in a calm, but we were dripping by the time we came to Newark. Here we rested two hours, then hastened on to Elizabethtown, dined, and kept on to Rahway. The night brought us up at Amboy, with Benjamin Drake. Tuesday 7. We had a rainy morning. We have our ancient seasons, plentiful rains and cold weather. This will prevent the fevers. Mr. Lyell has engaged with Mr. Pilmore's old congregation at 450 pounds a year. So, farewell to Tommy Lyell. I hope it may end well. We got as far as Joseph Hutchinson's. End of section 16. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 17 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Pennsylvania, Wednesday, 8. I had a sweet solitary ride to H. Hancock's. The next day found me breakfasting at Burlington, and by two o'clock I had reached Henry Manley's retreat. My mind is devoted to God. I had a pensive letter from Elder M. Klasky, lamenting the death of his son. But one, but only one. Alas! I wrote to Smith, Chandler, and Colbert, presiding elders. I preached once at St. George's, upon Luke 17, 5, at the Academy in the Afternoon, on 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Delaware, Monday, 13. I came away from the city to breakfast with Sister Withy. 
I dined with Alan M. Lane and lodged with J. Hersey. Forty-five miles today. Maryland, Tuesday, 14. I took breakfast at Northeast, ordained James Cook a deacon, and came on to Perry Hall. Forty-five miles today. I found the family of P. H. absent. They are gone to Bath. Wednesday, 15. I rested, being stiff and sore. My poor beast should have had three days to perform that which she has done in two. She shall rest three days in Baltimore. Thence to Mount Gerizim she will have only twenty miles a day or less to travel. Next day I came alone to Baltimore. Here I remained. Sabbath 19. I preached in Light Street Church. My subject was Luke 14, 25 through 27. At three o'clock I preached at Mr. Otterbin's on 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. This has been an open day with me. I am inclined to think preaching must be in the lanes and streets of the cities. I advised the preachers to go out to the churchyards. To the sisters I recommended more frequent prayer meetings. I revised the revised form of the spiritual part of our discipline. I had long wished to separate the most excellent from the excellent. Monday 20. I began my western tour, bending my course up to Cornelius Howard's, thence to Macklefresh's, and lodged with Alexander Warfield upon Sam's Creek. The heat was tempered in some measure by a breeze from the west. My appointment at Linganoo Chapel was not generally known. I preached to a few and went to dine with Ephraim Howard. We reached Friend Shalmadine's in the evening. Virginia, Wednesday, 22. We had showers to Brother Reynolds's. We passed through Sharpsburg and lodged at Shepherdstown. I was informed of a camp meeting held near Charlestown, Jefferson County, at which between sixty and seventy souls professed to be converted to God. The meeting held nine days. On Thursday I started, and next day breakfasted with Mrs. Goff at Bath. I found Mr. Lyell here, his mind deeply engaged with his new design. He was very attentive to me. After resting three hours, I came away to William Dimmitz. Saturday, 25. Starting at six o'clock, I made fourteen miles to Clark's Tavern to breakfast, through mountain rain and over mountain roads. After a long absence, I came once more to John Jacobs's. From him I had the awful account of the awful end of Joseph Cromwell. He had walked backward, according to his own account. Three days he lost in drunkenness. Three days he lay sick in darkness. No manifestations of God to his soul. And thus he died. We can only hope that God had mercy on him. Compare this with what I have recorded of his labors and his faithfulness in another part of my journal. O oh, my soul, be warned. Brother Jacobs preached his funeral sermon and gave a brief sketch of his life, his fall, and his death. His text was, Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. How appropriate the choice! I have traveled through great heat. The people are generally sickly. But I have got along 160 miles since I left Baltimore. Thank the Lord and kind friends. Sabbath 26 I had a meeting at Old Town at 4 o'clock. My subject was 1 Peter 5.10. The heat for some minutes was so intense that it appeared as if flesh could scarcely bear it. Monday 27. After the rain, J. Jacobs rode with me to Joseph Chrysaps, upon the north branch of the Potomac. We crossed this water three times and climbed over the mountain, but not without rain. Now I have left the traveling preachers to mind their own work, and I only make my appointments when I come to the places. The local preachers are my guides, and good guides, and good aides, and good companions they are. 
Tuesday, 28. In Precepts Mill, I preached upon Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. We had many people at a short warning. Wednesday, 29. I was prevented setting out by rain. I made feeble attempts to make peace between two old members of the society. May I have the blessing, and they have the peace, for the good of their children and the society. I came to the ten-mile house. Here I overtook company, a certain Mr. Doyne. We wrought our passage to Tomlinson's, dined, and came on to Simpkins's stand. Next day we breakfasted at the Great Crossings, William Smith's. Then on we went to Mr. Slack's, brisk enough to wait upon travelers. At four o'clock we dined. Once more I was compelled to walk down the Laurel Hill. We came into Uniontown about seven o'clock, wearied by the heat and the toils of the day. Brother and Sister Fleming are gone away, 270 miles to Philadelphia, in search of a cancer doctor. Both her breasts are turned black, I understand, and she has a babe of six months to take with her over desperate roads, and through heat scarcely supportable. Dear souls, what trouble have they in the flesh? The husband is sick in the wife's diseased breast. The fond, anxious wife suffers, because she is the cause of his sufferings. And, oh, how are all the sympathies of nature in the parents awakened by the sufferings of the poor, sorely wearied babe? Friday 31 I ordained at Jacob Murphy's, Mount Braddock, William Page, Traveling Elder. September 1 I rested, wrote, read, and planned a little. I appointed James Hunter, who has been seven years in the work, President pro tempore of the Monongalia District, in the absence of Thornton Fleming. He is next to him in standing and reputation. Pennsylvania, Sabbath 2 I rode to Uniontown and preached upon Matthew 10, 37-38. I also spoke at Murphy's Barn at 4 o'clock on Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. 1. The House of Israel, the Jews, the national and church privileges of that ancient people. The term when applied to professing Christians, their peculiar and important privileges. 2. In what characters God writes his law upon the heart, conviction, repentance, faith, and all the evangelical and moral virtues. Write it in their hearts in allusion to the law written upon tables of stone. Monday 3. I visited Colonel Mason. May it be for his good. Tuesday 4. I ordained Andrew Hemphill a deacon, at family prayer, at Brother Murphy's. We came in company to the widow Hawthorne's. Out of eight children, here are seven subjects of grace. News came after me that Bishop Watcote had appeared at Connellsville. As I had failed to come along by Carlisle, he thought I might be sick, or lame, or dead, and that it was time for him to bestir himself. Wednesday 5 I came by Bromfield and Geneva, crossed Monongalia River, and stopped with Stephen Gapin, Wayne County, Pennsylvania. The wife of my host was ill, and I was obliged to prescribe. She rested better. I was greatly outdone by walking down the rugged, perpetual hills. Next day I felt stiff and sore. October 9 After thirty-four days of afflictive illness, I recommence my journal. I have been, during my sickness, at Harry Stevens. Kinder souls than this family I could not wish, but there were many of them, and others, continually coming and going. I had two doctors, but at last was happily left to myself and Charles Conway. The fever subsided and left a cough. I have not had a more severe attack since I have been in America. The doctor was seldom right, and medicines were not to be had, nor indeed the comfort and alleviations which surround a sick bed in the cities. 
But the best of all was, God was with us. God, the glorious Lord, appeared. I was led into the visions of God. I shouted his praise. Wednesday 10 We took our departure and came to Mapletown. The work of God revives. Brother Smalley's daughter has found the Lord. On Thursday we came to Jackson's, Carmichael Town. Friday brought us to Crouch's, near Washington, and on Saturday we reached Philip Doddridge's. Sabbath 14. I preached. Riding brought on a daily fever and an inveterate cough. Brother Watcote being unable to ride at a greater speed than a walk, I exchanged my mare for his horse. We made more speed by this arrangement, but his great beast jolted me in such a manner as I could not have borne in health. I was pressed above measure, so that I despaired of life, or health, or making our journey in this manner. We have lost the Kentucky Conference, and have about eleven weeks for our trip of fifteen hundred miles to Charleston. We were compelled to spend a week at John Beck's. Sabbath 21 Brother Watcote preached at West Liberty. From thence we rode to John M. Collix, within a mile of Ohio River. Here my fever rose, and I had to quit all hopes of going to the westward. I returned to John Beck's. As I was my own doctor, I resolved to breakfast upon eight grains of Ipecacuana. This cleansed my filthy stomach, and so broke up my disease that a fever of fifty days fled. My cough, nevertheless, is very distressing at night. I have submitted to have a large grinder extracted. Should November prove favorable, I do not yet despair of getting along in time. Brother Watcote has been of great service to me. He was still urgent to go on, and he has gone on, wandering alone through the wilderness, I am afraid, in vain. He said he had a might, and it must go. I fear his precious life will go. Tuesday 23. My fever abated. I applied a blister and bled again. I began to eat and gather strength. Saturday 27. The weather has changed greatly. We have the Indian summer. On the Sabbath day a small meeting. And what must I do? Go into the woods? The eyes of the preachers were upon me. I was too weak to travel, but not to preach. We had a melting time. It was so unexpected. With some it was the first time. With others the last, perhaps, they would ever hear me or see me in this part of the country. It was so pleasant in the afternoon, I rode down to John Casebears, an Israelite. Monday 29. A summer's day. We rode twelve miles near to Washington. Here I heard of a suit gained by the Reverend Mr. Birch against the Reverend Mr. M. Cullen. The slander was a charge of drunkenness. The damages awarded thirteen hundred dollars, costs included. On Tuesday we gained Joseph Taylor's, near the old fort. Wednesday we came to Uniontown, seventeen miles. Thursday to the crossings, twenty-four miles. Friday to Musselman's, thirty miles, and on Saturday to Joseph Crisap's to breakfast, making one hundred and twenty-five miles this week. Here we rested for the Sabbath. It is wonderful to see how Braddock's Road is crowded with wagons and pack horses, carrying families and their household stuff westward. To the new state of Ohio, no doubt. Here is a state without slaves, and the better calculated for poor, industrious families. O oh, highly favored land! I saw the death of Wilson Lee confirmed in the Frederick Gazette. He died at Walter Worthington's, in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. Wilson Lee was born near Lewistown, state of Delaware. He was of a slender habit of body, but active, diligent, and upright in his walk, a pattern of neatness in his habits and attire, and full of gentleness, meekness, and love. His presence commanded respect. His zeal for God was great, 
and his labors successful, and continually so. Few excelled him in the duties of a presiding elder. It is not impossible that the toils of this important office have been too great for his feeble frame. He had been twenty years and ten months in the Methodist connection. Sabbath day I spoke in Cresap's mill upon Hebrews 2, 2, 3. After sermon we rode to James Cresap's near Old Town. Notwithstanding what had passed at Cokesbury, he received me as a father. That matter might have been managed better. We were to have the boys to become all angels. I sent for Brother Jacobs and his wife. We breakfasted and prayed and rejoiced in God together. John Hesselins sent me a note of invitation to call and see him. I did so. He reminded me of his respectable father, who took me to his house thirty years ago in the time of my visiting Annapolis, when I was exposed to daily reproach and contempt. I have reason to believe the old gentleman died in the Lord. Virginia, Monday, November 5. We forded Potomac about a mile above the South Forks, and called in to see Mother Poole. We came on to Capon and lodged at Mr. Largiot's. Tuesday 6. We breakfasted at Quaker Brown's, and then came on to Winchester. In the evening I preached in George Reed's house, and next day in the house of Elijah Phelps. On Thursday I rested and refitted. My body is in health, my soul established in grace. Sickness has been very common below the mountains, and there are many deaths. Saturday 10. The weather has been unpleasant, and our clothing needed improvement and increase. Above all, I wished to see Daniel Hitt. My friends were solicitous for my presence at the quarterly meeting at Newtown. On the Sabbath day I preached feebly, upon John 1, 50. The superintendent bishop of the Methodist Church in America, being reduced to two dollars, he was obliged to make his wants known. Monday 12. We came to Hands Ferry, went on to Front Royal or Loose Town. We dined at J. Moore's and passed over the ridge, our route leading near the head spring of the north branch of the Rappahannock. We stopped at Justice Clark's. I came in unwell, but the well-ordered house and its solitude, the social family and their polite attentions and great kindness, were very consoling. The old folks gave me their room and bed. I was overcome, quite. My thoughts and feelings were all gratitude. On Tuesday we left our kind-hearted hosts, and took the path to Little Washington and Woodville Towns, in Culpeper County, and met with a kind reception and good entertainment. Twenty-eight miles over rough roads, and through cold, enough to make me uncomfortable. Wednesday 14. We had not gone above fourteen miles when the threatening snow began to fall. It made a heavy damp plaster for our garments. We came to Henry Fry's, Robinson River, Madison County. I felt the cold of yesterday's ride. The horses were to be shod, and it was meeting day. So I have reasons enough for resting. Friday 16. We rode through Orange to Louisa County. I had a comfortable interview with John Lassley, his good afflicted wife and serious daughter. On Saturday we came on to Joseph Perkins's, crossing the grand branch of Pamonkey, at Colonel Norris's five-story new mill. The weather is exceeding pleasant. We had a small congregation called together at a short warning. I spoke from Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. Not in vain, I hope. Monday 19. We rode through Goochland, crossing James River at Cartersville. Satansville, I fear. They have rejected the gospel. Charles Hopkins is their priest, a poor wretch. He was once with us, but when I pleaded for a suspension of ordinances and a partial conformity to the ancient Episcopal Church, he raised the cry of popery. 
But behold, when there were churches to supply, and money to be given, there was no popery. I lodged with Louis Isbet. I found kind people and comfortable entertainment. I heard of three camp meetings in Cumberland Circuit, one at Charity, one in Bucking Lane, and one in Prince Edward. The first was greatly successful. Tuesday 20. We came to Robert Smith's, a very damp day. My mind was greatly engaged with God. On Wednesday, through deep damps, we came to David Thompson's, at the upper or west end of Powhatan County. On Thursday we crossed Appomattox at Clements Bridge, near a mill and small town of the same name. Our route led through Amelia. Solitary Amelia, with its worn-out fields of hundreds of acres, and old houses falling into ruins. We lost our way, wandering without friends or food, from seven in the morning until seven at night. We made about forty miles, and came, fatigued and hungry, to John Ryles. Here we had entertainment good enough for a president. Friday 23. We passed Nottaway Courthouse, crossed at the Falls Bridge, where a Morris, owner of a mill and sawmill, finally seated on the stream, gave us food for our horses gratis and unasked. We came to Zachariah Davis's, near Lunenburg Courthouse. On Saturday we crossed Meharon at Saffold's Bridge. By accident we came to Mr. Warner's, the son-in-law of Samuel Holmes. We were hungry and faint, and the table was soon spread. On the Sabbath day I had a local preacher's congregation, to which I discoursed upon 1 Thessalonians 2, 11, 12. Monday 26. We came to Allen Young's. The weather was unusually sultry. My clothing was burdensome. A traveler in this iron clime must feel almost all the climates in the world, with all their extremes, and he must carry with him, all the year, as many clothes as he may possibly want but six months of it. In November he may not need a topcoat, and yet, if he is wise, he will not be without his cloak in July. As Tuesday was pleasant, the river low and the wind moderate, I pushed forward to Edward Taylor's, Greenville County, North Carolina, 26 miles. Here I rested to refit. At this point, Joel Smith being unwell, consented to stop, after traveling with me 600 miles, frequently afflicted and depressed by some peculiarities of both his constitution and country. I wished him to leave me. North Carolina, Thursday 29. We came to Edmund Taylor's, Sr. The aged people were happy, waiting with cheerful patience for the moment which was to change this mortal for an immortal state. On Friday we dined at Jesse Carter's, on the banks of Neuse, and crossed the river at the Fish Dam Ford, and put up for the night with Lewis Moores. Our road led us by the home of John Kinsborough, whom we visited. I was pleased to find that the like precious faith entailed upon the children was now enjoyed in reversion by the children's children of those who first trusted in God thirty years ago. Saturday, December 1. We came to Sion Smith's, accompanied by Nathaniel Moore. I was glad to house here and escape the rain. It is a cordial to my spirit to reflect that although we had but one preacher on that ancient and good circuit of Tar, and that one was a young one, and esteemed by some only of moderate abilities, his labors have been signally blessed. It is true the local brethren helped faithfully, and there were some good seasons at camp meetings. My mind has great peace and consolation in God. Sunday 2. I preached. My subject was John 1, 50. I was chilled for an hour after speaking. A fever succeeded this, and I was very ill through the night. Monday 3. I baptized three children of Squire Hinton's. I breakfasted with them. 
we rode on to the Redfield Ferry upon Haw River. On Tuesday morning we breakfasted fourteen miles ahead, with Brother Reeves, at the Hickory Mountain. I ordained William Masters a deacon. I dined and lodged with him. God has blessed him. His twin sons, converted at the same time, are both called to preach the gospel. On Wednesday we came away twenty miles, to Bell's House and Mills, to see Alexander M. Kane. We had a night meeting, at which I saw extravagancies frequently seen among our people. I believe, nevertheless, that the young people were sincere. On our way to Wiley Harris's, we stopped at Mr. Fuller's to dine. On Friday I rode eight miles to breakfast with Ethelred Harris, and came on eighteen miles to John Randall's. On Saturday I thought it well to rest. I have ridden, since leaving Baltimore, nine hundred and eighty-eight miles. At Randall's I preached upon Galatians 5, 9. In the evening I visited our former brother, my friend Tompkins. He was expelled for selling a slave. The Lord is amongst the colored people in this family. On Monday we lodged at Thomas Shaw's, thirty-five miles distant. His wife still lamented the loss of a dear child. End of section 17 Recording by Brian Keenan Section 18 of Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury, Volume 3 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan South Carolina, Tuesday, 11 we reached Lynch's Creek, and next day twenty-eight miles brought us to Camden. My friends receive me as risen from sickness, tenderly attentive. On the Sabbath day Alexander M. Kane supplied my place. On Friday, Saturday, and twice upon the Sabbath. This last day I gave the sacramental discourse upon 1 Corinthians 6, 1920. Whilst resting I wrote some letters, and received some persons who wished to converse with me upon the best of subjects. I felt as if we wanted more living religion in the society here. Monday 17. I came to James Rembert's upon Black River, 20 miles. I wish I could be more solitary this week. On Tuesday I kept close that I might finish the short memoirs of Nicholas Waters and Tobias Gibson, both deceased this year. Wednesday 19. I preached at Rembert's Chapel. We had a cold rain. It chills the people. They cannot hear to profit. My subject was 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. That is, give you entire sanctification, and persevering grace to the end. Thursday 20. We had snow four inches deep. I felt thankful that I had a house, and all things necessary to temporal enjoyment and comfort. Next day it cleared away. My soul is happy in God. Purity of heart is my joy, and prayer my delight. I feel as if God would sanctify all the conferences in the South. Oh, may it, in answer to my unceasing prayers, be a great time with the Lord's prophets. It is nine hundred miles from Wheeling on the Ohio to Charleston, South Carolina. From Baltimore thither by this route about twelve hundred miles. On Thursday, Saturday, and Sabbath day I rested. Jonathan Jackson preached at Rembert's Chapel on Monday, and on Tuesday, Christmas Day, I gave them a sermon upon Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. A child after his human nature, a son of God. The government shall be upon his shoulders. Upon the shoulder it was that ancient temporal governors carried their badge of office. His shoulders shall be strong enough for the thousands of his faithful ministers, and the millions of his faithful people in his church militant, who shall confide in his strength. 
his name shall be called, that is, he shall in reality be what he is called. Wonderful, that is, a mysterious and miraculous person in his manifestations, in his birth, spiritual and holy, and in his miracles, notable, perfect, and undeniable. Counselor. This may refer to his ministry, his prophetic, priestly, and kingly offices. Mighty God, mighty in the power of his grace. The everlasting Father, as such, giving life and life eternal. Prince of Peace, giving and preserving peace in his kingdom, and thus contradistinguished from temporal princes, who are so generally promoters of war. Wednesday 26. We set out for Charleston. The rain overtook us, and we passed Sumter Courthouse, dripping. We dined with Mr. Bradford and pursued our journey, wet as it was. Stopping at a house where we might have remained for the night, we were driven off by a drunken madman who went on like a fiend. It was dark, and we had rain above, and mud and water below. The elements appear to be at war with us. At length Mr. Boyd saw us in our deep distress, and led us to his house, and treated us very kindly. I was wet. I was blistered. I was skinned. Thursday 27. We came on to contend with Santee at Nelson's Ferry, where I once had a surge with Hope Hull in company. The mud and mire were bad enough in the road, but oh the swamps! I dipped both feet, yet I came off pretty well. The water was rising. The wind blew fresh. But happily for us, James Jenkins came over in a canoe and brought the flat just as we were ready. We pushed on to Mr. Heron's and came in before the sun disappeared. Friday 28. We came thirteen miles to Monk's Corner to breakfast, thence to the ten-mile house, fed our horses, and put off again and reached the city. I think it may go for one hundred and twenty miles from Remberts to Charleston. Saturday 29. I had to rest indeed. I was sadly sore. Many letters came from various parts, which I answered. Daniel Hall made me glad by his account of the Suffolk camp meeting. In four days they calculate there having been as many hundred converted to God. On the Sabbath day I preached at Cumberland Street on John 1.50. I feel comforted in spirit. The sitting of this conference will not be in vain in Charleston. Two letters from Philadelphia announced to me that nearly one hundred souls have been converted in the different congregations since October. O oh, fire of the Lord! Come down and consume the fire of contention in that unhappy place. I have a pleasing account also of the success of a camp meeting in the state of New York. Tuesday, January 1, 1805. We opened our conference. I preached upon Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. To walk in wisdom towards them that are without is to purchase the present and future time, both of which are in our power. The highest wisdom of ministers is to propound and set forth faithfully the end and motive of thus walking. Christians walk in wisdom when they earnestly seek perfection by the best and only means, and in the highest wisdom when in the possession of all the communicable fullness of perfect love. I preached the ordination sermon of four elders, J. Crowder, H. M. Gaines, J. H. Mellard, and Hugh Porter. My body failed a little in these exercises. We had a sacrament and some singing and tears, but for want of more and closer exhortations there was nothing special done. The intendant of the city has forbidden our prayer meetings with the blacks before the rising sun, nor must the evening meetings be held later than nine o'clock. The preachers are seriously occupied with the work of the conference, and they are countrymen, and do not speak boldly as they ought to speak. Nevertheless, I hope and believe real good has been 
and will be consequent upon the sitting of this conference. Monday 7. I attended to the entering of the minutes, wrote letters, packed up our stuff for removing, received visits, and bade farewell. Tuesday 8. We came off early and in haste, but we were soon checked. The causeway was bad, and the flat at the ferry aground. We were three hours getting over. At Andrews's tavern, we had to beg and pray to be taken in for the night. I and pay for it too. Our supper and lodging were three dollars. Next day, at a lone and slow ferry, we waited some time and lingered on the road. At seven o'clock we came in to Moses Miller's, upon Black River. On Thursday we crossed the bridge below King's Tree, and called upon Captain Charles Williams, who generously took us in, and treated us kindly. Friday, 11. A cold day. One night at Ports Ferry, and away. We have fallen short in our calculations of reaching Lumberton on the Sabbath day. On Saturday we came up to Robert Dunham's. Here Brother Watcote thought proper to stay a night. My mind has been in great peace. In a day and a half, with lodging, food, and ferries, three of us have spent nine dollars. I will here observe that we have admitted upon trial eighteen preachers in the Western, and eleven in the Southern Conference, and added two thousand members within the bounds of each, notwithstanding a great mortality and the constant removal to new lands. Sabbath 13 We rode eleven miles to James Ford's, a stage-house and company. We were kindly treated gratis. We gave them our prayers and thanks. Monday 14 We came to Mr. Lee's, dined and came on, lodging at Lumberton, a town of about twenty families. On Tuesday we had another cold ride to Fayetteville. At the African Meeting House I preached upon Hebrews 10, 38-39. It was a time of feeling, but eleven o'clock was no hour for some folks. I was invited to preach in the State House, but it did not suit my mind at all. The object of our visit was a Methodist congregation and society. Home is home. Ours is plain, to be sure but it is our duty to condescend to men of low estate, and therefore I felt justified in declining the polite invitation of the Rev. Mr. Flynn to officiate in his meeting-house. I must take the road again. Oh, what sweetness I feel as I steal along through the solitary woods! I am sometimes ready to shout aloud, and make all vocal with the praises of his grace who died, and lives, and intercedes for me. Brother Watcote preached at night. I added a few words, a sort of gossiping exhortation. North Carolina, Thursday, 17. We crossed Cape Fear, dined at Simpson's, and after night stopped at the Widow Andrus's, a stage house. On Friday we had a stormy morning. It paid us off for a time, and then cleared away. We came to Moore's Creek. We were so near swimming, I dipped my heels. We stopped at Parker's, dined, and continued on to Negro Head. We had swamps and spring tides. And behold, one of the bridges in Mr. Mallet's rice field was gone. Well for us, the overseer, one of our sheep, brought a ladder for us to walk upon, and by means of two planks laid together lengthwise, our horses passed over. We asked the housekeeper to let us stay. She consented, little thinking who we were, which, when she discovered, the poor thing was surprised and gladdened. We had a room, and prayed and talked with the blacks, and exhorted them. On Saturday morning we crossed northeast before sunrise. We came to our own house to breakfast. Our chapel in Wilmington is elegant, sixty-six by thirty-six feet. Brother Watco preached this morning. Sabbath 20. I preached on Titus 11, 14. Brother Watco spoke in the afternoon. Our enlarged house was filled with both colors. 
Monday 21. Many attended our meeting, though the weather was severe. Tuesday 22, we came on to top sail. Brother Nixon and family are preserved in the midst of disease and deaths. Dear Mrs. Campbell is gone home. Wednesday 23. We came to Lot Ballard's, 41 miles. The weather was very cold in the morning, and there was so much ice in the way we could scarcely get along. Brother Watcoat was afflicted with dysentery and bloody urine. On Thursday we rode 16 miles to the Widow Argett's. Here is a change. The man is dead. The widow was very attentive, and the blacks crowded to prayers. Friday 25. We reached Newburn, 26 miles. On Saturday it rained. We have happily escaped it. We have made 2,980 miles since General Conference. We lodged at the widow Jones's. Her dear James is gone. He appeared to be as healthy as any man in Newburn. He went off after a few days' illness, of a pleurisy in the breast. Lord, and am I yet alive? Sabbath 27 was an awful day of cold rain. Few attended the worship of God. In my zeal I preached again at night. I exposed myself and exerted myself. Monday 28 we came away through a cold wind to Noose Ferry. Swift Creek swam us, and the waters of the greater stream floated us across in a tottering canoe, the horses alongside swimming. A twenty-eight miles ride brought us to the widow Richards to lodge. Arrived at Tar River, we found it was blowing a storm. I was unwilling to cross. The flat was nearly filled with water shortly after we put off. A boat came out to take us up. Brother Watcoat stood mid-leg in water. I had gained a plank and kept my feet dry. And it was well, as I had a touch of pleurisy and had discharged blood yesterday evening. We came safe and praised that God who in deaths oft had delivered us. Brother Watcoat preached at Washington in the evening. Wednesday 30. I preach to a congregation of very unfeeling people. The blacks have no gallery. The whites look upon us with contempt. O oh, Washington, Washington! Thursday 31. We came to Williamstown. I preached at Brother Watts's house. My subject was Romans 5, 1 through 5. Roanoke was full. Friday, February 1. We rode up to General Williams's, 48 miles from Washington. We must yet go 60 miles out of our way to go by Norfolk. Poor men and weary horses. Saturday 2. We stemmed the northwest wind, 20 miles, to cross the awful Roanoke. For a mile and a half from the ferry, the fences were swept away. During the freshet, cattle and hogs and some slaves had been carried off. Its proud waves were stayed when we arrived. We rode thirty-two miles to Joseph Penner's, Northampton, without seeing the inside of a house. I was most severely penetrated with cold, and my bowels were disordered. We had snow and cold on the Sabbath day, and we were glad to rest. The people came to meeting, and we delivered our testimony. Virginia, Monday 4 the day was excessively cold. The icy, frozen roads endangered limbs and life itself. We kept on. At Murfreesburg, we had a meeting at the house of the widow Merida. I spoke to them from 1 Corinthians 5, 13-17. Next day at Somerton, we had a small meeting in Hazlitt's house. Wednesday 6. In Suffolk, at the house of Mr. Yerbury, my subject was Revelations 3, 11, 12. Thursday 7. I was very unwell, but we pushed on, through water, mud, and mire, to Portsmouth, where we arrived about an hour in the night. 
At eleven o'clock on Friday, we had a meeting of the official members for business. They unanimously wished to have a stationed preacher. This was a great difficulty last year. Our chapel has been enlarged to sixty feet by thirty. I advised the addition of galleries. As I passed over the bridge to Norfolk, I examined and was pleased with it. It is more upon the eastern plan of such improvement than any I have seen to the south. It is 1,100 feet long and 30 wide, the piles coppered to high water mark to preserve the wood from the worm. And it has a drawbridge. The cost is said to be $30,000, and it yields 5% to the company. We met the official members of the Norfolk Society. Here are some difficulties and more poverty. But the work progresses here as well as at Portsmouth, where the society has grown and prospered under the care of John Potts. Sunday 10 I preached at Norfolk upon Romans 13, 11 through 14, that knowing the time, etc. Slumbering, sleeping professors are called, by the signs of the time, to awake, to cast off the works of darkness, as they would clothes which no longer suited their characters, garments no longer appropriate to their profession, and to put on the armor of light, the whole armor of God, to walk honestly, that is, decently, as it becometh the true, consistent, dignified Christian character, to avoid the sensualities of the world, and the sins and indulgences of the flesh and spirit, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to be dressed, decked, adorned with Jesus Christ, and filled with his Spirit, to make no provision for the flesh, with the intent and desire of fulfilling its lusts. At Portsmouth I preached upon Luke 3, 6, All flesh shall see the salvation of God. 1. The excellencies of this salvation. It is a common salvation, a great salvation, the salvation of God. 2. The nature of this salvation, in its degrees of justification, sanctification, and glorification. 3. The present subjects of salvation, infants and believers. The ample means furnished to all, that they may see this salvation. Faithful ministers, faithful, consistent, praying professors, and all the holy ordinances of the Church. I was greatly assisted in speaking. I warmly exhorted our friends in Norfolk to build a tabernacle in some part of the town. Monday 11 At Jolliffe's Chapel I spoke on an appropriate text from Isaiah 49.20. The house is not half large enough. We dined at Brother Denby's and came on to the widow Reddick's. She and her sister are both professors. Tuesday 12 at Suffolk, Brother Watcote preached a very appropriate sermon. At Murphy's, the work revives. A new house is in preparation. The place is too straight. We must make room for them to dwell. My subject here was 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. Wednesday 13. Brother Watcote preached at Joseph Moody's. God has wrought powerfully at Blunts and Benz. They are preparing a large house for worship at the former place. General Wells and family have returned to us. Willis Wells is coming back from following O'Kelly, besides twenty other members who had been drawn away. They profess to have had enough of him. Mr. O'Kelly has come down with great zeal and preaches three hours at a time upon government, monarchy, and episcopacy, occasionally varying the subject by abuse of the Methodists calling them aristocrats and Tories, a people who, if they had the power, would force the government at the sword's point. Poor man. The Methodists have but two of their very numerous society members of Congress, and until these democratic times we never had one. I question if, in all the public legislative bodies in the seventeen United States, there are more than twenty members Methodists. No, our people are a very independent people, who think for themselves, and are as apt to differ in politics 
so do the preachers, and divide at the hustings, as those of any other denomination. And surely, they are not seekers of the offices of this world's profit or honor. If they were, what might they not gain in many parts of the United States? Whilst one rails at us, others, who are always fond of fishing in troubled waters, take those who are already in our net, or, hunting on forbidden ground, pick up our crippled game. See what believers their church is composed of. Thursday 14. The rain held us in doubt until eleven o'clock. Then we started, and about two o'clock a dreadful storm of thunder, hail, and wind overtook us, and drove us to a house for shelter. Here we remained an hour, and then came on to Captain Birdsong's. It blew up excessively cold. Oh, death, death, in the neighborhood of Ellis's chapel, where we have held conferences, too. Friday 15. We stopped to feed our horses at a Quaker preacher's, a friend Nixon. We would not eat ourselves, where it was not agreeable we should pray. We found the wind so cold and cutting as we made towards Petersburg, we could hardly bear up against it. Saturday 16. Colder still. Snow in the north. Five and six feet deep in New York. Ice. Ice. Awful time. End of section 18. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 19 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Sunday 17. Calm and cold. I preach from Revelations 3, 3 through 5. The people came very late and my mind was fettered. I will here take the liberty of inserting the following account. A sketch of the labors and travels of Ira Ellis. In March 1781, I left my father's house in Sussex County, Virginia, and spent some time with Leroy Cole in Mecklenburg Circuit. This spring and part of the summer I spent mostly with the preachers, and occasionally supplied some vacancies in one or two circuits. About November, I attended a quarterly meeting at Rose Creek Chapel, Brunswick Circuit, and from thence was sent as a traveling preacher into Mecklenburg Circuit, being then about twenty years of age. In April 1782, I attended the conference held at Ellis's Chapel, Sussex Circuit. From thence I received an appointment to Pittsylvania Circuit, where I continued six months. The six following months I officiated in the Yadkin Circuit. In the spring of 1783, the conference was again held at Ellis's Chapel, and I received an appointment to Tar River Circuit. After spending two quarters there, I spent the remainder of the year in Roanoke Circuit. In the spring of 1784, I was stationed in Burtick Circuit. Six months I labored there, one quarter in Camden, and the last quarter, excepting the time spent in attending the General Conference in Baltimore, in Portsmouth Circuit. At the conference held in April 1785 at William Mason's, Brunswick County, I was appointed to Philadelphia Circuit. Here I continued nearly one year, spending one-third of the time in the city. In the spring of 1786 I was stationed in Dover Circuit in the state of Delaware, and remained one year. The next year I labored in Kent Circuit on the eastern shore of Maryland. Whilst here I received a letter from Bishop Asbury, informing me that I was stationed for the ensuing year in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. I set out in May and arrived there, and took my station in July 1788. Except one tour of duty of about three months, through the district and state at large, I continued here until February 1790. After this period I was stationed in what was called the Middle or Center District of Virginia, lying between James and Rappahannock Rivers. In this district I remained, and officiated as presiding elder, until the general conference held in Baltimore, in November 1792. James O'Kelly having then withdrawn himself from the Methodist connection, I was appointed to succeed him in the South District of Virginia, which station I filled until November 1795. 
I then changed my state in life and became located, and so continue to this day. Ira Ellis, Brunswick, Virginia, February 24, 1805. The above-named Ira Ellis being about to travel some distance through the United States on business, Bishop Watcote and myself gave him the certificate, of which this is the copy. To the ministers, members, and friends of the Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States. With our Christian salutations we send greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you through Jesus our Lord. We have thought it proper to recommend our beloved brother Ira Ellis to your pulpits and attentions. One that has traveled fourteen years extensively, faithfully, and acceptably. Nine years he has labored locally, preserving always a good ministerial and Christian character. He hath filled the various stations among us, having exercised the offices of preacher, deacon, elder, and presiding elder. We give him the recommendation we think his standing and services have merited in our connection. He is going upon business of consequence to himself. He may also be as attentive as circumstances will admit to the ministry of the Word of God, at all times and places where he can have a congregation. Given under our hands this 22nd day of February, 1805. Francis S. Berry, Richard Watcote, Brunswick County, Virginia. I desire to render to all their due. Ira Ellis is a man of quick and solid parts. I have often thought that had fortune given him the same advantages of education, he would have displayed abilities not inferior to a Jefferson or a Madison. But he has, in an eminent degree, something better than learning. He has undissembled sincerity, great modesty, deep fidelity, great ingenuity, and uncommon power of reasoning. His English schooling has been good. He is a good arithmetician, and expeditious and ready with his pen. When asked for an account of his travels, he took his pen immediately, and without a recurrence to books or papers, gave it at once. In the conferences and elsewhere, as my secretary, he has been of signal service to me. He is a good man, of most even temper, whom I never saw angry, but often in heaviness through manifold temptations. He is a good preacher, too. Oh, may he finish his life as he hath continued it, faithful and acceptable, and successful in the traveling and local line. Ira Ellis is married to an agreeable woman, who has made him the father of three beautiful, serious little children. Monday 18. We rode away to the high hills, not away, and stopped with Stith Perham. On Tuesday we came to Robert Jones's, on Wednesday to Peter Pelham's, on Thursday to William Ruffin's, on Friday to Sterling Ruffin's, where I preached and then came to Ira Ellis's. On Saturday Brother Watco preached at the Olive Branch. We visited Matthew Myrick, who was sick. Sabbath 24 I had a most serious talk at the Branch Chapel on Revelations 2, 1-5. through 5. We lodged at E. Drumgould's. Monday 25 We rode to John Seward's through the rain. William and Sterling are among the rich, so-called. They had been deistical in their notions, but they appear to be sincere and zealous now. Bishop Coke had been made a blessing to William and his lady. We have passed through Norfolk, Nansamund, Isle of Wight, Surrey, Sussex, Prince Edward, Brunswick, Greenville, and Mecklenburg counties. North Carolina, Tuesday, 26. We directed our course to Salem, chiefly to see Sister Taylor at Howell Taylor's. She is true yoke fellow to Sally Jones. One is gone to rest, the other, confident in God, is suffering on patiently until she is released from her load of painful affliction. On Wednesday we crossed Taylor's Ferry, and rode twenty miles to Edmund Taylor's, the seat of the Virginia Conference. We had rain part of the way. We felt a little serious, thinking our elder children and strong sons would leave us by location, and that we should have none but old tottering men, and green, unpracticed boys to take care of the plantation. But we have a great husbandman, Jesus, and a good God. On Thursday, making preparations for the conference. 
Friday, March 1. We opened our yearly conference for Virginia at Edmund Taylor's, Granville County, North Carolina. We closed our sitting on Friday evening following. I have so frequently noticed the affairs of conferences, and they are so common, that I will only observe of this, that we added fourteen preachers and located four. Our business we conducted in great peace, and we had preaching as usual. Our increase is 1,900 members. Saturday 9. We came to John Owens's and spent an agreeable hour. I was pleased to see Sister Owens. She is the daughter of my old good friend, Daniel Grant. We took horse again and hastened on through the warmth to Dr. R. A. Hollins, making thirty-three miles. Sabbath 10. I preached upon Isaiah 40, 5. We had many Baptists to hear. It was an open time to me, although I was unwell. Brothers Meade and Bruce exhorted. Monday 11. We came away to Brother Pate's, and then on to Father Chapel's. We lodged with Joel Tucker. Tuesday 12. We crossed Staunton River at Panels Ferry. We called at Mr. Old's to warm and feed, and came on to lodge at Henry Brown's, having made thirty miles this day, and very cold it was. Wednesday 13. I rested, read, and wrote, whilst Brother Mead copied letters narrative of the work of God. We have passed since conference Granville, Pearson in Carolina, and Halifax and Campbell counties in Virginia. I find that nothing so interrupts my communion with God as the cold. I cannot keep my mind fixed when my whole system seems to be penetrated and stiffened with the cold wind. I suppose this will pass for a very long, hard winter. If the spring is backward, the harvest will be late and full. Oh, may there be a great harvest of souls gathered in to God. Virginia, Thursday 14. We must needs ride to New London. I felt the cold. The wind gave me an influenza. We had a meeting in Dr. Jennings's house. I spoke on Revelations 2, 8-10. through 10. Friday 15. We came to Lynchburg. I did not find my body or mind, or the circumstances of the chapel, or the state of the society, as I wished. We did not lose time. Brother Watcoat spoke at night. On Saturday I preached upon Ephesians 4, 2-6. I was very unwell on the Sabbath day. Brother Watcoat preached and administered the sacrament. At three o'clock I was forced to duty by the wishes of the people. I spoke on 1 Corinthians 6, 1. We had about 1,000 or 1,500 people of the town and country. We lodged with Mr. Wyatt. I felt very willing to move along. On Monday we came to Colonel Meredith's New Glasgow. We were entertained with great friendship and Christian politeness. We were accompanied hither by Louis Dawson, whose kind attentions it is proper I should acknowledge. The people being gathered at a short warning, Brother Watcoat gave them a sermon. Tuesday 19. Brother James Floyd led us along with as much attention as he would have paid to his parents. We crossed Pine Creek and Ty River, passing Amherst Courthouse. After dining with William Breedlove, we mounted and pursued our way across the rocky ford of Rockfish. We stopped at Benjamin Payne's. God hath wrought amongst the children of these families. Wednesday 20. We came to Tandy Keys. Here we found more children coming to Christ. I was pleased and cheered to hear from the local preachers the great things God hath done in this circuit. Brother Mead is coming to preside, and I hope he will have a glorious camp meeting in every circuit in the district. Amherst should, by all means, have another preacher. I hear, I see, I feel. The Baptists are under the whip, straining for victory. Bedford is their stronghold. We shall see. I must be going. 
although I have a poor, weak, tripping beast. And if she makes a long stumble fifty times a day, I bear it patiently. My mind is in great peace. Glory, glory to God. Thursday 21 We came to Williams's tavern, dined and passed the elegant seat of Mr. Divers. Thence to Ray's Ford upon the north fork of James River, called Fluvanna thence to the north branch of Swift Run. We lodged at Mr. Fretwell's. Three score and ten, and not born again. Wretched old man. At Stonersville on Friday, we called on Dr. Douglas, formerly a traveling preacher, halted an hour, and made for the waters of Rapid Ann, Staunton, Middle, and South Branches. After scaling an arm of the ridge over to Robinson's River, flowing in three branches from the ridge, we came in to lodge with Mr. Glower, a Baptist, who was very hospitable to us. On Saturday we reached T.T.'s upon Hughes's River, and thence continued on to Woodsville, thence to Washington, a small town under the South Mountain in the west of Culpeper County. We have made one hundred miles of these roads in three days. Poor men, poor horses. We are housed with Elias Clark, Esquire, near Chester Gap. Sabbath 24. Having taken cold in my head, I was very unwell. I was merely forced to preach at Pennells. On Monday we crossed the ridge at Chester Gap, passing the head spring of the north branch of the Rappahannock River. We stopped at Front Royal, or League Town. I preached at three o'clock, and Brother Watcote at night. My subject was Romans 12, 1, 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. It was observed that the Apostle's form of address was excellent, and particularly directed to the Christian believers, the subjects of grace that the people of the world who lived in conformity to its manners and maxims lived in their proper element. But ye, said our Lord in addressing believers, are not of the world, as I am not of the world, because I have called you out of the world. The Apostle had in view one thing, in two parts, namely, the devotion of the whole man, body and soul, to God, without which the man cannot be a Christian, perfect and entire. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. This can only be done by abstaining from all things sinful in practice. We must not only not live in the use of unlawful things, but we must not indulge in the unlawful use of lawful things. It is lawful to eat, but not to gluttony. It is lawful to drink, but not to drunkenness. It is lawful to be married, but it is unlawful for either husband or wife to idolize the other. We ought to make the faculties of our bodies subservient to the worship and service of God, our eyes to see for God, our ears to hear, our hands to be liberal, our feet to move for God, so as to do or suffer. This is reasonable service. And thus occupied, the mercies of God excite us properly, and we are not conformed to this world. That we be renewed in our minds, that all the powers of the soul be given in love and service to the Lord, in conviction for indwelling sin, the repentance of believers, in sanctification, persevering grace, perfect love, and the fruition, perfect and eternal glory. We prove the will of God by this, to be good, to be acceptable to our own souls, and to be perfect in our Christian perfection, holiness, and happiness eternal. Tuesday 26. We came a rugged path to Elijah Phelps's once more. On Wednesday I was busy writing and fitting for conference. Front Royal contains about sixty houses, a Methodist chapel and academy, a mill, and several stores. We lodged at James Moore's. It was very agreeable to have a home, a room, and everything comfortable for a day or two. 
Our poor horses needed rest, too. Saturday 30. We came to Winchester. I ordered a room fitted for conference with one above the other. On the Sabbath day I preached. Monday, April 1. We opened the Baltimore Conference, sitting five days in very great order and peace. On the fifth instant it rose. We had seventy-four preachers present. We had preaching day and night, and some souls were converted to God. On Saturday we came to Brother Davenport's. At Charlestown, my Sabbath day's subject was 1 Corinthians 6, 1920. We lodged with Mr. Key. On Monday we reached Fredericktown. On Tuesday, Joshua Jones's, Sam's Creek, and on Wednesday 10, came into Baltimore. Maryland. I have been greatly supported, but afflicted in my breast and heart. It will not last long. I have made, I calculate, 3,850 miles from the 1st of June, 1804, to the 10th of April, 1805. L. M. Combs had refused to take his station. After some alterations were made, he consented to go to Philadelphia. Thursday was occupied in writing letters, etc. On Friday I preached at Old Town. Sabbath day I preached in Light Street. I had a very heavy congregation. I fear the people are preached to death. In the afternoon I visited the Africans. My subject was Ephesians 4, 1-6. through 6. Lord, look upon our city congregations for they are a valley of dry bones. Tuesday 16. I preached at Fells Point. It was a time to be remembered. I made my escape from Baltimore, low in religion. At Perry Hall I spent a night. The house, spacious and splendid, was newly painted, and the little grandchildren were gay and playful. But I and the elders of the house felt that it was evening with us. Thursday, 18. We came to Northeast and called a meeting. The notice was short. The men were fishing. On Friday we reached Back Creek, Delaware. Very warm and dusty. My mind is in great peace. On Saturday I was at Duck Creek, and on Sunday evening I preached in Dover State House with very little life. In the morning I had an open time on 2 Corinthians 6, 16-18. Delaware, Monday, 22. I rode to Milford, on Tuesday to Z. Hazards, rested and came on to Lewistown, where we called a meeting and preached upon Romans 13, 11 through 14. I was assisted greatly, and the people were engaged. We lodged at Caleb Rodney's. There may be in Lewistown 120 houses and about 800 souls. We came thence to Georgetown, the seat of the Courts of Justice for Sussex County, containing about forty houses. As the court was in session, we were offered the house, and desired to hold our meeting there. The judges and counselors attended, and Brother Watcoat spoke, and I followed upon Psalm 41.10. We had a moving season. Thursday 25. We came on to Carolyn, dined at Caleb Jacobs, and lodged with Thomas Foster. I was gladdened in heart to find that the work of God was progressing in this society. On Friday we came to Brother Fraser's. The fierceness of the wind made Chop Tank impassable. We had to rest a while, and need I had, being sore with hard service. Saturday 27. We crossed at Dover Ferry and came through Gaston to Lebanon, lodging at Brother Brown's. Sunday 28. I preached at Lebanon Chapel, the neatest on this shore. My subject, Isaiah 40, 1920. We hasted on to Easton. Brother Watcoat preached. Brother Blake gave us lodging. Monday 29. We rode 43 miles through Centerville to Chestertown to meet the Philadelphia Conference. Tuesday 30. We rested and prepared for our work. Saturday, May 4. On Wednesday last, our conference began. One day was occupied with the appeal of Caleb Kendall. On the Sabbath I was called to duty. I spoke on Luke 3, 4-6. through 6. 
all flesh shall see the salvation of God. 1. The perception, the sense in which this object is seen. 2. By whom? By all. 3. The provision made for this and the cause of its operation. The love of God. The general atonement. The general influences of the Spirit. The number of ministers and the general commission to preach the gospel to every creature. The number of Christians and praying souls. The hindrances that obstruct the universal and efficacious spread of the gospel. They were diabolical and human. We ordained Elders Boehm, Aikens, Polemus, Wiltbank, Asa Smith, and Benjamin Hiff. Wednesday 8. The conference rose after seven days' close labor. We had, as usual, preaching noon and night, and some souls were blessed. Thursday 9. We came away to Wilmington and lodged at Collector M. Lane's. Pennsylvania, Friday 10. We reached Philadelphia, 80 miles in two days. Sarah Williams has left 200 pounds to the disposal of Bishop Watcote and myself. We ordered its application to the chartered fund. Thank the Lord. I am happy in the midst of the murmurs of many who are disappointed because I do not meet their strange expectations. Oh, what a wonder if I walk officially straight, when so many would wish me to incline a little to the right or left, as their whims and fancies would lead. Saturday, 11. I prayed, read, wrote, and conversed with friends. Sabbath Day 12. I preached at St. George's Chapel, and again in the Academy. This was a gloomy day, in weather, in the congregation, and in my mind. Monday 13. I preached in the new house at Kensington. I had light and openings. I was continually in prayer, after breakfast, after dinner, after tea or supper. I visited Dr. Magaw. His whole system is shattered, but he has intervals of reason. And although he wants the plenitude of witness of justifying and sanctifying grace, he appears to be full of goodness, full of God. I felt that God was eminently with him. I had confidence and power in prayer for him. New Jersey We set out for the east on Tuesday morning and came as far as Trenton. I was unwell with fasting and riding, so Brother Watcoat preached. Wednesday 15 At Kingston, 15 miles, we fed and started, but a storm drove us into Mr. Henry Gulick's. We again set out, but I was afraid of riding in the rain, and turned in under the roof of a Cornish man by the name of John Rule. Thursday 16. The roads heavy and damp. We came out to Brunswick, dined, and reached Drake's for the night. Next day we dined with Thomas Morrill at Elizabethtown, and lodged with Mr. Leecraft at Newark. New York, Saturday, 18. We were in New York by 8 o'clock. I felt a desire to go to the camp meeting at Mosquito Cove, 30 miles from Brooklyn, on Long Island. Brother Russell took me there. On my journey I felt as if God had been, and would be, and was, at camp. We arrived about nine o'clock. The Saturday's exercises continued through the night until near the break of day. End of section 19. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 20 of Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Sabbath Morning 19. I preached to a multitude on Acts 2.21. In the afternoon, Michael Cote spoke. The work went on through the whole night. Many precious souls were blessed. On Monday night, I preached at Brooklyn. I gave them a sermon in John Street Church in New York on Tuesday morning. Wednesday 22. We came away to the Widow Sherwood's where I preached. I had a little time to read. 
In this state, the subjects of succession, rebaptizing, are much agitated. I will tell the world what I rest my authority upon. 1. Divine authority. 2. Seniority in America. 3. The election of the General Conference. 4. My ordination by Thomas Koch, William Philip Otterbein, German Presbyterian Minister, Richard Wadcote, and Thomas Vasey. 5. Because the signs of an apostle have been seen in me. On Saturday I lodged with Nicholas Fisher at the Plains. At the White Plains Meeting House on the Sabbath day I stood up once more. My subject, 1 Corinthians 15, 33-34. We had some feeling souls to hear, but there is a call for abundantly more. Brother Watcote preached at four o'clock. This was a sorrowful day to me. I was in sackcloth. Monday 27. I called to see Elder Coleman's wife, who was ill, or expected soon to be. I dined with James Hall. We rejoiced that after sixteen years we were bound heavenward. We crossed Croton to Steventown, stopping at Thomas Bailey's. I preached at five o'clock. Tuesday 28. We made our way across the Peekskill Mountains, by Gilead Meeting House. We came by the grand encampment where the God of Glory appeared last autumn. We lodged with Richard Jackson. Wednesday 29 was a day of rest. We called a meeting, and Brother Watcote preached upon the perfect law of liberty. I exhorted. Next day, through an unusually cold north wind, we made a laborious journey to Rhinebeck. We stayed with our brother Sands. Friday 31. I read the latter part of Mr. Wesley's journal. How great and unceasing were his labors! How various, comprehensive, and just are his observation on men, women, modes, manners, doctrines, opinions, authors, and things. I have felt myself strongly urged to pray after every meal where the families are in the habit of prayer. But I believe there are Methodist households that sometimes fall in my way, who never pray in this way. And is this our poor success after eighteen years of faithful labors? God be gracious to us, and to such families and unfaithful souls. Saturday, June 1. Reading Closely. Sunday 2. I spoke at Rhinebeck Chapel on Joel 2, 28-29. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. The preacher's mind was somewhat clouded, or he might have better shown, 1. What are the common and extraordinary operations of the spirit? 2. The subjects of this operation. The children of God and their children. The servants of God and their servants and slaves. The old men of the first generation living, down to the third and fourth young men, gay and forgetful, young women, giddy and thoughtless, rich and poor. 3. The provision that is made for this, in the love of God, in the death of Christ, in the general grace of God, dispensed by men and means. Brother Watcote spoke in the afternoon. It was a heavy day with me. I wearied myself in vain, but my judgment is with my God. Monday 3. I rested and read Mr. Wesley's journal and the last of his life. Tuesday 4. We made through heat and dust to Gale's Tavern. A plentiful rain afterward drove us into Mr. Booth's at Claverick. On Wednesday we dined at Kinderhook and lodged with B. Goslin, Esquire, at Greenbush. Thursday 6. On our way to Stillwater, we passed Troy, Lansingburg, and Waterford, crossing the North River upon a grand bridge. We got within a mile of the camp meeting ground. There is no great shade, nor many tents, but we expect preachers from Canada, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. 
Friday 7. We opened our camp meeting exercises in the pine woods at Stillwater. It continued four days and three nights. There were many people, many sermons, many prayers, many sinners, many saints, and little intermission, night or day, of labors and praises. The particulars may be printed. Tuesday 11. We came 25 miles to Ashgrove, and next day, open conference. On Tuesday the 18th, the conference rose at noon. We had blessed harmony and order, and I never heard less murmuring about the stations, of which there were 62 upon the list, and two having no appointments, because of debility. The Committee of Business, and the Committee of Addresses, were very attentive to the affairs brought before them, and their labors were highly approved. By allowing the usual provision for the married preachers and their wives, no supplies given for the children, the conference was insolvent $1,700. There were about $800 in money and other things given to and given away by the conference. We had a sacrament and love feast on the Sabbath, and I preached. The duty was performed by others at other times as usual, but there were no special marks of good done. Wednesday 19. We came to the falls of Husek, and stopped at George Croy's. Here I preached, 1 Corinthians 2, 29-31. Vermont, Thursday 20. We came through Pownall in Vermont to Williamstown, the seat of the college, containing two houses, one probably 60 by 40 feet, the other 100 by 50 feet, four stories of brick. We dined at Brother Kinney's near New Ashford. Thence we came away to Lanesboro and on to Pittsfield. We have passed through a well-cultivated land of wavy, well-watered surface, roughened with rocks, and broken often enough by hills. We have had two days and nights of heat equal to that of Georgia. Some thunder showers cooled the air, and our ride yesterday was pleasant, though laborious, through Washington, Beckett, and Chester and along upon the headsprings of Agawam River, whose meanders we followed upon a turnpike road, winding amongst the hills of the Green Mountain, equal to any in the west. Forty miles brought us to Westfield, and rested at Joel Farnham's. Mr. Knapp invited me to preach in the Congregational Temple, but I refused, for sundry reasons valid to myself. Massachusetts, Sabbath 23 I attended at a Baptist church. My first subject was Isaiah 55, 6-7. My second, Acts 26, 18-19. It was hard labor indeed. I rode home with Nathaniel Phelps in Tatnam. I asked an aged man at the meeting how many souls were computed to be in the town. Four thousand was the reply. Not one-fourth of these were at meeting. Here is room. It is a day of feeble things and I am afraid that some of our friends, instead of boldly facing them, turn their backs upon their enemies, whilst others join them. Here Ralph Williston was well known, once so full of fire, and what is he now? Monday 24. We set out after midday, crossed Connecticut at Enfield, and came on to Ellington, housing with Dr. Steele. Here the Standing Order have built a grand temple to fame. It is feared there is not in the congregation one soul alive. Connecticut, Tuesday 25. I preached in the schoolhouse to a few men, women, and children. I went home with Mr. Ostrander at the Square Ponds. I believe Methodism is as low here as true religion. Yet there is hope that God will visit New England, as well as every part of the continent, before long. At the Square Ponds Meeting House I preached upon Romans 8, 1-2. It was an open season. The best time I have had in New England. Several felt. I hope it is a prelude to a revival here. I am resting, writing, and reading our form of discipline, and the Jews answer to Voltaire. Saturday 29. At Tolland Quarterly Meeting, my subject was Jude twenty twenty one. 21 it was a gracious time. On the Sabbath we had love feast and sacrament. I ordained Nathan Fox, 
John Norris, and James Hyde, deacons. These are some of the first fruits. Talland revives. We had some living testimonies, and several souls are brought into the church. At ten o'clock we went into an orchard adjoining the chapel. I spoke on Hebrews 8, 10, 11. Brother Washburn's text was, Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Many exhortations followed, and prayers with power. There was a great cry, and the meeting held without intermission until night. Monday, July 1. We set out to Willington, went on to Mansfield, thence, after dining with Mr. Cyrus Dow, fifteen miles to Thompson. On Tuesday we passed through Douglas and Mandon, and lodged with Mr. Ball at Milford. Our Wednesday's ride brought us through Hopkinton, Framingham, Natick, where we dined with Mr. Jameson, and on to Needham, to lodge. The last two days have brought us through heat, occasionally cooled by shade, and dust, and the kindness of friends, several miles from the campground. Massachusetts, Thursday 4. I preached at N. Bogle's Meeting House, on John 8, 30, 31. We stopped Friday night at Waltham. On Saturday we reached Boston. Oh, heat and dust! I felt like Jonah without his gourd. Sabbath 7. I preached in our complete little meeting house, well filled with hearers, from 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 8. It was an open time and gracious season. In the afternoon Joseph Crawford spoke upon 1 Timothy 1, 15. The word of the Lord appeared to strike like sharp arrows. I feel as if Epiphras Kibbe had been faithful in Boston. Monday 8. We took the turnpike for Lynn, passing over a bridge three-quarters of a mile long, said to have cost $40,000. It is rather a causeway, thrown over a marsh. Plenty of flies and mosquitoes. I found Peter Jane in the new house built for the accommodation of the stationed preacher at Lynn. God is moving amongst the people here. They are prepared for the conference. Tuesday 9. At Marblehead, I spoke on Galatians 4.20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. 1. Evangelical men or apostolic witnesses may feel a desire to be present with societies at particular times when it is in their power. They will, where this cannot be done, write. 2. That there may be very alarming and doubtful cases and characters in the congregation and church such as open sinners, hypocrites, half-awakened souls, backsliders, slothful believers. 3. Changing the voice, using a different method, as to matter and manner of preaching or writing, pointing at the cases and characters which are doubtful. We had another meeting at five o'clock, and then returned to Lynn. I received a letter from Dr. Koch announcing to me his marriage, and advising me, that he did not intend to visit America again as a visitor, but rather as a sojourner, if at all, could work be appointed him to do. Marriage is honorable in all, but to me it is a ceremony awful as death. Well may it be so, when I calculate we have lost the traveling labors of two hundred of the best men in America, or the world, by marriage and consequence location. Friday 12 we had a full conference, preaching at five, at eleven, and at eight o'clock. Sitting of conference from half-past eight o'clock until eleven in the forenoon, and from two until six o'clock in the afternoon. We had great order and harmony, and strict discipline withal. Sixteen deacons and eight elders were ordained. Sabbath 14. We held our meeting in a grove belonging to Benjamin Johnson, a beautiful and sequestered spot, though near the meeting-house. My subject was 1 Thessalonians 2, 6-9. 1. The system of imparting the gospel of God, which is preaching Christ. 2. The doctrines, privileges, precepts, and power of this gospel. 3. Apostolical purity of intention, disinterestedness, tempers, manners, 
labors, and travels. The affection of soul imparted, manifested, in preaching and prayer, and bowels of mercies and sympathies. There were many exhortations and much prayer. Many must have felt. Some were converted. From this day forth, the work of God will prosper in Lynn and its neighborhood. On Monday, the labors of conference and public religious exercises were continued. On Tuesday evening, conference rose in great peace. On Wednesday, I gave them a sermon and immediately set out to Waltham, twenty miles. Wind, heat, dust. Thursday, 18. We gained Captain Nichols's Shrewsbury. Wilbraham brought us up on Friday. We rested with Abel Bliss on Saturday. Sabbath 21. At Wilbraham I spoke on 2 Timothy 4, 5-8. through 8. But watch thou in all things, etc. Introduction. The special relation of a spiritual father and son. The time and circumstances peculiar to Paul and Timothy. Watch in all things. As a Christian. As a Christian minister or bishop. Endure afflictions of mind and body. As a Christian and a minister. Endure heat, cold, hunger, thirst, labor, persecution, temptations. Do the work of an evangelist. Spread the gospel where it is not. Support it where it is. Paul knew he was going by martyrdom. He had fought a good fight of faith and by faith he had kept justifying faith, which some had made shipwreck of. The crown of justifying, and sanctifying, and practical righteousness, was waiting to encircle his triumphant brows, a crown thrice radiant with the three degrees of glory. In conclusion I said many things, and with great plainness, urging the necessity of being civilized, moralized, and spiritualized, by the gospel in the plenitude of its divine operation. I ordained Lumen Andrus an elder, and Uriah Clough to deacon's orders. After two hours' serious labor, I retired. Connecticut, Monday 22. We came in heat to East Hartford, and lodged with Squire Pitkins. Tuesday to New Haven, Wednesday to Stanford, Friday to Peter Bonnet's New Rochelle. New York. We have ridden 230 miles in six days, some of them awfully warm. The earlier fruits and productions of the year have been very abundant. But without a rain, the latter fruits and grain must fail. I took a day to refit clothes and to write letters. At four o'clock I preached at Rochelle Meeting House. The subject suited the state of the town. The men were few, the women many. The Lord was present with us. I lodged under the hospitable roof of the widow Sherwood. On my road hither I thought I saw what would make a good campground. I wrote to the presiding elder, advising him of this circumstance. I am still bent on great designs for God, for Christ, for souls. Saturday brought us through excessive heat and dust, to New York, I would say, but we were barred its entrance by proclamation, having passed through New Haven, afflicted with the yellow fever. I stopped at George Suckley's. Being a little unwell, I made the best use of the day I could by writing letters. New Jersey, Monday 29. I preached in our very neat chapel at Second River. We came to Elizabethtown, and on Tuesday to Joseph Hutchinson's, and Wednesday it brought us up at Burlington. Pennsylvania, Thursday, August 1. We found ourselves proclaimed at Philadelphia as at New York. We directed our course to Mr. Manley's seat, in the neighborhood of the city. I received several letters, from which I learned that there was great order preserved at Duck Creek Camp Meeting, and that great good was done. Three hundred souls were blessed. On Saturday I wrote letters. I redeem a day by hard riding for this service. I have bought for one hundred dollars a neat little Jersey wagon. On the Sabbath day I preached at Germantown, on Isaiah 49, 1-2. I returned to Mr. Manley's and preached at five o'clock at Mr. Manley's. 
this day appears to have been poorly spent. I am waiting for the minutes of conference and my little wagon, then away to the west. Monday 5. I visited brothers Cook's and Haskins' families, and rested on Tuesday. Wednesday 7. We set out and reached Radnor. We stopped to dine with Brother Geiger and had a serious time at prayer in his new house, which they are about to move into. We lodged with Daniel Meredith, an old disciple, in the valley. Thursday brought us, through heat and dust, to Soudersburg. Sick on Friday and took medicine. Saturday wrote a great deal. Sunday 11. At the chapel at Soudersburg, I preached upon Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, etc. 1. The sources of trouble to the people of God. Temptation, persecution, disorderly walk and backsliding of professors, and the wretched state of sinners. 2. The present and future rest, first on earth and then in glory. The cause, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, hath been obeyed by, and hath had its full operation on, them that believe. 3. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The characters of those whom he shall judge, and take vengeance upon. Ungodly heathens. Disobedient hearers of the gospel. Vengeance. For God. For himself. For his insulted spirit. For the ministers of Christ, and the people of God. Punished. Their punishment to be beyond the interference of mercy to be sufferings of body and soul, and these to be eternal. I was considerably assisted, yet I left the subject in an unfinished state, after speaking a full hour. Monday 12. We came off with courage, passing through Lancaster, still unpropitious to Methodism. Seven miles beyond, Father Musselman received us with a smiling countenance, a willing hand, and ready mind. We fed and talked and sang and prayed and parted in the Lord. We crossed Anderson's Ferry, the best I know on the river, and came into Little York. I stopped a day. Oh, how kind our friends are at their beautiful retreat. May friend Pence and wife and mother be blessed of the Lord. Wednesday 14. We set out for Carlisle, but I changed my mind and my route to Berlin. We put up with Isaiah Harz. Thursday brought us to Shippensburg, 30 miles. On Friday we bent our course towards Pittsburgh over the three mountains to J. Thompson's in Burnt Cabin Valley. I have moved swiftly, but in my flight have written to five of the preachers. I walked down the mountains, which fatigued me. My soul is at peace, but I have severe trials at times. On Saturday we rested, refitted, read and wrote. Sabbath day at Littleton Chapel, I spoke upon 2 Corinthians 3.12. We had a feeling melting season. We lodged with Father Ramsey, an exceeding kind people. Monday 19. We reached Bedford. At night we had fiddle and flute to enliven our prayers and assist our meditations. I had but little rest. On Tuesday we rode sixteen miles to breakfast. We stopped at Berlin, and I gave them a sermon. Wednesday brought us over awful roads to Connellsville, forty-two miles. We were nearly wrecked. A very serious draught prevails west and east. Oh, we are wicked. We are covetous. We abuse the blessings of abundance, and God in justice withholds. I am indebted to a kind providence for my good little wagon, and my excellent and active driver, and good preacher, too. I am resolved to quit this mountainous, rocky, rugged, stumpy route. It was a mercy of God we were not, men, horses, and wagon, broken in pieces. I praise God now, but I hardly had time to pray then. The camp meeting begins tomorrow at Short Creek, near the Great River. On Friday and Saturday we labored onward to Short Creek, I foundered my mare, and had many trials. Sunday 25. I preached at the campground, 
it was a moving time. On Monday I preached again. It was judged there were five thousand souls present to hear, and that one hundred souls were converted to God. I purchased a horse, and bent my course through Wheeling on the banks of the Ohio. We crossed, and in the evening came to Morristown. Friday brought us to Muskingum. Saturday we reached John Murphy's, and on the Sabbath I rested with Edward Teal. Joseph Crawford is sick. I have had little rest for six nights past. I have ridden, by computation, sixteen hundred and eighty miles since I left Baltimore. End of section twenty. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 21 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Ohio, Monday, September 2. I preached at Richland Chapel on 1 Peter 5.10. The subject was gracious, and so was the season. I find here the children of Methodists, according to the flesh, known elsewhere and long ago. Jonathan Jackson is married. O oh, thou pattern of celibacy, art thou caught? Who can resist? Our married man was forty years of age. He has taken to wife a Mrs. Roberts, a poor, pious widow. Joseph Crawford is very ill. I cannot go on. I have sent sixteen miles for a bottle of wine for him. We started away on Tuesday and came to Judge Van Meter's at the Muddy Prairie, and dined and prayed. Brother Crawford still ill of a flux and fever. We stopped at Krause's mill for the evening. Edward Tiffins brought us up on Wednesday. Thursday and Friday, Brother Crawford could not move on. Dr. Tiffin, the present governor of the state, administered some relief. I was happily employed in reading the portrait of St. Paul by the divine Fletcher. I preached at Chillicothe. We have excessive heat. My mind is in great peace. Saturday 7. We rode to Deer Creek and dined with Mr. Davis. The evening found us at White Browns. Sunday 8. I preached in the barn upon 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee. A view was taken of the cases, characters, and stations the people of God might be in and their several relations to each other, as it respected their duty to God, to the world, to themselves, and to their brethren. It was attempted to be shown that in all possible situations arising out of the faithful performance of this duty, the grace of God was sufficient for them. The manner in which this grace is to be obtained, by fervent prayer, three times a day, or oftener, by a diligent use of all the means, and a faithful improvement of the grace given. Monday 9. We missed our path and went out of our way. We intended for the falls of paint and went to Bullskin, twenty miles. We lodged with Michael Haynes, who rode with us eleven miles. We passed Franklin on the way to the town of Newmarket, containing eight cabins. We lodged at Ross's and were kindly and freely entertained. The roads were heavy but the wagon was a covering in the heavy rain. The roads were dreadful to Williamsburg, Claremont County. We had a beach swamp, mud up to the hubs, stumps as high as the wagon body, logs, trees. After all, we came safe. Wednesday we lodged with Levi Rogers, once a traveling preacher, now a physician. We were greatly outdone, but we called a meeting at Williamsburg. Brother Watco preached and I exhorted. I saw several Jersey friends. On Thursday we rode on to Mr. Dimmitt's, on the route to Little Miami. We have made one hundred miles in four days. I was made glad to hear of the revival of the work of God in the new settlements. The local ministry have shared in this labor with the traveling preachers. On Friday we came down the east branch of the Little Miami to Judge Gatch's. On Saturday we rested, and I read and wrote. On the Sabbath day we held a meeting of four hours at Philip Gatch's. Brother Watcoat's subject was, 
Repent and be converted. Joseph Crawford's I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And F. Asbury's I have no greater joy than this, that my children walk in the truth. We felt quickened and comforted in God. Our route on Monday led through Columbia and the rich lands of the Miami. William Lives sent one to meet and invite us to his house in Cincinnati. I gave them a discourse upon, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, etc. Kentucky Next day I called on Elijah Sparks at Newport, and baptized two of his children. We dined with the widow Stevens. I rejoiced to find that a new circuit had been formed, and there were several growing societies. Much of this has been effected by the faithful labors of Benjamin Edge. We passed Grant's Lick, and lodged very comfortably with William Daniel. On Wednesday we reached Joshua Jones's, and next day beat along to Isaac Nevis. Here we were at home. In Kentucky we passed through Campbell, Pendleton, and Harrison counties. Our estimate is 1,980 miles from Baltimore to Mount Garrison. Friday 20. We attended at White's Chapel. Bishop Watcote and myself preached. We dined at Brother White's and came through Cynthiana, the capital of Harrison County, to Jonathan Jakes's. Saturday 21. At Benjamin Coleman's. On the Sabbath day, Brother Crawford and myself had a warm time of it at Mount Garrison, where we have already held our conference twice. We both preached, we exerted ourselves greatly, and I hope there was good done. We visited Daniel Grigg. I found several of my old friends at this place, among them Colonel Barrett of Allegheny and his wife, Mrs. Tittle, and some from Baltimore County and the state of Delaware, and thus our people are scattered abroad. But, thank the Lord, they are still in the fold, and on their way to glory. My own soul is closer and closer united to God. Monday 23. I visited John Vernon, an early member of society, at Lewis Afries, near Duck Creek, State of Delaware. I must look up our old sheep and lambs. On Tuesday I went to John Whitaker's, Bourbon County. J. Crawford preached at J. Robinson's on Wednesday. I spoke upon 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Of Christ, for us, and Christ in us. That these mysteries are not subjects of reason, but revelation and inspiration. That we must believe them upon divine testimony. The apostle was not conscious of evil, but he was not his own judge. Men are incompetent judges of what belongs to God and His Spirit. It will be found in the judgment day that pride, covetousness, and backsliding were the probable cause of the union of heresy and schism. A divinity doubter was present. Thursday 26. I visited Luke Hansen. Next day it rained and I rested. On Saturday I stopped at Maddox Fisher's in Lexington. I was of necessity in our old house on the Sabbath day. We could not preach abroad. The weather was damp. My sermon was the echo of my text. Cry aloud and spare not. Joseph Crawford preached twice. On Monday I was unwell, but I rode to Jesse Griffith's, Scott County. On Tuesday we rested. Wednesday, October 2. We opened our conference in great peace. There were about twenty-five members present. Six hours a day were steadily occupied with business. The committees of claims and of addresses did much work, and it was done well. I completed my plan for the coming year, and submitted it to the presiding elders, who suggested but two alterations. May they be for the best. On the Sabbath day I preached to about three thousand souls. On Tuesday, after the rise of conference, I rode to Lexington and on Wednesday to J. S. Hordes, Jessamine County. I was under affliction of body, but perfect love, peace within, and harmony without healed every malady. Our friend Job Johnson gave us a lodging on Thursday night, 
and at Rock Castle chance furnished us with another, such as it was, for Friday night. But we had peace and prayer. Saturday 12. We took the path about five o'clock in the morning, and came eighteen miles to dinner at Mr. Freeman's. We reached Johnson's upon Richland Creek. On the Sabbath day we were under the necessity of moving forward slowly to Ballinger's, where we dined. The evening brought us to Dalton's, crowded with company, but we kept good order. Monday 14. Our trouble began. We dined at Davis's, then came on to Jesse Dodson's. Tuesday morning was rainy, and the road was bad before we came to and after we had crossed Clinch River. It was not better than it had been in its native state. Our carriage had nearly upset. I am decided to take the Cumberland path hereafter, at least until this made and mended road, the worst perhaps for making and mending, is in a better condition. The turnpike takes fifty dollars a day, for having made bad worse. At the stubble fields we rested a day. We are one hundred and forty miles from Kentucky. Sure I am that nothing short of the welfare of immortal souls, and my sense of duty, could be inducement enough for me to visit the West so often. Oh, the roads, the hills, the rocks, the rivers, the want of water, even to drink, the time for secret prayer hardly to be stolen, and the place scarcely to be had. My mind nevertheless was kept in peace. I prayed in every house I lodged in, and at almost every place I stopped at. We have heavy rains at present, and another wilderness, bad as this, yet to pass. We meet crowds of people directing their march to the fertile west. Their sufferings for the present are great, but they are going to present abundance and future wealth for their children. In ten years, I think, the new state will be one of the most flourishing in the Union. Thursday 17. We crossed Maine Holston, and came into Tennessee, and put into Colonel Conaway's, Little Nolichucky. We rested here on Friday. At Moses Ellis's on Saturday we saw Moses Black and his wife, he about forty, and she fifteen. Such are the wise contracts Methodist preachers sometimes make. Tennessee. Sunday I felt very unwell from cold taken. We passed Quartin's Ferry upon Great Nolichucky. In crossing the Paint Mountain on Monday, we rode up and walked down, and I sprained my ankle. North Carolina We came into North Carolina and lodged with William Nelson at the Hot Springs. Next day we stopped with Wilson in Buncombe. On Wednesday I breakfasted with Mr. Newton, Presbyterian minister, a man after my own mind. We took sweet counsel together. We lodged this evening at Mr. Fletcher's, Mud Creek. At Colonel Thomas's on Thursday we were kindly received and comfortably entertained. South Carolina We came into South Carolina on Friday and lodged with Captain Edwards, and on Saturday at Staunton's, Staunton's Ferry, Saluda River, Greensville District, we were at home. Sabbath 27 at Salem I preached upon Hosea 10.12, So to yourselves in righteousness, etc. 1. The great and glorious end of the coming of the Lord, to reign righteousness, to impart his grace in all its plenitude, to give a right state of heart in justifying, sanctifying, experimental, and practical holiness. Reap in mercy. When God gives, do you give. Do all the good in your power. 2. The means of obtaining this grace and the blessings consequent to its reception and improvement. Break up your fallow ground. Seek deep conviction. Seek the Lord by repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Reign righteousness upon you by justifying grace, humble, holy obedience, the end, everlasting life. Monday 28. We proceeded on our way to Georgia, winding along some crooked paths through Pendleton District to Eliab Moors, upon Rocky River. Night came on, and we missed our way into the plantation. I walked up a hill and called for help 
and was relieved. We crossed Rocky River four times on Tuesday, and came to Mr. Dunlap's. Wednesday morning we rode twenty miles for our breakfast at Petersburg. We lodged with John Oliver. Joseph Crawford preached two evenings. Georgia, Friday, November 1. I preached at eleven o'clock on 1 Corinthians 6, 1920. Instead of building a small convenient house, they have bought an old house and fitted up a room for everybody. This did not please me. I have for the first time seen Judge Marshall's Life of Washington. I have read four hundred pages in it. Critics may, for aught I know, find fault, especially on the other side of the water, with the style and general execution of this work. I like both. The early history of the country very properly proceeds, and is connected with the life of the great man who has been so justly styled the father, politically, of his country. There is nothing in the work beneath the man of honor. There are no malevolent sentiments or bitter expressions derogatory to the character of a Christian. The author deserves credit for the pains he has taken to furnish authorities and authentic records in the notes to his work. If any author has, in America, done better than Marshall, it is Belknap, perhaps. Saturday 2 I visited Richard Easter and Judge Tate. On the Sabbath day I preached at Thompson's Chapel on Ezekiel 33, too. It was an alarming season. Joseph Crawford spoke after me, and we then rode to Mr. Clark's, fourteen miles, and lodged. At three o'clock on Monday we held meeting at Mr. Mark's. Wednesday 6. We rode to Mr. Pope's, Oglethorpe. I preached at the new chapel. Joseph Crawford preached at General Stewart's. Thursday 7. I was sick and went to bed. Friday 8. We came to Joshua Moore's upon shoulder bone. We were benighted in the woods. The flesh fails, but my mind is in peace. Saturday 9. We reached Sparta. The heat was great. From Kentucky to Sparta, 516 miles. Sunday 10. I preached. My subject was 1 Peter 4, 17. Joseph Crawford gave two sermons. Monday 11. We came to Matthew Harris's, and next day I preached upon 1 Corinthians 11, 30, 31. We drove back to Sparta that evening. I have ridden about fifty miles to preach to about twice as many souls. I would have gone down to the state, but appointments had not been made, and Brother Crawford grew very unwell. I judged it proper for him to go through a course of physic, and the weather was cold, and I wanted a coat. I only lamented that I could not see my poor black sheep at Buffalo Creek, but was glad to hear that Ethiopia still stretched forth the hand of faith and prayer. I feel very serious about the supplies of preachers for the South Carolina Conference. Some are sick, some are settling in life, men of feeble minds. But let the head of the church see to his own work. It is not mine. Why should I despond? What was the work thirty-seven years ago, when there were but two local preachers, one in New York and one in Maryland? Now there are two thousand local and four hundred traveling preachers. Friday 15. We rode to Rehoboth. Next day Joseph Crawford preached on, The Foundation of God Standeth Sure. Sunday 17. Joseph Crawford held forth, and I followed. My subject was Second Peter 2, 20, 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, etc. 1. The pollutions of the world, the sins of the flesh and spirit, by which people are led captive by the God of this world. 2. The gospel method of salvation, by Jesus Christ, the way of righteousness, justifying, sanctifying, and practical, as set forth in the holy commandments delivered unto believers. 3. How persons may be entangled and overcome by heresy, schism, and sin. 4. The last state worse than the first, 
because they so highly dishonor God and wound the cause of Christ, and because of the great difficulties attending their recovery, from which causes arises the great danger of eternal perdition. Monday 18. At the new chapel at Warrington, my subject was Mark 11, 17. Joseph Crawford followed upon Mark 10, 9. Next day, I preached at Cowles's Ironworks. Wednesday 20. We reached Augusta. Thursday 21. I rested. I preached at Spent Creek on Friday. Saturday 23. Joseph Crawford took the pulpit. I rode 25 miles on Friday to preach to 25 souls. The appointment had not been made for me. Sunday 24. I preached in Augusta. Monday 25. I bore up for South Carolina and came to Barnwell Courthouse. I was kindly entertained by Mr. Powers. Tuesday 26. We reached Jacob Bars. Wednesday 27. We reached Mr. Perry's, and next day came into Charleston. From Augusta, 150 miles. Heavy rides and weary men and horses. I was under some dejection of spirits. I have lately read The Life of David Brainerd, a man of my make, such a constitution, and of great labors. His religion was all gold, the purest gold. My eyes fail. I must keep them for the Bible and the conferences. South Carolina, Friday 29. Engaged in closet exercises. I do not find matters as I wish. One preacher has deserted his station, and there are contentions amongst the Africans. Saturday 30. My soul is deeply oppressed with a heavy sea of troubles. Sunday, December 1. Still heavy is my heart. Still sink my spirits down. At Cumberland Street Church I spoke upon Revelation 7, 13-17. My two general heads of discourse were, 1. The gracious although afflicted state of God's people in this world. 2. The glorious and happy state of the righteous in heaven. Our lower floor was nearly filled with communicants, white and black. Do they all indeed discern the Lord's body? It will never do for me to record all I fear, hear, and think. At Bethel Church I took for my text Romans 12, 9-12. I observed that the text contained evangelical Christian duties, privileges, promises, and marks, by which we might judge of ourselves as Christians. That if these marks, and this experience, were not upon us and in us, we could not be Christians. Within twenty years I have visited this place, going and returning, at least thirty times. Saturday 7. Since Monday, amongst other occupations, I have been employed in reading one thousand pages of Mr. Atmore's memorial, and Mr. Wesley's journal. These books suit me best. I see there the rise and progress of Methodism. I met the members of society, white and black, in small companies in our own house. I gave my advice as to temporals. I recommended the painting of the new and the enlargement of the old church to eighty feet by forty, to enlarge the preacher's house, and to buy another burying ground. Besides praying regularly after every meal in our own house, I am obliged to go through this exercise many times daily with the poor Negroes. I feel that I want to go hence, but not until my God and guide gives me liberty. I wait to know his will about going to Georgetown, 230 miles, before the Camden Conference. I wrote a letter to Mr. Atmore, advising of affairs of the Society and of my own, and counseled him to pursue the good work he is engaged in, and bend all his strength to the memorial. Sunday 8 I was in great heaviness through manifold temptations, yet I preached in Cumberland Street in the morning, and at Bethel in the afternoon. I was happy and had great openings. I fear sometimes that my commission will wear out amongst one description of people here. 
religion of a certain kind must be very valuable, since we spend so much to support it. There must be a prodigious revival in the independent society. A building of theirs will cost fifty, or perhaps one hundred thousand dollars. There is a holy strife between its members and the Episcopalians, who shall have the highest steeple. But I believe there is no contention about who shall have the most souls converted to God. Monday 9. Reading and receiving all visitors who came to our house, with counsel and prayer, from room to room, with white and black. Tuesday 10. We have goodly weather. God, by his spirit and his providences, tells us we must set out tomorrow for Georgetown. I doubt if in Charleston we have joined more than 178 members of the Fair Skin in 20 years, and seldom are there more than 50 or 60 annually returned. Death, desertion, backsliding. Poor, fickle souls, unstable as water, light as air, bodies and minds. Wednesday 11. We rode to Monk's Corner and lodged at Mr. Hatchett's. Thursday 12. We pursued a blind road to the ferry. We came out to Murray's and continued along to Mr. Coleman's, a German. Next day we reached Rempert Hall. We had hot weather. Man and beast felt the burden. Some of my northern letters have come in. They bring good news. Camp meetings at Albany, New York, at Lebanon, Vermont, in the New Hampshire districts, all successful. But oh, the wonders of Dr. Chandler's report. He says his authority bids him say that at Duck Creek Camp Meeting, 500 souls, at Accomac Camp Meeting, 400, at Animessex Chapel in the woods, 200, at Somerset, Line Chapel, 120, at Todd's Chapel, Dorset, 200, at Carolyn Quarterly Meeting 75. All, all these profess to have received converting grace. End of section 21. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 22 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Saturday 14. I committed the remains of Abijah Rembert to the dust. He was sixty-two years of age, the last sixteen years of which he had been a member of society. He was visited by, and greatly blessed under, the word at camp meeting. In his last illness he was patient, happy, and confident. He died in the Lord. I was unwell on the Sabbath day, but wrote a long letter to Freeborn Gerritsen. My soul greatly rejoiceth in the Lord, and exults in the prosperity of Zion. Brother Crawford preached in the morning, and I lectured in the evening in Rampart Hall. On Monday I wrote to elders Broadhead and Chandler. This week writing letters and reading Howise's Church History. By this work I learn it is the author's opinion that the evangelists were chief, superintending Episcopal men. I, so say I and that they prescribed forms of discipline, and systematized codes of doctrine. After the death of the apostles, it would appear that the elders elected the most excellent men to superintend. This course was doubtless the most expedient and excellent. Every candid inquirer after truth will acknowledge, upon reading church history, that it was a great and serious evil introduced, when philosophy and human learning were taught as a preparation for a gospel ministry. Hitherto, says our author, in his observations on the close of the second century, not a man of eminence for science or letters had appeared in the church. All of this time, whose works have come down to us, give thereby no evidence of human attainments. They bear the stamp of simplicity. Yet by these the gospel had been supported in its purity, spreading it by their labors to the ends of the earth, and these were they who helped to fill the bloody ranks of the noble army of martyrs. On the Sabbath day I preached a funeral sermon for Abijah Rembert. There is a revival in the society here, so much for camp meetings. 
I am now in the fortieth year of my labors in the ministry. Thirty-four years of this time have been spent in America, counting from October 28, 1771, to October 28, 1805. On the Christmas Day I preached at Rembert's Chapel. My subject, 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, etc. 1. I gave a pastoral introduction. 2. A brief explanation of godliness. The knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Confidence in God. Love to Him. Fear of offending Him. To this were added a few thoughts on the six cases in the text. It was not a pleasant season. Christmas Day is the worst in the whole year on which to preach Christ, at least to me. George Doherty informs me that the wife of John Randall, upon P.D., known by the name of Dumb John, died in great peace and joy, after a thirty years' profession of religion amongst the Baptists and Methodists. Safe anchorage, clear gains. But I have similar accounts from various parts. My soul triumphs in the triumphant deaths of these saints. Glory be to God. Thursday 26. I rested and read, and on Friday rode into Camden. I was favored with a number of letters giving accounts of revivals of religion. Saturday employed my pen. Sabbath day I preached. Monday 30. We opened our conference. January 4, 1806. We closed our conference in great peace and order. No murmurs about the stations from preachers or people. Since we came here, we have had 26 sermons, one of which I preached upon 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no man despise thy youth. Brother Watcote ordained the deacons. We see no immediate fruit of our labors, but doubtless we shall hear of it following our many prayers night and day. Monday 6. Seven of us came away in company to Mr. Evans's, Lynch's Creek, and next day I parted from Brother M. Kendry, bending my course to Jerningham's in Anson County, North Carolina. North Carolina. On Wednesday we crossed Wells Ferry after waiting an hour. A snowstorm kept with us from P.D. to Rockingham. Here the people would have assembled, but there was a wedding afoot. This is a matter of moment, as some men have but one during life, and some find that one to have been one too many. On Thursday a cold, cold ride of twenty miles without stopping was as much as we could well bear. After warming we took the road again and came to Smith's twelve miles. This week we have had heat for the first of June and cold and snow for January. On Friday we reached Fayetteville, putting up with John Lumsden near the African church. I felt that I had taken a deep cold. I was busy on Saturday in answering letters. Joseph Crawford, that he might not be idle, preached to the Africans in the evenings. Sabbath Day 12. Unwell. Nevertheless, I took the pulpit. Monday morning we made a start for Wilmington, and came to the Widow Anderson's, forty-six miles. Next day we took the roundabout way by the bridges and made forty-five miles. To ride ninety-one miles within daylight, in two days, kept us busy. But we are safe in Wilmington. My affliction upon my breast was great. Wednesday 15. We rest. It is very cold. Ice in the tubs and pails. Sabbath Day 19. I preached on that great subject, Colossians 1, 27, 28. We had about 1,500 hearers in our house of worship, 66 by 33 feet, galleried all around. There may be 5,000 souls in Wilmington, one-fourth of which number, it may be, were present. Joseph Crawford preached in the afternoon and at night. I gave order for the completion of the tabernacle and dwelling house according to the charge left me by William Meredith. Monday 20. On our way to Newburn, we stopped with Mr. Nixon at Topsail. 
his house and heart are always open to the faithful ministers of Christ. I have been greatly afflicted with cold, but exceedingly happy in God. I live in love. On Tuesday we had a solitary ride to Lot Ballard's, New River. Hail Prosperity. The chapel shaded. A revival amongst white and black. Lot lives in Jerusalem. Wednesday 22. A heavy storm of rain. I rode to Eli Perry's, son of John. Here is a son of faith and prayer. I walked with his dear good father. Now I trust in the paradise of God. I met Elder Bruce. All our talk is, what hath God wrought? In Beaufort, the Lord hath put forth his power. The whole town seems disposed to bow to the scepter of the Lord Jesus, after being left and visited again, within the last twenty years, by his faithful ministers. Thursday 23. We came into Newburn, twenty-three miles. The prospects here are good. The providence of God was manifested in our preservation today. Our horses took fright whilst in the wagon, and went off like fire. They happily struck and locked a wheel on a poplar. The swingle tree snapped, no more. Less damage, if any, could scarcely have been done. Saturday 25. I have read the Jewish Antiquities. I have read Mungo Park's Travels in Africa. Certain parts are so extraordinary that it appeared like a romance. If true, he experienced astonishing hardships. It would seem by this narrative that the Africans are in a state so wretched that any sufferings with the gospel would be submitted to in preference. But I have my doubts. Sabbath Day 26 I preached upon Hebrews 10, 37-39. It was a time and a testimony that was felt. Monday 27. It is as pleasant as May. The rivers are very low. We came with great ease to Washington and lodged one night. Joseph Crawford did not let that awful town go unwarned. On Tuesday we took the road and came to James Williams's on Tranter's Creek. G. Floyd died in the Lord a few days ago. He was a man of affliction, and a man of God, but not a preacher. At the New Chapel I spoke on Wednesday on 1 Peter 3, 14. I was very warm, upon death, the resurrection, judgment, and glory. I visited Brother Gnois, and saw Sister Hinton and the Widow Williams, on their way to glory. Thursday 30. We came very pleasantly to Williamstown. I was afflicted with a severe pain in my foot. On Friday I was busy planning, but in pain. Saturday, February 1. We came twenty miles to the Widow Williams's near Taylor's Ferry. On the Sabbath I preached on Acts 17, 30, 31. Now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. 1. The nature of repentance, the whole of religion. 2. The universality of repentance. All orders, stations, characters must repent. 3. The possibility of and the provision made for repentance. The gift of Christ. The death of Christ. The agency of the Spirit. The preaching of the gospel. The means of grace. 4. Necessity of repentance. From the considerations of the fall and our own actual transgressions a future state, and general judgment. 5. The time for repentance, now, this gospel day of grace. Monday 3. We lodged at B. Pinners on the east side of Roanoke, Northampton County. Tuesday 4. We lodged at the Widow Meredith's in Murfreesburg. We crossed Manu's Ferry next day and came to the Widow Baker's, Knotty Pine. Thursday 6. I preached at Daniel Southall's, Gates Courthouse. My subject was Revelations 3, 5. I was pleased to see so many come out upon so short a notice. May they overcome. 
from Camden to Gates Courthouse, I compute 480 miles. Friday 7. We came to Edenton. At Joshua Manning's. Saturday, rested and read and wrote. I begin to prepare my mind and my papers for the conference. On the Sabbath I preached in the courthouse upon 2 Corinthians 5.20. Monday 10. We started and came rapidly along, calling to see Martin Ross, a Baptist minister, by the way. We lodged with Colonel Hamilton, Elizabeth City. On Tuesday we reached James Wilson's, Northwest Roads, Norfolk County. It takes many jolts to ride 100 miles over rough roads in two days and a half. I called upon John Hodges. I feel seriously for his soul's welfare. I saw the grave of Sister Wilson. These were profitable visits to me. Virginia, Friday 14. Virginia Conference began in Norfolk, progressed peaceably, and ended on Thursday. One member opposed all petitions from the people for conference sittings. He also condemned all epistles from the sister conferences as being too long and pompous, and as likely to make innovations. He dictated an epistle himself by way of sample, to show how epistles ought to be written. The Committee of Addresses wrote one too, but it was rejected as being too much like that of the objecting member, whose epistle was rejected as being too much like himself. The conference voted that none should be sent. Strange that such an affair should occupy the time of so many good men. Religion will do great things, but it does not make Solomon's. We had preaching more noon and night. Large congregations and many souls engaged. We have reason to hope that nearly one hundred souls were under the operations of grace. I ordained two elders and Brother Watcoat twelve deacons. We have a rich supply of preachers for every circuit, and an addition of 2,398 in numbers, exclusive of the dead, expelled, withdrawn, and removed. Friday 21 We came away to Suffolk, next day came to Gerard Wills's Isle of Wight. On Sunday at Blunt's Chapel I spoke on Hebrews 13.13. 13. It was not a great meeting. I have not had a good night's rest until last night, for the last twenty days. During the sitting of conference, five hours were as much as I could get in the twenty-four. I feel happy in God continually. Monday 24 We came to Bernard Majors, Surrey County, on Tuesday to Petersburg, and Wednesday to Richmond. I had no time to preach, but Joseph Crawford gave them a sermon in each place. On Thursday we left the capital and came on to Lyons, Carolyn. On Friday got to Fredericksburg. Saturday, March 1. We rode to Brother Samford's, Poik, within twelve miles of Alexandria. Cold for certain. Sunday Brother Watcoat preached in the forenoon and myself in the afternoon in Alexandria. The cold was great and the wind piercing. On Monday we rode to Georgetown. Maryland, Tuesday 4. I preached. My subject was, Godliness is profitable unto all things. It was a feeling quickening time, to myself and others. Wednesday 5. I was employed in writing to the missionaries in the Mississippi Territory. Company does not amuse. Congress does not interest me. I am a man of another world, in mind and calling. I am Christ's, and for the service of his church. Some years past I called at Mr. M's in Calvert County. I acted as I do in all houses. Now I have found one of his sons a member of the Georgetown Society. Does God always hear prayer and answer it? If it is in the Spirit's groaning, and in purity of intention, and in faith, Doubtless he does. Friday 7. We set out to Spurrier's. All my old friends are dead or removed. Saturday brought us to Baltimore. 
Sunday at Light Street, my subject was Colossians 1, 28. At the African Church, Colossians 1, 9 through 12. Monday 10. Rested, wrote, and received friends. Tuesday 11. My mind is wholly for God. What hath the Lord wrought, and what is he still doing? Scarcely a letter from anyone that does not tell us good news of the work of God, as our yearly letter book will testify. Friday 14. Our conference began in great peace. Friday 21. The stations were read off and all concluded in great peace. Never had we a better conference in Baltimore. An answer was given to Dr. Koch's letter, I fear in a manner that will not please him. An order was passed that the answer should be presented to all the annual conferences. It was also recommended to the annual conferences to consider on the propriety of having a select, delegated conference. The Eastern, Western, and Southern conferences were counseled to take such measures as they, in their wisdom, might see best, to produce a more equal representation from their several bodies to the general conference. On the Sabbath, 16th, I preached at Fells Point. My subject, Isaiah 61, 1. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace. Introduction. Zion. The interests and welfare of the church. Jerusalem. The interests of the state. General propositions. On what principles we should calculate the true interests of the church and state. Who are concerned? What are the ways and means? and what the instruments to be used for the promotion of their welfare. At Old Town I also gave them a talk. My subject, Psalm 51. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted to thee. On Thursday we had an ordination of elders. I preached on the occasion. My subject was 1 Peter 5, 1-4. The work of God went on in all the four congregations, night and day, there might be thirty souls converted, but I hope we had one hundred under the operations of grace. We had nearly ninety members on the conference list, eighty-three of whom were stationed. On Saturday I went to Perry Hall to enjoy a calm after such a storm of labor. Sunday 23. I preached at Perry Hall, and after the snow ceased came away to Joseph Dallam's twenty miles. Tuesday, 25. We crossed Susquehanna. Calm and cold. Dined at Howell's North and lodged at Mr. Moody's, having called in for a minute at Back Creek. By riding a little in the night, we have made little short of fifty miles today. Wednesday, 26. I preached at Georgetown Crossroads. Ah, there is death in the pot here. I rode on to Chestertown. On Thursday I spoke in the new neat chapel in Kent, and was long and labored. I visited Cavill Hinson. After a twenty years' separation, we who were left were comforted in God together. I have made twenty-four miles today, feeble and afflicted with a cold and sore throat, but happy in God. The appointment for Friday at Centerville was filled by Bishop Watcote. After dining with Thomas Wright, I rode on to Mr. Lockerman's. I preached at Easton on Saturday. My subject, Romans fourteen nineteen, Let us follow after the things that make for peace, etc. In their estimate of the things of the world, as also of the ceremonials of religion, men will widely differ. These objects, to a divinely illuminated mind, are not worth the dispute they frequently occasion. But the things most worthy of all our attention, and our most engaged and diligent following after, are the things that make for peace, and promote the soul's edification. And these are the great things of God, the love of God, the death of Christ, the operations of His Spirit, and the deep things of God, respecting sanctification and eternal glory. I stay at Captain Fraser's, Carolyn County. My hoarseness is afflictive, but my soul is filled with God. Sabbath 30. A very dry season. 
my mind was greatly engaged for a spiritual reign, and temporal also. The Chesapeake district so far is not promising. The people's minds are agitated about stationed preachers, some for and some against. The devil would rather they would do something worse than disagree, but this to him is better than nothing. I only exhorted a little at Fraser's Chapel, and after meeting rode home with Thomas Foster, of the old Stamp and Steady. Monday 31. I rode down to Cambridge and preached at eleven o'clock. My subject, Psalm 51, 9, 10. I felt assisted. Tuesday, April 1. We returned to Thomas Foster's. I saw Joseph Everett, feeble but faithful, impatient waiting for his Lord. Delaware, Wednesday 2. At Brown's Chapel I spoke on 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. 1. The Gospel Dispensation. 2. The Revival of Religion 3. The Operations of Grace in Enabling Believers to Make Advances in the Divine Life This was the grand point urged, to wit, that God giveth grace to prepare for more, grace for grace, convictions for sin that they may repent, repentance that they may believe, justification that they may be convinced of indwelling sin, this convincement will evidence to believers the necessity of sanctification. From whence follow faithfulness unto death, and the crown of glory. The work of God revives. The chapel will soon be neatly finished. The second generation are filling the house, and joining their labors to what myself and their fathers did in the days of their fathers. I lodged at Brother Davis's. They have built a good chapel at Deep Creek. I exhorted here on Thursday after Joseph Crawford had preached. We dined at Brother Baker's and came on to Salisbury, Maryland. Here the work revives. Joseph Crawford preached. I was unwell. Virginia, Friday 4. We came to William Downing's, Virginia. At Downing's Chapel I spoke on Revelations 2.10. After sermon we rode to Accomac and lodged at Mr. Seymour's. Here Joseph Crawford preached in the evening. Sunday 6. That no time might be lost, we started away at 8 o'clock in the morning to Brother Watts's, 27 miles. My subject was Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. The sinners in Zion are afraid, etc. I preached in the courthouse, Accomac. It was an alarming season. The cold was great, and the winds are high. No rain. It is judgment weather. O Lord, arise. Monday 7. At Snow Hill, my subject was Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. A blessed rain came on before sermon and continued after it. We rode 15 miles to Brother Hazard's, Poplar Town, State of Delaware. Delaware, Tuesday 8. We rode 40 miles to Broad Kiln Town. I spoke on 1 Corinthians 15.58. Wednesday 9. I preached at Milford and then rode on to Dover and took up Father Watcote. On the way he was taken with a fit of the gravel, and I was afraid would die. I preached in Dover next day. We afterward rode to Duck Creek Crossroads in a snowstorm. Here the people are all very fervent, and the children praise the Lord. Joseph Crawford preached. Friday 11. We came in on as cold a day as one would wish who was fond of extremes, to Wilmington, forty miles. Ah, but I must preach. Well, I gave them a sermon at seven o'clock. The Africans here have a house to themselves, of stone, and equal in size to that of the whites. Pennsylvania. Saturday 12 brought us to Philadelphia. From Baltimore round by the eastern shore hither has cost us, by computation, 550 miles. I have been greatly supported in body and mind. Glory be to God. 
End of section 22. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 23 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Sabbath 13. I preached at St. George's upon 2 Peter 1, 12 through 14. At the Academy, I spoke on James 5, 7, 8. Many of the preachers were already in the city for conference. In the sitting of conference, we had so much irregular, desultory work that we went on slowly. We had sixty-three members present for traveling, besides those to be received in locations, and as supernumerary and worn out. Dr. Koch's letter was answered by a committee of ten preachers. Monday 21. Conference rose. Of seventy-six preachers stationed, all appeared to be pleased but two or three. But neither they nor anyone else can know the difficulties I had to encounter in the arrangement of the stations. Brother Watcote was left very ill at Dover. Perhaps he is dead. Eight deacons and six elders were ordained. I preached three times. I hope many souls will be converted in consequence of the coming together of this conference, having had great peace in the societies, and sound, sure preaching three times a day. New Jersey, Tuesday, 22. We came to Gloucester Point and on to Carpenter's Bridge. Here we have a Quaker Methodist meeting house. I preached upon Second Peter 1, 4. Heavy as I was, I had some openings. I visited my old friends Thomas and Margaret Taper. At Sharptown on Wednesday, no appointment. I walked to the meeting house. In the burying ground I saw the graves of some of the faithful. Amongst these, that of John Vanneman, once a traveling preacher. We rode to John Frith's Salem. No appointment. Thursday, 24. We returned to William Dilks's. Friday, 25. Except a few wandering thoughts, I feel great peace and holiness to God in my soul. I preached at Bethel upon Romans 12, 1, 2. We lodged at Daniel Bates's. I spoke upon 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 13. We had a ride of 35 or 40 miles today. Sunday 27. I preached at Burlington once more. My subject was 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, etc. The characters to whom repentance is essentially necessary. The unawakened the unfaithful, the backslidden, the repentance of believers, the consciousness of indwelling sin, improved by faith and prayer, is productive of holiness. The gracious will of God is to furnish means, men, and opportunities, because he is not willing that any should perish until they have a suitable trial. The coming of the Lord was his judicial appearing to say, Depart ye cursed or if understood as some judicial displays of his wrath, his coming will not be the less certain because of delay. For one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day with the Lord. Monday 28. I spoke at New Mills on 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I visited Richard Swain. There were several preachers and some others present, and the Lord's Supper was partaken. Tuesday 29. I preached at Mount Zion in the woods, near a little town called Egypt. We dined at Fuller Horner's and rode on to Stephen Breaklow's. We have made nearly forty miles today. I enjoy great evenness of mind and life in my labors. Wednesday 30. I preached at Lower Freehold. I came home with Simon Pyle. Ah, what a death there is in the Leonard family! Thursday, May 1. I breakfasted with Throckmorton. His loss is his gain. He has lost his birthright as a citizen of the state, but he has the blessing of God on his soul. I preached at Cheesecake Meeting House. Here, a people who have a trick of claiming a right to all free meeting houses, 
had shouldered the Methodists out. But the earth helped the woman. The people of the world have built a house for us. We lodged at Mr. Wham's. Friday, too. I feel the effects of my toil. I declined preaching in Brunswick. Joseph Crawford supplied my place. I rode on to B. Drake's. Saturday, 3. I crossed Long Ferry to Staten Island. It is like winter here. But what cannot the God of nature and of grace do, physically and spiritually? I viewed the spot where I first landed on the island in October 1771. I am alive, and about my master's work still. Glory, glory, glory. Sabbath 4 At the first meeting Joseph Crawford preached, I only exhorted. At the second meeting house, on the north side, I preached. We lodged at Chushong's. Monday 5 I preached at Elizabethtown and then came on to Newark. After stopping a while, we moved forward to Second River and called a meeting at which Joseph Crawford preached. We have a warm day, the harbinger of spring. Universal nature seems starting into innumerable forms of promise of the fruitful year. Oh, that it may be so spiritually. Tuesday 6. I preached at Belleville and rode on to New York. New York, Wednesday 7. I viewed the ground at Phillips Manor selected for our camp meeting. I felt as if God would be there, in answer to our prayers for nine months past. In the evening we came to Sherwood's Vale, and at night I went to the campground and looked on at the people, busy clearing the ground, fixing the seats, and building the stand. Thursday 8. I rested and wrote. Friday nine began with a storm, but the people came through it, bringing their tents and baggage, weary with walking. Saturday 10. The weather cleared. Sunday 11. I preached. It was an open season. Companies here and there dispersed, kept up the exercise of singing and prayer through the day, and far into the night. The Brooklyn tent was all prayer the greater part of the time. A marquee had been fixed for the preachers, and provisions came in from both town and country, the brethren from both delightfully meeting in worship and affections. On Monday the people of the world seemed to make a surrender. There was no longer a necessity for guards. There were between eighty and one hundred official members present, about one thousand Methodists, and some presumed about 6,000 souls were on the ground at different times. The people were so dispersed, and there was such a continual coming and going, I had no means of judging. We had great order and great power from the beginning to the end. I judge 200 souls were made the subjects of grace in its various operations of conviction, conversion, sanctification, and reclamation. Glory, glory. Wednesday 14. We came to New York. Thursday 15. I recollected myself and wrote letters. Friday 16. The conference commenced its sitting and rose on Thursday. We sat seven hours in each day, in great love, order, and peace. A paper was read setting forth the uncertain state of the superintendency, and proposing the election of seven elders, from each of the seven conferences, to meet at Baltimore, July 4, 1807, for the sole purpose of establishing the American superintendency on a sure foundation. This subject will be submitted to the consideration of all the conferences. The answer to Dr. Koch's letter, by the Conference of New York, was read, to be submitted to all the conferences. I preached three times and ordained three African deacons. We had preaching in the park as well as regularly in the meeting houses, and a day of fasting and prayer for the health of the city, the success of our conference labors, and the prosperity of Zion. I was greatly supported and blessed. The preachers were, perhaps, never better satisfied with their stations. 
Connecticut, Sunday 25. I preached at New Haven. After meeting, I visited Sister Thatcher, rejoicing in perfect love. Perhaps she is near her end. Since the 16th of April, 1805, I have, according to my reckoning, traveled 5,000 miles. Everlasting glory be to my all-sufficient God. Monday 26. I dined at Meriden and lodged at Mr. Pitkins's, East Hartford. Tuesday 27. I reached Thompson, 45 miles, faint yet pursuing. Wednesday 28. At Milford, the people, young and old, were on the green. The active playing at ball, the aged and others looking on. It was election day. Thursday 29, we dined at Mr. Boyle's, Needham, and rode on to Waltham. A few young people are under the operations of grace here, amongst whom are the two children of George Pickering. My namesake, Asbury, aged about ten and Maria, still younger. And there is a small revival of religion in the district. We rested here on Friday, and I preached at night on Philippians 1, 8-11. through 11. Massachusetts, Saturday 31. We have a gracious rain. It was greatly needed. In the evening we rode to Boston. Sunday, June 1. I preached in Boston. As usual, with me in this place, it was an open season. Some souls were powerfully moved, myself for one. Monday 2. I took a walk to West Boston to see the new chapel, 84 by 64 feet. The upper window frames were put in. We came to Lynn at 2 o'clock. I preached at 2 o'clock on Haggai 2, 8. After meeting, we rode as far as Marblehead. Here Joseph Crawford preached. I find that David Bachelor has been useful in this town. A revival has taken place. Tuesday 3. We came through dust and heat to Enoch Sanborns, East Kingston, 45 miles. We had a ride of about 50 miles to Old Wells on Wednesday. Eight or ten of these we might have saved had we known the nearest way from Exeter. Maine, Thursday 5. We came to Portland. Joseph Crawford preached. Friday 6. We went towards Buxton to attend the camp meeting. At 2 o'clock we came on the ground. There were 20 preachers, traveling and local. Saturday 7. I preached, and on the Sunday also. Some judged there were about 5,000 people on the ground. There were displays of divine power, and some conversions. Our journey into Maine has been through dust and heat, in toil of body, and in extraordinary temptation of soul. But I felt that our way was of God. Monday 9. We journeyed down through Buxton, Limerick, Parsons Field, Elfingham, into New Hampshire, stopping at Sandwich, to lodge with Mr. Webster. Tuesday 10. Through town after town we came to Dorchester, lodging at Deacon Blodgett's. Canaan brought us up on Wednesday. New Hampshire, Thursday 12. We opened the New England Conference and went through our business with haste and peace, sitting seven hours a day. The York Conference address respecting the superintendency was concurred in, and the seven elders for this conference elected accordingly. We did not, to my grief, tell our experiences, nor make observations as to what we had known of the work of God. The members were impatient to be gone, particularly the married townsmen. Sunday 15. I ordained eleven elders in the woods. At three o'clock I preached in the meeting house. It was a season of power. Monday 16. I lodged with John Broadhead. Tuesday 17. My labor is great, but I am blessed with a great willingness to duty. We came along through Enfield, Hanover, Lebanon, crossing Connecticut at Lyman's Bridge into Vermont, 
and kept on by Hartford, Sharon, and Ryletown. We brought up with Samuel Curtis, upon White's River, for the night. Vermont From New Haven to White's River we have made, by computation, 460 miles. I have had sufferings in the flesh, but perfect peace of mind. Wednesday, 18. We reached Barnard. I preached to Thomas Freeman's on Acts 26, 17, 18. Here is a lively, large society. We had a full house at a short warning. Our way on Thursday led through Randolph, Brookfield, Williamstown, Northfield, and Berlin. I preached at Samuel Smith's. Friday 20. We came upon Onion River at Montpelier, the contemplated seat of government for the state. I think it eminently well selected. For a site of this kind I know nothing in England or America more suitable. At Palmer's Mill I preached on 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Saturday 21. Brought us over the heights of Onion River to Russell's Bridge, thence to Bolton and Williston, dining at Brother Bradley's. After dinner we rattled along to Burlington, on Lake Champlain. Here I saw a grand college, equal in exterior to that of New Haven, a state house, meeting house, and other elegant buildings. We passed Shelbourne into Charlotte, on the lake, and put up with Mr. Fuller. We have made forty miles today. I am resolved to be in every part of the work, whilst I live to preside. It will be the best plan to bring on the sessions of all the conferences as early as possible, that there may be time given to all the preachers to go to work in the dawn of spring. The New England Conference should meet about the middle of April, and thus be ready for general conference. I feel as if I was fully taught the necessity of being made perfect through sufferings and labors. I pass over in silence cases of pain and grief, of body and mind. From appearances it would seem no great stretch of imagination to suppose there have been many lakes dried up in this country. Onion River Falls, for instance, must at one time have been a boundary. At this narrow pass, as at Harper's Ferry, on the Potomac, and the French Broad in North Carolina, the weight of waters has broken through the mountain on some day far upward in the history of past ages. They now supply Lake Champlain. On the Sabbath I preached in an upper room at Fuller's, to about four hundred people. My subject was Luke 4, 18, 19, and God bore witness to his own word. Why did I not visit this country sooner? By moving the conferences to an earlier period in the year, it might have been done, and may yet be done. What appeared to me to be impossible, I see now is very practicable. Ah, what is the toil of beating over rocks, hills, mountains, and deserts, five thousand miles a year? Nothing. When we reflect it is done for God, for Christ, for the Holy Spirit, the Church of God, the souls of poor sinners, the preachers of the gospel in the seven conferences, one hundred and thirty thousand members, and one or two millions who congregate with us in the solemn worship of God, oh, it is nothing. Monday 23. At Vergen Courthouse, I preached upon Mark 1, 15. I had to walk up a great hill, a mile, by the Falls of Otter. At Bridport, at six o'clock, I spoke upon Titus 2, 11, 12. Tuesday 24. Passing through Shoreham, Benson, and other towns, we came to Hampton Church at six o'clock. I gave them a sermon upon Hebrews 3, 14 through 16. On Wednesday, we came along by Granville and Salem, down to Cambridge. At six o'clock at Ashgrove, I preached upon Jude 17 to the end. I have traveled 150 miles through New Hampshire, and 220 or more in Vermont. We have sustained more damage than I can tell, by the absence of the preachers, two or three months, at every conference. This is an evil that must be remedied. Oh, how I felt for the people! 
this was worse than my incredible toil. Help, Lord, for vain is the help of man. Were it not for the aid we receive from the local and official members, the suspensions of the traveling preachers would ruin us. What is to be done? 1. Meet the conferences early. 2. Engage the official members to more engagedness and labor. 3. Let prayer meetings be more frequent. 4. Let all the probationers stay on the circuits, and let all who are recommended stay on the circuits also, until they could be admitted into the connection. Thursday 26. We came rapidly down the Pike Road to Pittstown, Hussack, Lansingburg, Troy, and Greenbush. On Friday through Skodak and Phillipstown, breakfasting at Mr. Bush's well-conducted stage tavern. And then onward through Lebanon and Canaan, in New York State, and Stockbridge, Old Barrington, and Sheffield, in Massachusetts. On Saturday we came into Connecticut, breakfasting at Salisbury. Our dinner we took on the Sharon campground. Sabbath 28. I preached in camp on 2 Corinthians 6, 2. On Monday we pursued our route through to Dover, and rested with Father Rose a while, dined and went on to Salem in New York State, and slept at Franklin, under the hospitable roof of Father Howes. New York, Tuesday, July 1. We came to Jeremiah Miller's and dined, and reached Elijah Crawford's at the Plains. We have traveled about 500 miles in the state of New York. I may remark here, now that I have time to make the remark, that the Lebanon camp meeting was great as to the numbers which attended, and great in power. We are now in many congregations and classes, reaping the fruits of the conference camp meetings, all through the circuit of New Rochelle, and the Sharon camp meeting will equal, in effect, those of the conferences. We have a few refreshing rains, the promise of rich crops of wheat, and abundant spiritual harvests. Glory to God. Wednesday 2. We came to New York. I had left my little traveling wagon to be sold at the Plains. On Thursday I came on to son Aaron Hunt's. Joseph Crawford came over the ferry with me. When about to part, he turned away his face and wept. Ah, I am not made for such scenes. I felt exquisite pain. New Jersey At Newark I lodged with Brother Lee Craft. I felt for, prayed with, and spoke to all the members of this family. Friday, July 4 Noise, parade, 17 rounds, and then to breakfast. I stole away quietly from this bustle towards Rockaway. I stopped at Brother Searman's with Brother M. Lenahan and wife. At Turkey Chapel, I spoke on 1 Corinthians 15.58. It was an open season. When there is a stir amongst the Methodists, other denominations send supplies, if they have not a stationed minister. The process is to hold a weekday meeting, perform a sacrament or a baptism, to place the new convert within the Ark of Safety, and all is done. Now we may stand still, or sit still, and see the salvation of God. I rejoice to hear of the appointment of a camp meeting on Turkey in August. Saturday 5 I came to Germantown, 25 miles, through a pleasant, beautiful, fruitful land of hills and vales. The place chosen for the encampment on Turkey I found a handsome height, elegantly sloping to the north. I trust four hundred souls will be converted. May it give new springs and tone to the work of God in the Jerseys. Sabbath 6 At Minard Farley's I preached upon Galatians 6, 9. In the afternoon again upon Acts 20, 32. I was led out in an uncommon degree. May it be the prelude to better days. My first visit here was during the Revolutionary War. Now the children of people not then married are born, grown up and married. After meeting I rode on to Pennytown, housing for the night with Jonathan Burns. 
Tuesday, 8. I was on the road at 5 o'clock. The bridge over the Delaware is said to have cost three or four hundred thousand dollars. I reached Manley Hall about four o'clock. From New Haven to Philadelphia, I judge I have made one thousand sixty-five miles, going and returning, and about one thousand eight hundred miles since I left the Philadelphia Conference. Much suffering and much toil. Not unto me, but unto thy good providence, O my God, be all the glory. After writing some letters, I preached at Kingston at five o'clock, on Acts twenty twenty four. On my return, I found a letter from Dr. Chandler, declaring the death of Bishop Watcote, that father in Israel, and my faithful friend for forty years, a man of solid parts, a self-denying man of God. Who ever heard him speak an idle word? When was guile found in his mouth? He had been thirty-eight years in the ministry, sixteen years in England, Wales, and Ireland, and twenty-two years in America, twelve years as presiding elder. Four of this time he was stationed in the cities, or traveling with me, and six years in the superintendency. A man so uniformly good I have not known in Europe or America. He had long been afflicted with gravel and stone, in which afflictions, nevertheless, he traveled a great deal. 3,000 miles the last year. He bore in the last three months excessively painful illness with most exemplary patience. He died in Dover on the 5th of July, and his mortal remains were interred under the altar of the Wesley Dover Church. At his taking leave of the South Carolina Conference, I thought his time was short. I changed my route to visit him, but only reached within 130 miles. Death was too quick for me. End of section 23. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 24 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Delaware, Friday, 11. I came to Wilmington and on Saturday to Northeast. On the Sabbath I preached. Monday brought me to Perry Hall, and on Tuesday I reached Baltimore. Maryland, Thursday 17. Busy writing letters to the South and to England. I enjoy great peace, and am in the spirit of prayer. On Friday I visited three families on Elk Ridge. On Saturday I came to Brother Riggs's, dined and went on to Dr. Waters's. I preached at Goshen Meeting House. We have, it is said, the greatest draught that can be remembered in this country. The springs seem to be failing everywhere. Monday I went to Rachel Hall's, dined and rode on to Samuel Howard's. Here I had a bilious attack and became quite bedsick. Tuesday 22 we have a most blessed, glorious shower of rain. I received it as an answer to prayer. The oats in the fields are unpromising, but the corn looks green, and the people are diligent in plowing and dressing. A fine example this to Christians. Oh, how diligently should we labor! The heat is great. Wednesday 23. I called upon Joseph Perkins, the superintendent of the U.S. Armory. Here is a factory of stores of instruments of death, tastefully arranged in the several apartments. There may they remain forever. But will it be so? Alas, no. I was caught in a rain upon the river, the effects of which I felt next day. August 3. I am here at John Davenport's. I have been sick and laid up since Thursday last. Copious bleeding emetics, cathartics, and bark have had their turns. The fever since the day before yesterday has left me. I have been providentially favored with a good physician, kind friends, and temperate heat. The Lord hath done this well. I might have been taken amongst strangers and have had more pain. Rest was wanting, and I may hereafter have better weather for the toilsome journey before me. 
Happily, I laid my hands on Simpson's Plea for Religion, in which we have a wonderful and interesting account of good and bad men for three centuries. The author has drawn aside the purple curtains of the Church of Rome, and the black robes of the anti-Christian Church of England, to lay bare the abuses of bad systems, and the vices of mitred heads. He has raised his warning voice against the corruption of manners and morals in all orders, which will, he predicts, without a speedy reformation, cause the downfall of all ecclesiastical establishments. He has magnanimously renounced his living as a minister, which his conscience would permit him no longer to hold. He said he knew not where to go, but the Lord has taken him to the church of the firstborn. Oh, what a warning is here given to all churches, to all ministers, to all Christians, and to thee, O oh my soul! Recollecting I had never preached in the neighborhood, and feeling a little unwilling to pass another dumb Sabbath, we called a solemn assembly, as much as if we had come to the funeral of one of the family. My subject was First Kings 8, 35-39. I was rapid for about an hour. They are faithfully warned. Let them look to it. Virginia, Wednesday 6. I came to Winchester. Wrote to Miles and Doherty. Report says that a copy of Dr. Coke's letter was taken by stealth. The British are irritated, and the Americans are not pleased. But they were calm in council. I lodged at Sister Phelps's. Thursday 7. Came to the camp meeting at Chrisman's Springs, now Stover's Springs. Necessity compelled them to come here for the sake of the water in this great general drought. I moved on to Stoverstown. Friday 8. I breakfasted at Millerstown, rode to Wires to dinner, and by driving two hours in the night reached Rocktown, or Rockingham, and put up with Mr. Williams. I have traveled fifty miles today over rough, rocky roads. I rested my feeble body on Saturday. Sunday 10. Our house here, 40 by 48 feet, may contain 15 or 1,800 people. Now that we have a place of worship of our own, I hope we shall have another revival. I preached the first sermon. My subject, Isaiah 56, 8. We had an open time. Monday 11, I rested. Tuesday 12, I came away to Staunton. I preached in the courthouse on Isaiah 55, 6, 7. Wednesday 13 brought us to Fairfield. I lodged at Mr. Moore's tavern. At Lexington I found Mr. Shield, my host, sick. I prayed with them. It was a time of tenderness. I set out faint indeed for Mr. M. Conkey's, a decent house. Here I prayed as amongst the Methodists. This excessive delicacy of feeling, which shuts my mouth so often, may appear strange to those who do not know me. There are some houses in which I am not sure that I could speak to my father, were he alive, and I to meet him there. Bystanders might have cause to exclaim with wonder, What a son! Friday 15. I rode fifteen miles and breakfasted with Mr. Topcotts. Eleven miles farther brought me to Mr. Thomas's, near the campground, at a little town called Amsterdam. I have been afflicted, but this may be for good. Had it not been for the top of the sulky, perhaps, sultry as it was, I should have been obliged to stop. Faint and feeble, the kindness of good men and the affectionate attentions of good women supported me. May a gracious God bless those who were thus made blessings to me. In prayer I have had uncommon life and liberty, but I had not strength to talk as much as I wished about God and religion. On Saturday I felt unwell. Sunday 17. I ventured to the camp. I preached at eleven o'clock to about three thousand souls. I held on loud and long. It was the Lord, not I. Notwithstanding matters were not as I could wish, I trust much good will be done. Monday 18. I rested at Mr. Thomas's. 
Tuesday 19. I ventured on the campground again and preached at eight o'clock. I was weak and unwell, but was divinely aided, whilst enlarging on Philippians 1, 1. May this weighty subject rest on the minds of the preachers, and on none more than the heart of the speaker. I came away with Samuel Mitchell. Friendship and good fellowship seem to be done away between the Methodists and Presbyterians. Few of the latter will attend our meetings now. Well, let them feed their flocks apart. And let not Judah vex Ephraim, nor Ephraim Judah. And may it thus remain, until the two sticks become one in the Lord's hands. Wednesday 20. Being unwell, I rested. Thursday 21. We came away through excessive heat to Thomas Barrett's, at the foot of the Allegheny Mountain. Friday 22 brought us over the rough, rude mountain. They are making a turnpike here. After breakfasting at Brother Haymaker's, we came on to Pepper's Ferry, sometimes directing our route by chance. Since the 23rd of May to this day, I believe we have not had a steady rain for six hours together. Yet it is a miracle and mercy that the prospects of corn are so good. We rested for the day at Pepper's, and, need we add, weary, men, and horses. Sunday 24 At Page's Chapel, I spoke on Second Chronicles 7, 13-14. It was an awful talk, and the people were alarmed. We dined at Mitchell's and lodged at Weigler's, that we might lose no time. Monday 25. I was in danger of being cast away on my route to Crockett's, but was mercifully preserved. I felt exceedingly grateful that not even the skin of either horse or man was broken. I jumped out of the carriage. Ah, I see that old men will fail in great danger. Tuesday 26. We came to Wythe Courthouse, 18 miles, to breakfast, and reached David Stewart's to lodge. Wednesday 27. I came to Charles Hardy's. I have not slept well. I am faint with toil and excessive heat, like an oven in the afternoon. Thursday 28 brought us over the dreadful roads to the salt works. The great drought has not prevailed so greatly on Holston of Tennessee. Tennessee, Saturday 30. I preached at the Widow Russell's, my hostess is as happy and cheerful as ever. Sunday 31 I preached at the Manaham Meeting House. I once thought we should scarcely ever have a tabernacle of our own in these parts. We have now three, in a triangle of eight miles extent. Tuesday, September 2 I was weak, but attended the appointment of the stationed preacher, A. Houston. My subject was 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 15. Strong in spirit, but feeble in body. Next day I rode 30 miles over to Edward Cox's. Thursday 4. I preached at Bethel. I was faint, and felt the effects of sickness and the rough roads. I lodged at the Widow Lewis's on Beaver Creek. Friday 5. I felt that I was done and must lay by a while. Saturday 6. I preached at Charles Helton's upon Main Holston. Weak as I was, it was an open time. Sunday 7. We crossed Holston at the mouth of Watauga. The Sabbath I do not often employ in traveling, sometimes when I fall in with the circuit preachers. I was very close in my discourse at Dingworth's, on Psalm 51, 10 through 13. The people have sat under a Calvinistic ministry. I lodged at William Nelson's, an ancient home and stand for Methodists and Methodist preaching. I have gone over rough roads and a wild country, rocks, ruts, and sidelong difficult ways, sometimes much obscured. It was thus I lost my way, and traveled twenty miles farther than I needed. Monday 8. Prepared for conference. Saturday 13. 
my bowels for some days past have been much disordered, and I have been otherwise ill. But constant occupation of writing, reading, and praying has diverted my attention from my sufferings. The medicine taken today has done good. I am obliged to avoid the sun as I would a burning fire. Sunday 14. I preached at the stand in the woods. Brother M. Kendry followed. It was a season of feeling. Saturday 20. The Western Conference commenced its sitting, and ended on Monday. The Mississippi missionary preachers could not be spared, they thought, from their work, and therefore did not come. We had great peace. There are fourteen hundred added within the bounds of this conference. Of the fifty-five preachers stationed, all were pleased. In unison with the preceding conferences, an answer was given to Dr. Koch's letter. We had preaching at noon and night, and good was done. The brethren were in want, and could not suit themselves. So I parted with my watch, my coat, and my shirt. By order of the conference, I preached a funeral discourse on the death of our dear friend Watcote, from John 1, 47-50. There were not far from two thousand people present. If good were done, which I trust and hope, it is some compensation for my sufferings. Thirteen hundred miles in heat and sickness on the road, and in the house, restless hours, the noise of barking dogs, impatient children, and people trotting about, and opening and shutting doors at all hours. Wednesday 24. We came to Buncombe. We were lost within a mile of M. Killens, and were happy to get a schoolhouse to shelter us for the night. I had no fire, but a bed wherever I could find a bench. My aide, Moses Lawrence, had a bear skin, and a dirt floor to spread it on. Friday 26. My affliction returned. Considering the food, the labor, the lodging, the hardships I meet with and endure, it is not wonderful. Thanks be to God, we had a generous rain. May it be general through the continent. Saturday 27. I rode twelve miles to Turkey Creek, to a kind of camp meeting. On the Sabbath I preached to about five hundred souls. It was an open season, and a few souls professed converting grace. Monday 29. Raining. We had dry weather during the meeting. There were eleven sermons and many exhortations. At noon it cleared up, and gave us an opportunity of riding home. My mind enjoyed peace, but my body felt the effects of riding. On Tuesday I went to a schoolhouse to preach. I rode through Swanino River and Kane and Hooper's Creeks. North Carolina, Wednesday, October 1. I preached at Samuel Edney's. Next day we had to cope with Little and Great Hunger Mountain. Now I know what Mills Gap is, between Buncombe and Rutherford. One of the descents is like the roof of a house, for nearly a mile. I rode, I walked, I sweat, I trembled, and my old knees failed. Here are gullies, and rocks, and precipices. Nevertheless, the way is as good as the path over the Table Mountain. Bad is the best. We came upon Green River, crossed and then hobbled and crippled along to Martin Edwards, a local preacher. My host had waited two years. I ordained him to deacon's orders. I feel as if I ought not to preach one sermon without being pointed and very full upon the doctrine of purity. Saturday 4. Crossed Green and Broad Rivers to attend a meeting in the woods in Rutherford County. I preached on the Sabbath on Psalm 51, 8 through 11, and on Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning on 1 John 1, 6, 7. It was a moving season. I made my lodging with Brother Driscoll's on Sunday night, and on Monday at Major George Moore's, twenty miles from the ground. On Tuesday we came rapidly through a part of Lincoln, to South Carolina, about thirty miles, and lodged at Alexander Hills, and next day stayed with Mr. Fulton. My mind is in constant peace, under great bodily exertions. 
I preached at my hosts upon Matthew 24, 12, 13. South Carolina, Thursday 9. At the Waxhaws. We crossed Catawbaw at Emlenahan's Ferry, and came to Robert Hancock's to lodge. We have had a blessed rain. On Friday we came to the Hanging Rock. Death, death. The death of our friend Daniel Carpenter makes a great breach. But he has gone safe. Saturday, rain. Rest, closely occupied in writing. On the Sabbath I preached at the Hanging Rock. Few people, but a good season. On Monday I copied the minutes. I feel full of God. Glory to God. On Tuesday I went over to Thompson's Creek, Anson County, to see George Doherty. But his friends had conveyed him away on a bed. I spent Wednesday in reading, meditation, prayer, and Christian conversation in the family of Thomas Shaw. Thursday 16. Rode back to the Hanging Rock. I felt the effects of the ride, as the exercise was somewhat new. I prayed in two out of three families we visited. It seemed to me as if they were cases of life and death. It is the duty of a general officer to be careful of all his men, especially those composing his staff. A draught is the cause of want and affliction. In such seasons we should use humiliation, fasting, penitence, and prayer. Friday 17. Closely occupied in writing. On Saturday, road to Camden. I have received a full account from Dr. Chandler, Delaware District, of the work of God from May 3rd to August 24th. What hath God wrought? Sunday 19. I preached upon 1 Corinthians 11, 28. Let a man examine himself. After making some general observations on the sacrifice of Abel, of Abraham, and the nature of the Passover and the Lord's Supper, I enforced the necessity upon sinners, seekers, backsliders, believers, and ministers to examine themselves. In the afternoon I heard the Rev. Mr. Flynn, and was pleased with him as a Presbyterian minister. Mr. Smiley, a Presbyterian, preached for us in the tabernacle. Monday 20. I rode to Rembert Hall, 1120 miles from Philadelphia, in health and, I trust, in holiness. Glory to God. Tuesday 21. Reading Closely. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, reading the eighth and ninth volumes of Wesley's sermons. They wake the powers of my soul. Abstinence and prayer. I feel my mind in great peace, and a staid trust that the Lord will provide for the South Carolina Conference. Let the preachers go, as they have done, to their farms and their merchandise. Yet I am greatly confident of the success of the cause of God in these parts. Sunday 26. At Rembert's Chapel I preached on 1 John 3, 1-3. 1. The manner of love, not that of a master, a father, a mother, or a Christian, but love of a peculiar character, the love of God, demonstrated in Christ for our redemption and salvation. 2. A view of the past, present, future, and eternal state of believers. First, the low estate. Secondly, adoption, and regeneration, and sanctification. Thirdly, glorification of soul and body. Behold and wonder whilst ye adore. Lastly, the men of the world know not the Father. How then should they know the children of God the Father? Monday 27. I am bound for the city of Charleston. We sought lodging at two houses at Bruton's Lake. We found it at Mr. Martin's. On Tuesday we made twenty-five miles to Murray's Ferry, instead of fifteen. At Long Ferry, to which we were obliged to steer, we were detained five hours through the swamp. Heat, mosquitoes, golly nippers, plenty. We rode twenty miles after sundown to get to Mr. Hatchett's, at Monk's Corner. 
The family being sick, we went to Mr. Jones's, who kindly entertained us. We made fifty miles today, and came to lodgings about ten o'clock at night. On Wednesday we came through heat and heavy roads to Charleston, where we found all things well, and in good order. Lewis Myers is an economist. Sunday, November 2. At Cumberland Street Church I preached in the morning, and at Bethel in the afternoon. Monday 3. Neither unemployed nor triflingly. If we call for social prayer seven times a day, there are none to complain. The house is our own, and profane people board not with us. My time is spent in reading, writing, and receiving all who come, whites and Africans. I am sometimes called away in the midst of a letter. God the Lord is here. I am happy that we have finished our new church and bought an acre of ground. Should I live long, I shall see a house in the northern liberties of Cooper River. On Tuesday I wrote a letter to Dr. Koch, giving a general statement of the late work of God upon our continent. Sunday 9. I preached again in Cumberland Church, on 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18. I spoke under serious depression of body and mind. In the afternoon, I gave them a discourse at the Bethel Church, upon Philippians 1, 27-30. I have read many pages of church history, written twelve long letters, preached four sermons, and received all visitors, and spoken to them on the concerns of their souls. Monday 10. It appears that there is a work amongst white and black. Some have found the blessing. I received a letter from Daniel Hitt, giving an account of the long, calm camp meeting in Maryland. It held from the 8th to the 14th of October. 580 were said to be converted, and 120 believers confirmed and sanctified. Lord, let this work be general. On Tuesday I left my prison and got as far as Captain Perry's, 30 miles, and next day, by riding two hours in the night, reached Bars. On Thursday we rode up Edisto to Benjamin Terence, 22 miles. Next day we reached Weathersby's, 25 miles. Georgia. Saturday brought us to Augusta. We have made a journey of about six days in five, through the deep sands. Sabbath 16. The morning was cold and few hearers. My subject was Romans 13, too. High time indeed. In the afternoon I spoke again on Hebrews 11, 25-26. I wrote to Daniel Hitt on things sacred. I am grieved to have to do with boys. Hugh Porter had written to this town about a station, and added to the mischief he had formerly done. I shall take care of these youngsters. And behold, here is a bell over the gallery. And cracked, too. May it break. It is the first I ever saw in a house of ours in America. I hope it will be the last. Monday 17. Pleasant ride to Sindel's, 16 miles. Here, after the second generation is risen up, we have a revival in Columbia County. By being lost, we made a ride of 30 miles to Thomas Haynes on Tuesday. A few met for prayer. I spoke to them on 1 Peter 1, 3-6. On Wednesday we rested. At Fountains on Thursday I preached on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 14. On Friday I rested, wrote, and visited. Saturday 22. Rode to the west end of Wilkes County. At Stevenson Meeting House we held a three days meeting. Four traveling and two local preachers were present. I read the letter from P. Chandler in Delaware and exhorted a little. End of section 24. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 25 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Sabbath 23. 
I preached on Luke 4, 18. There might be 1,000 souls. We hope three were converted, and many quickened, preachers and people. I ordained James Allen a local deacon. Tuesday 25. Rained. I kept close, read, wrote, and prayed. A thought struck me that I would take the names and numbers of our congregations in Georgia. This I effected with the assistance of Josias Randall, and found them to be 130, which I calculate to consist of 1,000 souls each, so that we preach to 130,000 souls in Georgia, to some of these once in a year, others once in a quarter, others in four, some in two, and by the labors of the traveling and local ministry, to some every week. The return of members for this state will be about 5,000 for the present year. It is quite probable we congregate 200,000 in each state, on an average, and if to these we add those who hear us in the two Canadian provinces, in the Mississippi and Indiana territories, it will perhaps be found that we preach to four millions of people. What a charge! Wednesday 26. A clear sky, and a soul unclouded. On Thursday we rode to Arthur Matthews's, a healthy, decent, serious family, in Warren County. Friday brought us to William Hardwick's, Jefferson County. Next day I preached at Bethel Chapel, on 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, 7. I took lodging at Benjamin Bryan's. Sabbath 30. We had very cold weather after a rain. The house was badly calculated for the change. My subject was 2 Corinthians 4, 2. I lodged at Russell Brown's. Monday, December 1. Came back to Rehoboth. I have ridden 84 miles to attend this meeting at Bethel. To little purpose, I fear unless for the trial of my own faith and patience. I was greatly chilled in my system. On Tuesday I read and wrote, and rode through a storm two miles to see Billy Stith. Next day we had rain, snow, and excessively cold weather. I preached upon Romans 12, 12, 13. There were twelve souls present. On Thursday we had our horses shod. The excessive rains and freshets have done damage. The bridges on Ogichi are generally carried away, so also upon Little River. Friday 5 We passed Williams's Creek, and afterward Little River, where the bridge once stood. I lodged at Thomas Grant's and left a family exhortation. Saturday brought us along through Washington to Petersburg, 32 miles. We fed our horses on the route, though we starved ourselves. I preached at seven o'clock in the evening. Reverend Blank Cummins and Reverend Blank Doak, our Presbyterian brethren, were present. Sabbath 7. At Tate's Meeting House, I preached upon Luke 12:40. It was a very cold day, and the house was so open we had little satisfaction. I visited Charles Tate, a judge. I did not present myself in the character of a gentleman but as a Christian, and a Christian minister. I would visit the President of the United States in no other character. True, I would be innocently polite and respectful, no more. As to the Presbyterian ministers, and all ministers of the gospel, I will treat them with great respect, but I shall ask no favors of them. To humble ourselves before those who think themselves so much above the Methodist preachers by worldly honors, by learning, and especially by salary, will do them no good. Monday 8. We had cause to rejoice at James Alston's that parents and children love the Lord. The old people have I known for twenty-seven years. I preached here on Monday on Second Peter 3, 2. On Tuesday I came to Blackwell's. The widow is my hostess. The former head of the family is gone to rest. Wednesday 10. At Ralph Banks's. Where shall we find so healthy and happy a man and wife as we have here? The mother is but thirty-seven, and she has twelve fine children. 
I was determined to go to the meeting-house, excessive as the rain was. We had one woman and thirty men. We rejoiced in God. They have had a camp-meeting blessing at Coldwater. The people are lively. Thursday 11. We rode twenty miles to James Marx's Broad River Quarterly Meeting. Another plentiful and powerful rain. On Friday night we held a feeble night meeting. On Saturday at the meeting house I spoke on Galatians 6, 9. It was penetratingly cold. We held a meeting in James Marx's dwelling house at night. Sabbath 14. At 10 o'clock we had prayer meeting. S. Matthews preached at 11 o'clock, and I held forth at 12 o'clock in the open air. I faced the sun, but my glasses saved my eyes. We felt cold enough. Monday 15. Rode to Oglethorpe and put up with Henry Pope. Our thirty miles ride was made without feeding man or beast. Reaching Athens on Tuesday, we had an evening lecture at Hope Hulls. I wished to have crossed the river into Jackson County, but the rain came on, and we returned to Blanton's and Pope's. General Clark and L. Crawford had been dwelling on Indian lands. They and their company, five in all, lodged at Pope's with us. In my presence they restrained their wild, fearless, frontier character, and behaved with great decency and politeness. Thursday 18. Great Rain. Reading and Writing. On Friday I visited James Freeman. At Blanton's on Saturday, I spoke on 1 John 2, 15-17. I preached at Pope's Church on Romans 8, 7-9. Elders Mead, Hull, and Matthews were present, and bore a part in the public religious exercises. John, a black man, preached in the evening. Monday 22. We rode to General Stewart's. Very warm, like a summer's day. What amazing changes we have in this country! I gave them a sermon. On Tuesday we had a night meeting at John Crutchfield's. I spoke on 1 John 2, 1-3. through 3. We had a gentle gale of grace. On Wednesday we were at liberty. Alas for poor Samuel Mayo, the son of pious John, a local Methodist preacher in England. I have no children to blot my name by drunkenness or murder. Thursday 25 Our new chapel at Liberty is thirty by fifty feet. I gave them a sermon in it on 1 Peter 4, 3-5, lodged at Joshua Moore's. On Friday I found Miles Green preaching. I ordained him immediately, and then gave a discourse on Hebrews 12, 1-2. After meeting I came on to Sparta. I received a dozen letters from the north. More good news from Dr. Chandler. The work of God is wonderful in Delaware. But what a rumpus is raised. We are subverters of government, disturbers of society, movers of insurrections. Grand juries in Delaware and Virginia have presented the noisy preachers. Lawyers and doctors are in arms. The lives blood, and livers of the poor Methodists are threatened. Poor crazy sinners, see ye not that the Lord is with us? Sabbath 28. Prayer meeting at 6 o'clock. John M. Veen preached at 8 o'clock. At 12 o'clock I read the letters narrative of the great work, and preached upon Colossians 4, 7, 8. Brother Kendrick occupied the pulpit at 3 o'clock and Brother Mead at night. Monday 29. We began our conference. The subject of the delegated conference was adopted, with only two dissenting voices. These members, however, cheerfully submitted, and one of the dissentients was elected a member. All was peace respecting the stations. We had prayer meeting at six o'clock. At eleven, at three, and at seven o'clock at night we had preaching. I was called upon to deliver a funeral discourse for Bishop Watcote. On the Sabbath morning we had a band meeting in the conference, 
and I preached in the open air at eleven o'clock. My subject, Mark 16, 1920. From Philadelphia to Augusta, I counted 1,820 miles the route we have made. We have 50 traveling preachers in this conference this year, and an increase of 1,000 members. South Carolina. On Thursday, January 1, 1807, we set out for Columbia, dining in the woods on our route. It was excessively cold. I preached in Mr. Harrison's house in the evening. Next day we came to Camden. Saturday brought us to Rembert Hall. We have been redeeming time by riding 220 miles in five days. It has been so cold, I have not been able to pray and meditate as I wished. I must now answer thirteen letters in two days. My body is afflicted, but I am kept in perfect love. Sabbath 11. We attended, as was meet, at Rembert's Chapel. I gave them a sermon on First Chronicles 28, 9. Wednesday 14. We came away to M. Column's Ferry. I had finished my writing on Monday and Tuesday. On our way we dined at Woodham and lodged with Jeremiah Heath. On Thursday we crossed P.D. and came to Colonel Bathy's. North Carolina Friday brought us through Lumberton, in North Carolina, lodging with Peter Gautier. We found ourselves obliged to ride on the Lord's Day, through the cold, to Wilmington, crossing two rivers in a snow and hailstorm. I have ridden 420 miles in ten days and a half, cold, sick, and faint. It was as much as I could well bear up under. Monday 19 busy making extracts from letters, and planning for conferences. Tuesday occupied as yesterday. In the evening I preached. I feel that God is here. On Wednesday Brother Kendrick preached. Thursday reading and writing. Joshua Wells preached. Friday 23. I preached in the tabernacle upon Matthew 11, 28-30. It was a time of some quickening. On Saturday, reading Wesley's sermons, first volume. Those who feel disposed to complain of the brevity of his notes should recollect the wonderful amount and variety of his literary labors, polemical and practical, besides the care of all the churches in three kingdoms. Sabbath 25 A high day on Mount Zion. At the rising of the sun, John Charles began the worship of the day. He chose for his subject Romans 8, 1. At eleven o'clock I held forth on Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. I spoke again at three o'clock on Isaiah 55, 6, 7. Stith Mead preached at six o'clock in the evening. Oh, that by any means we may save some. On Monday and Tuesday, still reading Wesley sermons, I have completed thirty nearly. On Tuesday evening I preached, and it was a serious time. Wednesday 28. We took our flight from Wilmington. What I felt and suffered there, from preachers and people, is known to God. At Nixon's top sale, I preached on 2 Peter 3, 14. On Thursday I rode forty miles to the Richlands and preached at Lot Ballard's. Friday evening found us at Perry's. Saturday brought us to Newburn. We had an awful storm of rain. February 1. I preached on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Wednesday 4. We have used great diligence in our conference labors, and have been faithful to the pulpit. I preached today on 1 Corinthians 2, 5. On the Sabbath I preached to the Whites on John three sixteen and to the Africans on Ephesians 6, 5-8. through 8. Much might be said. I will only observe that we have 67 preachers, and have added 3,159 to this conference bounds. We have, since our sitting here, known that there are 20 whites converted, and as many blacks. 
These blessings on our labors pay all expenses, reward all toils in the midst of suffering and excessively cold weather. Monday 9. I gave them my last discourse on Psalms 34, 15, 16, and next day came away to the widow Williams's. On Wednesday at Pinner's, the Roanoke had broken away with its ice. Thursday it brought us to Murfreesboro. I preached upon 1 John 3, 10, 11. It was the day after the celebration of Washington's funeral. Many of the respectables had come to town on this occasion, and still remained. These attended. I lodged at Dr. Key's. Virginia, Friday 13. We came to Suffolk. I had sent on a messenger, and found a congregation, to whom I spoke a few words, on 1 Peter 3, 10-12. We felt a present God. Brother Yerbury, as dying, and behold, he lives, spiritually. I have time to make but few observations. We have had rain for three days past, bad roads for two hundred miles. Since I left Philadelphia, I calculate having traveled two thousand four hundred and forty miles. At Norfolk I preached for them, and at Portsmouth. On Monday we came away to General Wells's, Isle of Wight County and next day called upon Willie Blunt on our way to Birdsongs. Wednesday brought us through a proper storm to Petersburg. The streets were not easily passable. We lodged on Thursday night in Richmond at the house of the widow Tucker. The roads hither had well nigh mired us. On Friday we lodged at William Smith's. These are friends to camp meetings and gracious souls. A long ride of forty-two miles brought us to Fredericksburg on Saturday. We got a little fodder for our horses, and took a cut of dry bread on the cold ground ourselves. My mind enjoys great peace, and yet there are subjects that might disturb it. But I pass them over. I am not fond of hurting the feelings of people. Sabbath 22 I preached in the church, and then came away to Aquiatown, sixteen miles, and lodged at Mr. Bailey's. On Monday I went over to Sanford's on Poik. Next day the rain followed us to Alexandria. At night I gave them a discourse on Revelations 14, 12, 13. Maryland, Wednesday 25. We crossed over into Maryland at Georgetown. Surely the roads are bad. My mind is in great peace. I had to preach a kind of funeral discourse on the death of Bishop Watcote on Thursday, and on Friday I came away to Bladensburg. Here I baptized a child and prayed with the afflicted, and resumed my march eastward through mud and mire, arriving in the night in Baltimore. Saturday 28. Snow. I rested and wrote. Sabbath, March 1. Light Street Chapel. I preached upon Hebrews 12, 2. At the African Church my subject was Colossians 2, 6. Saturday 7. Our conference commenced its sitting on Monday and rose this evening. There were 101 members upon the list. Eighteen of these were additions made. We sat six hours a day and did much work in great peace. In the multiplicity of things that necessarily came before me, much must be left in shades. There were few complaints about stations. The increase within the bounds of the Baltimore Conference is 2,817 members. We had a great deal of faithful preaching. On the Sabbath I preached at the point, and at Light Street I gave them my last discourse. I was in affliction and unwell, but always in peace. God is all in all. Tuesday 10. I left Baltimore for Perry Hall. I spent one night with the elders of the house and my old friends Jesse Hollingsworth and Daniel Hitt, the faithful companion of my travels for 3,000 miles. On Wednesday we left our kind friends and came to Bennett's. Next day I preached in Brother Howell's house and came to Northeast. 
Friday brought us through rain and snow to Georgetown Crossroads. Here we called a meeting in the evening. My subject was 2 Corinthians 12, 9. On Saturday we came into Chestertown. It was damp and cold. Sabbath 15. Hail, blessed day! The sun of righteousness within us, and the material sun once more gladdens the earth with his beams. Although we have taken five days to come from Baltimore to this place, a distance of one hundred miles, the stage drivers can tell that we have been pretty busy. At Chester, I find that unpleasing prejudices have been excited by the publication of a pamphlet on succession in the church. The author is one Culey, who went from us. In the morning I preached upon Psalm thirty seventeen, Come ye children, etc. 1. Who are to be taught. 2. What they are to be taught. 3. Who are the teachers. 4. The happy consequences of being taught aright, and receiving and practicing the instructions given. I spoke again in the afternoon on Revelation six thirteen fourteen. My mind is in perfect peace. Monday 16. Came to Centerville, and I preached. After dining with Thomas Wright, the brother of the present governor of Maryland, we came to Easton, and lodged with Mr. Lockerman. On Tuesday, Daniel Hitt preached. I only exhorted. We met Joseph Everett, who conducted us to William Fraser's to dine. On Wednesday, we came to Thomas Foster's. I was unwell, and Daniel Hitt preached. We rode on to Cambridge. Daniel Hitt preached in the evening. Thursday 19. I took the pulpit at 11 o'clock. It was court time. It was cold, and the notice was short. My subject was 2 Corinthians 6, 7. The Word of Truth. The Grand Doctrines of the Gospel, with special and general application. The Power of God in operation upon the souls of the people in numbers and degrees. Armor of righteousness, such as described in Ephesians, helmet of salvation, and so on. But more fully explanatory of the general subject in its analogy to the justifying and sanctifying operations of grace, and practical righteousness as it respects our relation to God and his church. We return to Thomas Foster's. Friday 20. At Bethel, Brown's Chapel, Daniel Hitt preached, I only exhorted. We dined at Father Davis's and lodged at his son William's. The weather is excessively cold and disagreeably windy. On Saturday I preached at Deep Creek and ordained two local preachers to the office of deacon. The day was unpleasant and the house open. We dined with Deacon Baker and then drove to George Parker's, within four miles of Salisbury, for the night. I suffered so much in the last two days that I could not keep my mind constantly engaged in prayer. This was my grief, but my patience bore me up. Sabbath 22. At Salisbury I preached upon Ephesians 4, 1. The Episcopalians have had their day. Our appointment had not been made, nevertheless we preached. Daniel hit at eleven o'clock, and at night, and I at three o'clock in the afternoon. And we had people to hear us. Virginia, Monday 23. We came to dear William Downing's, Accomac. I came in late and unwell. Tuesday 24. When I should have gone to preach, I went to bed ill with a bilious colic and fever. We came to Snow Hill on Wednesday. My chill and sickness continued, and Daniel Hitt preached. We kept on to Poplar Town and stopped at Sea Hazards, still unwell. Delaware, Thursday 26. We called to see Brother Davis. He seemed to be dying by inches in a close room. We stopped at Mr. Clayton's, Dogsbury, in Delaware. From hence we fled with speed to Lewistown, stopped and took coffee. I preached on 1 Thessalonians 2, 11, 12. 
we had a crowded house and a gracious time. Friday 27. At Milford, Bishop Watco preached his last sermon, and as I preached here upon 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8, it came as a matter of course to make some observations on his character, labors, piety, and death. Saturday 28. I preached in Dover, and the numbers present were so great that I stood up outside to speak. The wind was cold, and I uncovered. I preached the same day at Smyrna at four o'clock. I hear many things of the weal and woe of the work of God. Monday 30. I gave them a sermon in Wilmington. Tuesday 31. Yesterday's excessive cold is explaining itself in a snowstorm. Pennsylvania, Wednesday, April 1. We arrived in Philadelphia. Friday 10. Our conference commenced its session on Thursday the 2nd and finished today. We progressed and finished in great peace. The impeachment, trial, and examination of our lion took up most of a whole day. The affair was managed with prudence and impartiality, and, after a patient investigation of the case, it was determined not to give him the charge of a circuit this year. The preachers took their stations very willingly, for aught I know. The excessive labor of the last two days drove me to my bed during the recess of the sitting. Seven deacons and four elders were ordained. I may mention that a short reply was given to Dr. Koch's long letter. On the Sabbath at St. George's, I preached on Revelations 2.10. The subject of Bishop Watcote was incorporated into my discourse at the tabernacle. My text was Revelations 14.13. There was preaching in our houses, as usual, on conference occasions. New Jersey, Saturday, 11. I came into Jersey and lodged with Daniel Bates. Sabbath 12. I stood up once more at Bethel and spoke on Revelations 22, 14, 15. God hath been in this society. In the last year, forty converts were added at one quarterly meeting. The people ceased to oppose. We hope there have been three hundred souls converted in one year in this neighborhood. John Duffield is buried today. He had fallen away, but was restored at the last quarterly meeting, and intended to have rejoined the society. We hope he has joined the church triumphant. End of section 25. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 26 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Monday 13. A great storm of rain located us to the house at William Dilks's. Tuesday 14. Rode to Salem and preached. I was still very unwell. At Pitts Grove on Wednesday, I was unable to preach. I rode home with Father Early. The widow Ayers, one of the first Methodists in the place, has lately died in peace. Thursday 16. I gave an exhortation, and we then came on to Daniel Bates's. At Brother Azale Coates's on Friday, I was fit for bed only. Daniel Hitt preached at Lumberton. Saturday 18. At New Mills, I gave a kind of funeral for Bishop Watcote. From Baltimore to this place, I count having made 630 miles. Sick or well, I have my daily labors to perform. I am hindered from that solitary, close, meditative communion with God I wish to enjoy. I move under great debility. I found old Grandfather Bud worshipping, leaning upon the top of his staff, halting, yet wrestling like Jacob. Ah, we remember when Israel was a child. But now, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, camp meetings, O Israel. Since October 1771, I have visited Jersey, but never have I seen such prospects. 
To God the Lord be all the glory. Sabbath 19. In the Baptist Chapel, Mount Holly, I spoke on Romans 10.26. I preached at Burlington at 6 o'clock. Monday 20. I gave them a sermon at Trenton, and once more at Hopewell I stood up in my master's name. We had one hundred souls, but we want more fire. The time will surely come to favor them. Wednesday 22. We came to Reading. I spoke to an insensible people upon Acts 2.21. I may weary myself in vain to heap up spiritual riches, if others will not gather them and take care of them. Thursday 23. At Asbury Town, I gave them a faithful talk upon Hebrews 2, 3, 4. There are about forty houses in or near this village, of all descriptions. In Philip Cummins's kitchen, I spoke to a few souls on Friday. My hearers were serious, whilst I commented on Luke 11, 9 through 13. Rough roads, damp weather, and daily preaching has brought me low. Wherever I come, being a stranger, People expect me to speak. Oh, that I could see as great a prospect in East as in West Jersey. Come, thou south wind, and blow upon this garden. Saturday 25. We came to Andrew Freeman's. Our route brought us by the drowned lands upon Pequest Creek. This doubtless has once been a lake. I preached at Freeman's, and we had a feeling season. About twenty years ago, I once preached at Log Jail Church. I spoke once more on the Sabbath. My subject was Revelations 3.20, and I felt some enlargement. Daniel Hitt preached after me and closed the meeting. We have preached, I suppose, to three thousand people in the Jerseys. And had we had good weather, it is quite probable we should have had six thousand. New York, Monday 27. We rode 40 miles to lodge near Warwick. Tuesday 28. We came to Ellis's at Windsor. Wednesday 29. As we pursued our journey, the rain came on whilst at Major Ostrander's, and we halted. At New Paltz on Friday, we found there was no passage to be had across the river, so we drove six miles down to a new bridge, we dined and came on to Kingston, or Esopus. Here we also were disappointed, so we turned aside to Cornelius Coles at Hurley. On Friday we made forty miles over desperate roads and lodged at a tavern, seven miles short of Cayman's Patent, where the conference was to sit. Saturday, May 2. We met such of the members of the conference as were present. Sabbath 3. I preached once more on the subject of the death of our dear, departed Brother Watcoat. Saturday 9. We concluded our labors. The preachers took their stations with the simple-heartedness of little children. I find 2,001 added to the bounds of this conference. Eighteen preachers and three missionaries. We had much labor and great peace, and although... From the badness of the weather, we came home every evening through damps and mud. I had more rest than I should have had, had we convened in a city. We had preaching every noon. Sabbath 10. I preached at Albany on John 3.17. I dined with one English family and lodged with another. Monday 11. We set out on the turnpike road to Brother Carpenter's dined and lodged at Cambridge. Vermont. Tuesday 12 brought us through Salem. We dined, talked, and prayed at Rupert's. Possibly God may save the tavern keeper. We lodged at Branches. Here we also prayed, but there was a tavern bar. We left and came to Mr. Hyerton's. Here the landlady wept and talked, but my faith for the poor woman was not strong. We came to Carpenter's at Chittenden, and hearing that Z. Andrews's was a home for preachers, we turned aside to tarry for a night. 
Thursday 14. We boldly engaged the Green Mountain, of which we had heard awful accounts. I match it with rude clinch, or rough Allegheny. We found snow in the gap. A tree was lying across the path. In leading the carriage over, it upset, but sustained little damage. Having dined at Pittsfield, we took fresh courage and proceeded on. When we came to White's River, we were obliged to lead the horses as they dragged the carriage up the heights, over rocks, logs, and cavings in of the earth. Arrived at the Narrows, we found that the bank had given way and slidden down. I proposed to work the carriage along over by hand, whilst Daniel Hitt led the horses. He preferred my leading them, so on we went, but I was weak, and not enough attentive, perhaps, and the mare ran me upon a rock. Up went the wheel, hanging balanced over a precipice of fifty feet. Rocks, trees, and the river between us. I felt lame by the mare's treading on my foot. We unhitched the beast and righted the carriage, after unloading the baggage, and so got over the danger and difficulty. But never in my life have I been in such apparent danger. O Lord, Thou hast saved man and beast. We gladly stopped in Royaltown at Brother Ayres's. I have been happy under great temptations and hard labor. In every house, tavern and private, I have prayed and talked. This is part of my mission. I have two hundred miles before me for the next week, and can I accomplish this labor? What is impossible with me is possible with God. Friday 15. We came to Cox's, and next day I preached at Bernard, and had an open season. I ordained five deacons, namely Carpenter, Courier, Peck, Sterling, and Perkins. On the Sabbath day I preached in the woods. My text was 1 Timothy 2.15. It hailed, and in the afternoon snowed. We had three discourses, in and out of the house, and held a love feast. The work revives in this town. Monday 18. We came down White's River and crossed the Connecticut at Lyman's Bridge. We have made forty miles today. New Hampshire, Tuesday 19. We crossed the mountains and came into New Hampshire at Andover, and continued on, dining and praying at Salisbury, to Concord, forty miles. We lodged at Mr. Ambrose's tavern. Our host was polite and attentive. We came on Wednesday 18 miles to dinner at Mr. Harvey's, Northwood, then through Durham and Dover into Berwick, the first town in the district, where we put up for the night. On Thursday morning we came 16 miles to breakfast, but I had taken medicine. We kept on through Kennebunk, Seco, and Scarborough into Portland. I was unwell, had traveled hard, rising at 4 o'clock every morning, yet I had to preach here at 8 o'clock in the evening. God is here. Brother Bachelor's labors have been blessed. I lodged with Major Ilsley, still our great friend. Friday 22. We took up our journey through Falmouth to New Yarmouth, and stopped at our brother Jabez Bradberg's. We had six hours' rain. It is an awful backward spring, and there is a great scarcity of hay. The wet weather prevents plowing and seeding. Cold, cold. Saturday 23. We lodged with Mr. Dearborn in Monmouth. We count having made 230 miles this week, over hard roads in many senses. My work is for God, my reward from Him. May I be made perfect through Christian and ministerial trials and sufferings. Sunday 24. I preached in Monmouth on Isaiah 35, 3-6. through six. At Major Cobb's, where I lodged in Gray, I left my glasses when starting on Tuesday morning. On Tuesday I preached at Scarborough at 5 o'clock in the evening, upon Hebrews 3, 12-14. We sent forward the preachers to call a meeting in the town of Berwick, in the district of Maine. On Wednesday I preached to them, and the people were attentive. This is the beginning of Methodism in this place. 
Thursday 28. We dined at Epping, New Hampshire, and came on within six miles of Haverhill. To travel forty miles a day, and be under the necessity of going into dram and sin-infected taverns. It is such a journey that teaches us the value of hospitality in the South, and the excellency of Methodism everywhere. How laborious has it been, and expensive, and it may be unsuccessful. But my work and my judgment is with the Lord. Saturday 30. At Waltham I gave them a sermon on 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 13. Several preachers were present. It rained on the Sabbath. My Bible and plans for conference stations occupied my mind and became the devotions of the day. Massachusetts, Monday, June 1. Came to Boston. On Tuesday we opened our conference, 92 preachers being on the list. Saturday 6. Our conference rose. There were $800 paid, and we were nearly 3,000 insolvent. It kept us busy to preach five times a day, ordain 59 to office, and inquire and examine into characters, graces, and gifts, and appoint the numerous stations. I preached on Wednesday and an ordination sermon on Thursday, and on Saturday evening came away to the pleasant town of Lynn. And must I walk through the seven conferences? and travel 6,000 miles in 10 months? Sunday 7. I preached in Lynn, administered the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and came to Walton. At Westbury I preached on Monday, on Luke 19.10. I lodged at Brother Nicholas's. In spite of heat and lameness, we were favored to reach Wilbraham on Tuesday. To Westfield on Wednesday, crossing the new bridge at Springfield. I am in peace. I dare not murmur, though in pain. I had an interview with a Baptist minister. He started at prayer. He called it talk to any sinner. The answer is, they cannot pray. Connecticut, Thursday, 11. We crossed the mountain to Pittsfield, 37 miles. We had a violent wind, excessive cold, and I was very lame. Methodism prevails in this quarter. In two societies, 200 members have been added. A camp meeting is appointed to be held on Monday next. On Saturday, we made a great ride of 40 miles to Watertown, in New York State. I was very lame on the Sabbath day, but I must needs preach. My subject was John 3, 19. New York, Monday 15 faint, sick, and lame. I made twenty miles to Schenectady, and was entertained at Isaac Johnson's. He is a disciple of W. Hickson's, gained by preaching in the streets of Brooklyn, Long Island. I rejoice to hear that Robert Dillon preached in the market house at Troy. On Tuesday it rained, and I rested. Wednesday brought us over Yankee Hill to Frank's. We came to Elwood's on Thursday, crossing Skohari Creek. O oh, fruitful banks of lovely Mohawk! On Friday we rode ten miles out of our way and made a long journey of forty-five miles. We came in at nine o'clock at night to Elijah Davis's. We have traveled one hundred miles up the Mohawk. My feet are much swelled, and I am on crutches. But I have been supported amongst strangers." Oh, that we had two low Dutch missionaries for the parts of Jersey and York west of the Hudson. Sunday 21 After E. White had preached in the meeting house, I went into a beautiful grove, where I spoke to about 1,500 people, on Colossians 1, 28-29. I ordained three deacons, namely Stebbins, Parker, and Truman, and rode to Westmoreland. I retired to B. Hannah's, my feet highly inflamed and painful. Monday 22. At B. Holmes's in Vernon, I preached on Romans 10, 13. Next day I rode to Silas Bliss's in Casanova. On Wednesday, on 1 John 5, 14, 15. The Lord is with the people. Ten years have I been absent from this kind family. 
and oh the kindness of all the brethren i cannot express it nor my gratitude for the favors shown i came home to ebenezer white's i spoke at brother nichols's in manlius on thursday my text was chosen from john twenty one fifteen through seventeen it was an open time i ordained e white an elder friday twenty six we came fourteen miles to onondaga courthouse truly we saw gapers enough my text was john thirteen seventeen after taking a cup of tea we rode to skenitalis lake about sixteen miles in length and three in breadth at its widest part six more miles brought us to awaski lake about the same size the outlet of aurelius river is here we have had a day's work of forty miles i am still lame on both feet our lodging at brutus was with b upshare i preached on saturday in the widow carpenter's barn in the afternoon i rode fifteen miles to david eddy's in scipio here we were quite at home sunday twenty eight i held forth to about five hundred souls in eddy's barn my subject was hebrews two fifteen sixteen the people were very attentive but not much affected bathing my feet may have done good they began to mend on monday we rode to milton methodist meeting house where i preached to about two hundred souls on galatians five seven eight i was faint yet animated in speaking we dined with david hamilton and came back to cayuga lake this sheet of water is about forty miles long and four miles wide it feeds the st lawrence at samuel wayburn's i preached on tuesday and on wednesday we came by milton to bailey's where we also had meeting my subject here was first peter four seventeen it was a most insensible congregation of about one hundred souls daily preaching and daily affliction keep me very low i feel with sorrow the spiritual death of the people it brings on great heaviness of body and mind thursday july two we dined at geneva on seneca lake the lake is about forty miles in length and from one to five miles wide our entertainer mr hagley was exceedingly kind we rode on to daniel dorsey's late of liberty frederick county maryland now an inhabitant of lionstown this is a great land for wheat rye and grass and the lakes with their navigation of vessels and boats and moving scenes make the prospect beautiful saturday four we were greatly crowded in a small house in lionstown my subject was matthew seventeen five after meeting and dinner we rode on to the sulphur springs near canandaigua and lodged at the widow ferguson's sunday five i preached to about one thousand souls assembled in white's barn my subject was second timothy four two preach the word one the primitive qualification the call and commission to preach the word the gospel two the right use of the gospel to convince to reclaim the backslidden and disorderly three exhort all characters with long suffering and doctrine hear ye him observe the dignity eloquence and power of the speaker doctrine hear him on this point hear him all men of all grades and characters my congregation was an unfeeling one now that my mind is in a great measure lightened of its load of thought and labor for the conferences i feel uncommon light and energy in preaching i am not prolix neither am i tame i am rapid and nothing freezes from my lips i suppose we shall preach to more than ten thousand souls in this district monday six in our rote's barn fifteen miles from canandaigua i preached to about four hundred unyielding souls on acts three twenty two twenty three tuesday seven we passed the lake sixteen miles long and one mile wide at james stokes's ninth town i preached in the woods to a more attentive people 
on Hebrews 10, 38-39. Wednesday 8. I preached in the Friends Settlement with some power. Thursday 9. At Cresses. We set out, dining at Dow's, and came to Katrine, at the head of Seneca Lake, thirty miles. The swamps, sloughs, ruts, and stumps made it awful moving. We lodged at Baldwin's Tavern. Friday 10. We directed our route through Newtown, upon the east branch of the Susquehanna, to Shomang. Rested a while at Jacob Cress's, and then passed the narrows of the river, continuing on by Shepherd's Mill to Taylor's Tavern. It was ten o'clock, and I was fearful of driving farther in the dark. Saturday, 11. Brought us to the camp meeting on Squire Light's ground. We found it had been in operation two days. God is in the camp, and with us. I preached on the campground from Matthew 18, 2. Some sots were a little disorderly, but the greater part of the congregation were very attentive. Weak as I was, I did not spare myself, my subject, or my hearers. It may be I spoke to one thousand people. Since the last Sabbath we have traveled one hundred and twenty miles, and with good roads and even ground we might have made three hundred miles in the same time. The heights of the Susquehanna are stupendous, the bottom lands very fertile, but this river runs through a country of unpleasing aspect, morally and physically. Rude, irregular, uncultivated is the ground. Wild, ignorant, and wicked are the people. They have not been wearied by my labors, except the neighborhood of Lancaster, and by what I may once have done in a visit to Wyoming. They are strangers to them. I am now on my first journey of toil and suffering through Genesee and Tioga. Sunday 12. My subject was 2 Corinthians 5.20. My congregation may have doubled in numbers today, and there were no troublesome drunkards. I feel as if God would own this meeting now, and continue to own it many days, in various families and places. I ordained five worthy men local preachers, namely Daniel Wilcox, John B. Hudson, Samuel Emmett, John M. Cain, and Nathaniel Lewis, to the office of deacon. Had I not made this visit, these men might have waited a long time, or taken a long ride to find me. In the afternoon, Sabbath, there was an uproar amongst the people. Some intoxicated young men seated themselves by the women, and refused to move until compelled. They fought those men who came to take them away, and when the presiding elder interfered, they struck at him, and one of the guards also, who was helping by order of the constables. There were magistrates, such as they were, to cry peace. The Owego gentry fled away, cackling falsehood like wild geese. One Kemp, chief bully, arrested A. Owen on Monday morning for the Sabbath-breaking, drunkenness, and fighting of this Kemp and his crew. The presiding elder was charged with having struck Kemp and then running away. Nor was the poor bishop spared. He, too, had been fighting. It was well for him that he was not on the ground at the time. I was quiet in my room. Monday 13. We rode to Tioga, and Brother Shippey gave us our dinner. A ride of sixteen miles brought us to Meniers, where we lodged. Tioga Point, at the junction of Shumang and the river, is a pleasant spot. Tuesday 14. We came six miles to Judge Gore's. Here I preached upon John 7:17. 7, when we set out on Wednesday, we found we were obliged to take the carriage over a precipice by hand. The road to the ferry was rough, and behold, the boat was gone and the bank caved and washed away. A lock upon the wheel, and the assistance of a strap, enabled us to pass the sulky down by hand. Major Gaylor at Walusing lodged us well and freely. Thursday 16. We came eleven miles to breakfast at Sturtevant's, and eleven miles more brought us to Hunt's Ferry. After dining at Frosberry's, free and kind, we went on to Newton Smith's, ten miles farther. 
I ordained my host a deacon in his own house. Friday, 17. Two Suttons, ten miles. The house neat as a palace, and we were entertained like kings, by a king and queen. It was no small consolation to lie down on a clean floor after all we had suffered from dirt and all its consequences. Once more I am at Wyoming. We have wearied through and clambered over one hundred miles of the rough roads of wild Susquehanna. Oh, the precipitous banks, wedging narrows, rocks, sidling hills, obstructed paths, and fords scarcely fordable, roots, stumps, and gullies. End of section 26. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 27 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Pennsylvania, Saturday, 18. I must take medicine. The preachers wish me to remain in my lodging. Sunday, 19. I went to the woods and preached and ordained Thomas and Christian Bowman deacons. Before I got through my discourse, the rain came on, and I made a brief finish. The people were attentive. In the afternoon, the preachers and many of the people went to a barn. There were showers of rain and thunder, whilst service was performing. My first visit to Wyoming was in great toil, and to little purpose. I am afraid I shall have no better success now. Monday 20. We set out upon a turnpike road. But, oh, dreadful! I came sliding down a dug road precipice, dark and deep, but safe. About nine o'clock we made Mr. Mowin's tavern, and here were drink and smoke and wagoners, but we closed with prayer. We came along early on Tuesday, through the wind gap, seventeen miles to Hollers, and breakfasted. I took a look at the Moravian town of Nazareth. It may contain forty houses built in the German taste and style. The Brethren's house is a large building of possibly one hundred and forty feet in length and fifty feet in width, with a Dutchified tower like a cupola in the center. The whole edifice has the exterior appearance of a college. The land in the vicinity was not so fertile, nor the grounds as highly improved as I expected to have found them. Seventeen miles farther brought us to far-famed Bethlehem, which I had long wished to see. The stream that runs west of the town is pretty and useful, as it works a machine which raises the water 150 feet into two reservoirs for the use of the inhabitants. We found ourselves at the Grand Tavern at the north end, the property of the Brethren. The house is large, but a plain building. The entertainment good at a dollar a night for man and horse. On the second step of the high grounds on the main street, which begins on the hill above, stand the church buildings. On the east and west are rooms appropriate to the institution, and certainly the west end has a grand appearance. On the same street below stands the Brethren's house, one hundred feet front, five stories high, very plain, and much German taste discoverable everywhere. Add to this the majestic Lehigh, and you have the most striking features of this celebrated place. But ah, religion! Reader, I am a Methodist. I asked the young man who managed the tavern if they ever permitted any minister to preach amongst the brethren. He could not answer. He was a servant, and knew not how to answer. Next day came the master of the ceremonies, the Cicerone of the establishment, who shows the wonders of the place. I asked him. I was told that on that night there was private worship in the church. The minister must perform himself. Daniel Hitt and two gentlemen from York, who had given money for the sights shown here for money, went to the church meeting. And what did they see and hear? A man read in German they knew not what, sung and played upon the four thousand dollar organ. Sermon or prayer they heard not. I doubt much if there is any prayer here, public or private, except the stated prayers of the minister on the Sabbath day. 
but the brethren have a school for boys at Nazareth, and one for girls at Bethlehem, and they have a store and a tavern. The society have worldly wealth and worldly wisdom. It is no wonder that men of the world, who would not have their children spoiled by religion, send them to so decent a place. Wednesday, 22. We crossed the Lehigh to Allentown, beautifully situated, superior in this respect, perhaps, to Bethlehem. We breakfasted at the end of twelve miles and came on to Cutstown. On Thursday morning we bent our course through Reading. The views of meadows and fields were grand, beautiful. Reading may have two hundred houses, one street in a style of grandeur approaching to that of Philadelphia, as it respects the houses. The rest have much of the German feature. Through Adamstown, where we breakfasted, we came on over rocks and hills to New Holland. Here, as at Reading, there are fine new churches for the German Lutherans and the German Calvinists. These are the citadels of formality, fortifications erected against the apostolic itinerancy of a more evangelical ministry. Ah, Philadelphia, and ye her dependencies, the villages of the state of Pennsylvania, when will prejudice, formality, and bigotry Cease to deform your religious profession, and the ostentatious display of the lesser morals give place to evangelical piety. At Soudersburg we rested one day. I wrote three letters. Saturday, 25. We came through Lancaster to Columbia. On the Sabbath day I preached in a lot near the river. We may have had seven hundred people. My subject was Second Corinthians 5.14. The missionaries, Boehm and Hunter, were present. On Monday I came to Little York. Here I met with Nelson Reed. This week I am occupied in writing about thirty letters, yet not unmindful of the word of God and prayer. It is but too manifest that the success of our labors, more especially at camp meetings, has roused a spirit of persecution against us. Riots, fines, stripes, perhaps prisons and death, if we do not give up our camp meetings. We shall never abandon them, but shall subdue our enemies by overcoming evil with good. What hath God wrought in America? In thirty-six years we find 144,590 in number. In England, after seventy-seven years, they count 150,974. They may have thirty millions of souls in the three kingdoms to labor amongst, and we not more, perhaps, than five millions. Our traveling preachers, five hundred and thirty-six at present. The rest, local and official, about fourteen hundred. But all these are poor men and unlearned, without books, money, or influence. Not unto us, not unto us. O Lord, take thou the glory. Sunday, August 1. Constant application whilst here. Reading the Bible and writing about sixty pages of letters found me employment. On the Sabbath I preached at eleven o'clock at our chapel in York. I spoke on Colossians 1, 27-28, short and temperate. We might have about six hundred hearers. In the afternoon I spoke on Colossians 3, 12, 13. I spoke longer than in the morning. We have the form of the power of godliness, for we shout, and we stamp, and jump, and are very happy. Who but we? But we are contentious, and mingle and mix, by offhand marriages, believers with unbelievers, and other things we do. But for once I have delivered my own soul. I think it begins to be time for another visitation at York. I have my paradise at Brother Pence's but I have much labor, and some temptations. I now fare sumptuously every day, but, oh, what is before me? Three thousand five hundred miles before I reach the Georgetown Conference. Tuesday 4 I took my leave of my kind friends at Weirly Pence's, and wrote to dinner to George Naylor's. That night we passed under the roof of the widow Hollopeter. 
On Wednesday I preached at Stickles' schoolhouse. The room was full, and I spoke for an hour on First Peter 4, 10, 11. We came that evening to Lewisburg. Oh, my God, help me in soul and body, through my approaching labors and sufferings. Thursday brought us through an obscure town to Brother Weaver's. Our host and his wife are Germans, in their first love. Friday 7. At Carlisle. Saturday occupied in reading Birder's Village Sermons, etc. Sabbath 9. I preached upon Galatians 5, 7 through 9. In the afternoon on 2 Corinthians 4, 1, 2. My body faint, my spirit fervent. On Monday at Shippensburg, I preached upon 2 Peter 3, 17, 18, and ordained John Davis a deacon. It was very warm, but we had an open season. We lodged with Brother Scott, one of my hearers thirty years ago in Chester County, now warm in the cause of God. After a heavy rain had passed away on Monday, on Tuesday we began our mountain toil. We crossed three, dined with the junior, and lodged with the senior at Ramsey. No people need be kinder than were these. Wednesday 12. We set out again, and the rain attended us into Bedford. We lodged at the stage house. Mr. Graham, my host, had known me in my early visits. I had preached at his father's. The son was kind as a king could be, and charged us not a cent for our entertainment. In a hundred public houses, possibly, that I have thus stopped at in the year, I have received no such favors. We reached Berlin on Thursday and found Friend Johnson and his wife kind indeed. Friday 14. We dined and prayed at the Twenty Mile House, and were obliged to stop at an ordinary twelve miles farther. Drunken people. But they behaved as well as they could. Any port in a storm. On Saturday we came on eight miles to breakfast at Anthony Banning's. From thence we rode through Connellsville to Union. We put up with the widow Kenthorn, intending to be at the camp meeting. And now I have ridden, since I left Baltimore in March, 2,500 miles, and have had, as usual, many a jolt over rocks, and rocks again, on the American Alps, and dangers and difficulties and a head bruised by the iron rods of my carriage. I have been enabled to suffer patiently pains and sickness for the good of souls. Sabbath 16 I ordained on the campground Dobbins, Fell, and Wakefield to the office of deacons. I preached on 2 Corinthians 5.11, knowing the terror of the Lord. I made two general heads. One, the gospel is a general, gracious, persuasive, characteristic ministry, in which the ministers thereof are manifest to God, and to the consciences of their hearers in their characters, their sins, their sayings, ways, etc. 2. The gospel was armed with terror to the disobedient, impenitent, and to apostates from it. Knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing how God is to be feared, when insulted by disobedience, the Trinity is roused into indignation. Every attribute, and all the perfection of deity, is arranged on the side of vengeance and vindictive wrath. There was not a sufficiency of seats for the congregation, but they behaved as well as could be expected. There was nothing vicious seen. No plan of opposition was discoverable. On Monday I went to camp again and spoke upon Matthew 5, 46, 47. What the followers of Christ professed more than others, and what God had done for them more than others, as Christians and ministers, that therefore God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, requires more from them than from others. By application, to a variety of cases, what do ye more than others? Tuesday 18. We found our horses had been taken or had strayed away. I read Hervey on the tombs, and wrote the station book. Wednesday 19. We set out and came to the old fort, crossed the Monongalia, and lodged with Dr. Wheeler. 
he and his lady are Londoners, and oh, how kind they were. How did the salvation of the souls of these kind friends rest upon me? The doctor's mother had been in band society with Mr. Wesley. From six in the morning to seven in the evening of Thursday, we made about forty miles, over some rough roads and desperate hills. We wished to redeem time that we might refit at John Beck's, near West Liberty. So we ate not on the route, though we fed the horses twice. I had had pain of a rheumatic kind for some days. Virginia, Friday 21. Marked letters to transcribe, read, took medicine, and nursed myself. On Saturday I preached in Beck's new house, on Philippians 2, 12, 13. On the Sabbath I preached in an excellent stone meeting house, at Short Creek, to about one thousand souls, from Second Corinthians 3, 7, 8. We crossed over into the state of Ohio on Monday, and I gave them a sermon in the courthouse at St. Clairsville. Ohio By hard labor we reached Frankfort on Tuesday. Thence we made Spears's on Wednesday. On Thursday came to Denzenberry's on Friday to Teal's. In four days and a half we have traveled one hundred and thirty miles. Mud, gullies, stumps, and hills. I was sick with an inflammatory sore throat. My trials were great. Nature failed, but grace supported. Every family shall know me by prayer. Saturday I devoted to rest. I have hastily marked above two hundred hymns, taken from the Congregational Hymn Book to add to a new American edition, which I hope will be as good as any extant. Sabbath 30 At the stand on the campground near Hockhocking, I spoke on Hebrews 4, 1. Let us therefore fear. There were about 800 hearers, and it was a time of feeling and solemnity to professors. Monday was diligently taken up with my pen, and prayer with my friends. The hymns for a new collection occupied my mind much. My poor mare is worn down, and my carriage is wrecked somewhat, and must be repaired. On Thursday we came to New Lancaster. I preached in a schoolhouse on Luke 19.10. We afterward came on to Mr. Van Meter's, and just escaped an awful storm of thunder, hail, and rain. Friday, September 4. We came away to Chillicothe. Oh, the mud and the trees in the path. Reading closely on Saturday. In our neat new house I preached on the Sabbath morning to about five hundred hearers, on 1 Peter 4, 17, 18. I spoke about an hour. There are some pleasing and some unpleasing accounts here. Some little trouble in the society, but great prospects all around in the country. The sitting of conference will be of God for good to souls. We have been praying the whole year for this. By letters from Brothers Meade and Bruce, I learned that prospects brighten in old Virginia. They have had blessed camp meetings. Monday and Tuesday, closely reading. On Wednesday we rode to Deer Creek. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, selecting hymns and reading Marshall's Life of Washington nearly 3,000 pages in four volumes. Only as a life of Washington can I give it the preference to Gordon's history of the Revolutionary War. Sabbath 13. At the Deer Creek Campground, I gave them a discourse on 2 Corinthians 6, 1. In the evening, we returned to Chillicothe. On Monday, we opened our conference in great peace and love, and continued sitting, day by day, until Friday noon. A delegation of seven members was chosen to the general conference. There were thirteen preachers added, and we found an addition of two thousand two hundred members to the society in these bounds. Seven deacons were elected and ordained, and ten elders. Two preachers only located. Sixty-six preachers were stationed. Finding my work done, and my carriage sold, I ventured once more to take horse, with a determination to visit the frontier settlements on the great Miami River. We came away, leaving fifty or sixty preachers at the camp meeting near the seat of conference, 
and got to Brother Waz for the night. Saturday we reached Hankstone's to dine, and thence, by riding late, got into Caesarsville, and stopped with Peter Pelham. We have made sixty-five miles from Chillicothe. A great rumor is abroad of an expected Indian war, and many fled for fear. But the report was idle wind. The whole matter was that about a thousand Indians had assembled upon the frontiers for social, and it may be, religious and moral purposes. General Worthington and Colonel M. Carthy magnanimously offered to take a talk and a belt of wampum from the governor to the congregated savages. The ambassadors found peace, and brought in four chiefs as hostages, with assurances that no ill was designed to the whites. It is said there is a prophet risen up among the Indians. At Frederick Bonner's I preached upon Hebrews 4, 1, 2. It was an open season. Monday 21. I rested at John Sales. Busy writing. On Tuesday we started away and came to Samuel Hitz. Dined, prayed, talked, and came away to Lebanon. We found the court in session. We lodged at Jeremiah Lawson's. There is now a great talk about the Shakers. They are said to consist of two hundred people. Three Presbyterian ministers have joined them. A heavy declension. Wednesday 23. We bent our course down Little Miami. There are many fine situations for mills on this stream, and the land appears to be, generally, very fertile. We found a lodging with Andrew M. Grew, lately from Baltimore County, Maryland. I preached on Thursday at Philip Gatch's, on Hebrews 4.2. On Friday we stopped in Cincinnati, and dined with Mr. Ferris. Solomon and Oliver Langdon had come on, and were of the company. Saturday 26. Rested, read, and wrote. I am young again and boast of being able to ride six thousand miles on horseback in ten months. My round will embrace the United States, the Territory, and Canada. But, oh, childhood, youth, and old age, ye are all vanity. My companions and myself are busy compiling the new hymn book. Our brethren here have built a proper little stone house for worship, forty feet by thirty. Sabbath 27 I preached at eleven o'clock. Many could not get seats. I met the society. I also ordained W. M. Neakin and William Whitaker to the office of deacon. Notwithstanding opposition from more than one quarter, our last camp meeting was successful. The fruit is immediate, and where it is not, it will yet be seen. We live by faith in a prayer hearing, soul converting, soul sanctifying, soul restoring, Soul Comforting God Kentucky, Monday 28 Our morning's ride brought us, hungry and weary, into Kentucky. After refreshing at the Widow Stevens's, we pushed on to Grant's Lick and lodged at John Daniel's. In the morning we came away across the forks and over the hills of Licking, twenty-eight miles, to Sister Ritchie's, a widow indeed. Our evening's ride was dark and rough, along an unknown path to Cynthiana. We stopped at J. Jakes's. I judge we have made fifty miles today. Whilst resting on Thursday and Wednesday, I read Atmore's memoirs, of about five hundred pages, and I wrote a memoir of George Doherty. All my occupations, however toilsome, are pleasant when I enjoy God in pure and perfect love. Friday, October 2. Attended the camp meeting at Mount Garrison. On Saturday I spoke on 2 Timothy 2, 19. On Sunday my text was Isaiah 45, 23. Possibly we had 2,000 souls to hear us. There were 15 tents and 20 wagons. We had a Sabbath love feast and sacrament, and doubtless there were precious souls converted. Report says about 30, and sanctified. I conversed with Valentine Cook on the subject of a mission. He held back. Ah, how hardly shall they who have families growing up 
enter into and keep in the traveling connection. I came from the campground every night to Samuel Broadwell's. My host has put my name upon one of his sons. Lord, put thy new name upon the lad, that he may bear it for generations to come, and to be born. Monday 5. We set out, and stopped at Martin Hitz, took dinner, and continued on a dark ride through the woods, to William Burke's, thirty miles. On Tuesday we held a hasty meeting at Irvin's, Madison County. Wednesday we reached Williams's, Thursday Freeman's, Friday Dorton's, and on Saturday came to Peter Huffaker's, Powell's Valley. Sabbath 11. I preached on Luke 4, 18. Oh, when shall this wilderness rejoice? I have perfect peace, but great toil. Since the conference we have traveled 360 miles. There is a serious want of water, generally, in the western lands. Monday 12. We had a heavy ride to Holston, 40 miles. We stopped with Martin Stubblefield. Tennessee. On Tuesday we rested, and it may be allowed, considering our six days' ride through heat, great heat and drought. At night I preached from 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. And weary and faint as I was, I felt strongly disposed to sing and shout away, as loud as the youngest. I have been, and am, happy in God. Friday 16. We reached at Wampings. I suffered much today, but an hour's warm bath for my feet relieved me considerably. On Saturday we rode to Killens. North Carolina, Sabbath 18. At Buncombe Courthouse I spoke from Second Kings 7, 13-15. The people were all attention. I spent a night under the roof of my very dear brother in Christ, George Newton, a Presbyterian minister, an Israelite indeed. On Monday we made Fletcher's. Next day dined at Terry's, and lodged at Edwards's. Saluda Ferry brought us up on Wednesday evening. Sabbath 25. For three days past I have been busy in seeking appropriate portions of Scripture for the new hymns designed to enlarge our common hymn book. Our journey hither from Chillicothe has brought us through five states. Report says there is an awful affliction in Charleston, the mortal fever. I preached today at Salem on Second Chronicles 6, 29-31. We had a serious time. My mind is kept in great peace. Surely God is love. At Elijah Moore's on Monday, I preached on Luke 11, 9, 10. My labor, I think, is not entirely in vain. On Tuesday at Jeremiah Robinson's, we had but twelve souls to hear us. The people are too busy with their fine crops of corn. My body fails, but I have great peace of mind. Georgia on Wednesday, Daniel Hitt preached at John Oliver's. Our host has a son-in-law converted at camp meeting. Our preachers have passed by this town, but the Lord will not pass by Petersburg, but will visit precious souls here. Thursday to Tate's. Here I spoke to a few persons on Revelations 3, 4, 5, and God was with us of a truth. On Friday I preached at James Halston's, on 1 John 1, 6, 7. It was not in vain. Both colors filled the house. On Saturday we rode to Coldwater. End of section 27. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 28 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan Sabbath Day, November 1 I preached on 1 John 2, 17. I had help. It is wonderful to see how flush the streams are, and excellent the crops, considering the want of rain for three months past. In the sandy lands the waters do not fail in a drought as they do elsewhere. My soul is happy in God continually. 
it has been reported to me that at the two camp meetings held, the one in Elbert County, the other in Franklin County, about one hundred souls professed converting grace. Monday 2. We came to James Marx's. Tuesday 3. Both Daniel Hitt and myself preached. Wednesday 4. We were diligently occupied with our projected hymn book. I make it a rule where I stop to pray after every meal. Thursday 5. I felt the tears and sorrows of the family when parting. We crossed Webb's Ferry into Oglethorpe County, passing through Lexington to James Freeman's, a ride of thirty miles through wind and rain. James Halston told me that his cousin, Colonel Halston, had unfortunately beaten and killed a pious soldier during the War of the Revolution. The colonel settled in Georgia, and whilst everything seemed to prosper around him, he was one night shot in his bed by one of his slaves. The child which lay in his arms was unhurt. Friday 6. We were engaged with our collection of hymns. I preached at Henry Pope's at night. It was a time of power and liberty. Saturday 7. We came to General John Stewart's. Sabbath 8. Daniel Hitt and myself both preached. We felt the state of the people. Oh, what necessity is there to urge the doctrine of sanctification in this state? It is a doctrine almost forgotten here. Monday 9. I preached at John Crutchfield's on 1 Peter 1, 4. Oh, the precious promises! We did not speak without a present God. Next day Daniel Hitt preached at B. Bush's Liberty. There has been a good and gracious work in this society. Thursday 12. I was taken ill with an influenza. Monday 23. I have been one week sick at Sparta. This evening I arrived, a sick, weak old man, at Mr. Bush's. I took another emetic. Wednesday 25. We rode to W. Bomer's. I found it good to stay here and take some more medicine. My complaint is a pleurisy and deep affection of the breast. Monday 30. It was as much as I could this day do to reach Tyndall's. Tuesday, December 1. We came into Augusta. Wednesday 2. I rode up to Martin Hitz on Stevens Creek. South Carolina, Thursday 3. We reached Spans. I judge we have traveled 900 miles since the Western Conference. Judge William Stith died at Milledgeville suddenly, and I believe safely called home in peace. The mortality has been very general and very great in these parts. We had a blessed rain in Georgia. The weather and indisposition hold me at spans. My soul is happy in God, in sickness, and in health. Sabbath 6. I preached. Monday 7. We started away to Fridges, 36 miles. As it was a day of general parade on Tuesday at Columbia, I returned to General Hutchinson's. Next day we reached Camden. Thursday I preached in Camden. I spent Friday at Rembert Hall, reading and writing. Sabbath 13. I preached at Rembert's chapel. Mr. Rembert was thrown out of his sulky, but there was no mischief done, except that some old bruises were wakened up. My subject today was Matthew 24, 45. The good servant, in spiritual wisdom, in fidelity, his diligence to perform his duties. The wicked servant, backslidden, false, and falsely secure. His Lord delayeth his coming. Therefore he maltreats his fellow servants who are better than himself. He is sensual. His portion is hell. Sabbath 20. At Rembert's Chapel, I spoke on Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that God would visit these people! 
Last week I have occasionally ridden out for exercise, but I am pretty busy with writing, family duty, and reading. My mind is wholly devoted to God and His work. Monday 21. It rained. On Tuesday we went to Bradford's. Wednesday evening we lodged at Simpson's Tavern. On Thursday at Monk's Corner. Friday, Christmas Day, brought us to Charleston. Saturday was devoted to reading and receiving visits. Sabbath 27. I preached at the Old Church on Matthew 7.21, at Bethel on Deuteronomy 10.12. Friday, January 1, 1808. Our conference began. We sat six hours a day, had great harmony, and little or no trouble in stationing the preachers preaching every noon to the conference and others. In my sermon on Sabbath day, at the Old Church, I took some notice of the life and labors of Bennett Kendrick and George Doherty. The increase of members in the bounds of this and the Western Conference for this year is 3,700 members, preachers 23. Wednesday 6. We rode back to Rembert Hall, busy writing letters. In the midst of restless days and nights of pain, my mind enjoys great peace. On Saturday, I rode to Camden. Sabbath 10. I preached from 1 Corinthians 1, 30. I had some openings of mind, but there was little unction in preaching or sacrament. Busy writing letters. On Monday, after the rain, we went up to John Horton's at the Hanging Rock. We reached Presley's by chance on Tuesday. North Carolina, Wednesday 13. We reached Mecklenburg and stayed with our friend Mechem Wilson, a Presbyterian minister, where we were comfortably and kindly accommodated. On Thursday, we found the main branch of Rocky River unfordable. We stopped at Squire M. Curtis. Friday brought us through Concord to Savages. Yesterday was very damp and cold. Today there is ice, probably an inch thick. On Saturday we set out over the frozen roads, and stopped at the end of ten miles to breakfast with the Rev. John Brown, a Presbyterian minister in Salisbury. Thence we came away to John Hitz. I have preached to his father and mother, who have now fallen asleep. The grandson Jacob, son of John, feeleth as if he had a call to preach. In this journey, on the one side I may put down cold, hunger, rain, floods, frost, bad roads, and a lame horse. On the other, prayer, patience, peace, love. The balance is greatly in my favor. Sabbath 17. At Hits I gave them a sermon from Hebrews 4, 9. Next day we pushed away thirty miles to Charles Clayton's. My spirit is greatly grieved with the ungodly children of this family, particularly one who has fallen from grace. On Tuesday I preached at Joshua Clayton's on Hebrews 3, 7, 8. Joshua Clayton has no children to grieve me. The loving old souls in this house are early Methodists from Maryland. I ordained E. Breyer and Robert Field. We went over to Father Dole's on Wednesday. My ride over hard roads on my poor, lame mare was a trial to me. We crossed the Yadkin at Clements Bridge, well-constructed and well-secured. In three hours' notice at Dobbs, we had a large congregation, to whom I spoke a few words on Romans 12, too. We came through Haverstown, having my lame mare shod, to Germantown. Both these villages are small. The first may have thirty families in it, the other about half the number. We lodged at Mr. Ennelly's, where we have a small society. The grandfather left us, but the grandson is a preacher in the connection. On Friday we rode through the rain ten miles to breakfast at Brooks's. Amidst all my little difficulties, my soul is very happy in the Lord. The prospects in the Highland circuits are very good. 
On Saturday we were water-bound by the Mayo branches. We called a congregation at night. We set out on Sabbath morning, and had a most severe ride, crossing the first, second, and third branches of the Mayo River. At Brother Travis's, in Henry County, we had a congregation at a short warning. I ordained Thomas Piner a deacon. We crossed Smith's River on Monday morning, at Reed's Ford, bending our course down upon Snow Creek. We stopped with one Herman Cook, a rich man and a kind man. Virginia. Tuesday, 26, brought us over Pig River and forward to Anthony's Ford. Fearful to the sight. We stopped at Staunton. I endure considerable pain. My beast starts and stumbles. The perpetual changes of weather, and the company sometimes forced upon one on the road, is disagreeable. But it is much worse in the cabins, crowded with men, women, and children. No place to retire for reading, writing, or meditation. The woods are too cold for solitude at this season. We are weather-bound. I employ my time in reading, writing, praying, and planning. I ordained two deacons. On Thursday we set out for Murphy's on Goose Creek. We visited brothers Leftrich and Wheat, and then made a toilsome march over Little and Big Otter, about thirty miles, to Price's. We arrived late, and it was cold. On Saturday we reached Lynchburg. Sunday 31. I preached at Lynchburg to about six hundred hearers. I feel paid for all my toil. On Tuesday our conference opened. We progressed with great speed, and in good order, preaching each day. I ordained nine elders, nine deacons of the traveling order, and as many local deacons. Sunday, February 7. I preached on 2 Corinthians 13, 5. I was blessed in my soul. The rainy weather and miry roads kept our congregations small and manageable, except on the Sabbath day. The people of the town honored us. They were attentive to hear, and were very kind. My company came away on Tuesday to Colonel Meredith's, New Glasgow. Wednesday to Keyes. Thursday we dined at the Widow Keyes, and lodged at B. Gillum's. I ordained Nathan Anderson a deacon. On Friday we rode twenty-four miles through mire and a heavy cold rain, crossing the rapid Dan to John Stocksdale's. Our host made us comfortable after our toil. By deep wading and plunging through mud, we reached Lot Fry's. I ordained him a deacon. It was the day appointed for preaching. I spoke and had five preachers and two others to hear me. What will become of the children of this household? I cannot predict much good for either their souls or bodies. I could not willingly rest here on the Sabbath, so I came away to John Kobler's and arrived just as sermon had ended. I ordained D. M. Masters a deacon. Monday brought us to Bishaw's. Next day we got in to Father Hitz. Oh, the rocks, rivers, mud, frost, hills, cold, and hunger. Possibly we have ridden seven hundred miles from Charleston in twenty-two days. Tuesday 23. For some days we have rested under the roof of Herman Hitt. He is now eighty-six. He has lived to see four generations. He is the head of eighteen families. Three of his sons are preachers, Martin, Daniel, and Samuel, and his grandson William also. I am occupied in reading and writing. I preached at the new house in Rectortown. The wind blew and it was cold, but we had an open season. I preached today to a full house at Mounts. On Wednesday we visited the widow Rosell and her afflicted children. I called on Brother Donau, weak but faithful. There is a blessed work of God in the east end of Loudoun County. Wednesday I preached at Leesburg. On Thursday we came to Dr. Wright's, and thence went on to William Waters's. Here I rested, and read and wrote on Friday. 
we arrived in Alexandria on Saturday. Sunday, 28. I preached on 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It was an open time. I was helped and honored of God before the people. Wednesday, March 2. Our conference began. We labored diligently and in great peace. On the Sabbath I preached and ordained deacons. Souls have been converted since we are here. Maryland, Wednesday 9. Our conference ended, and I came away to Annapolis. We came into the city about six in the evening, have traveled all day without fire, food, or water. Since the 20th of this month, 1807, we have traveled 5,000 miles, according to my computation. I rested on Thursday and preached, and next day went to Baltimore. It was excessively cold, but we did not stop on the road. At 7 o'clock I preached at Old Town. Saturday was a day of rest. Sunday 13. I preached at Fells Point in the forenoon, and at Light Street in the afternoon. I hear, see, and feel many serious things, but I must take care of my own soul. My care is to love, to suffer, and to please God. Monday 14. I took a view of our new house, large and well constructed. I preached to the African congregation. On Tuesday we moved off to Bennett's. Wednesday noon found us at Howell's. At night we were in Delaware, at Kagey's. O my soul, rest in God. I am sometimes led to think the whole world will rise up against the pretensions of England to the dominion of the seas. Will Bonaparte conquer the world? He may. But will he govern it, and reign universal emperor over sea and land? No, no, no. Here I rest. Pennsylvania. I preached in passing through Wilmington on Friday, and on Saturday we got into Philadelphia. I preached at St. George's twice, at the Academy, at Ebenezer, and at Bethel, African. We sat from Sabbath to Sabbath, in conference. Our business was conducted in great peace, but I did not please everybody by the appointments of the stations. Monday 28. We set out for the Jerseys, through which we passed swiftly to New York. We arrived on Wednesday. Jersey and York are blessed with revivals of religion. New York, Wednesday, April 6. Our conference for New York began in Amenia. On the Sabbath I preached in the town meeting house and ordained seven elders. It was a time of solemnity, and we had nearly fifteen hundred people to hear. This conference is pleasant to me. I am near my work, I am not disturbed by company, and we make good progress with our business. Connecticut, Wednesday 13. We rose. I stationed eighty-eight preachers. We came away to Goshen, twenty miles, and lodged with Mr. Munson, a respectable brother. On Thursday we made it thirty-five miles to East Hartford. We lodged with Squire Pitkins. Next day brought us to New London. It was Good Friday, and had been appointed a state fast day. I took only a cup of coffee and a small bit of bread. At Father Lattimore's we were kindly received and comfortably fixed. My two last days' rides were severe. My flesh is not brass, nor my bones iron. But I was in peace and communion with the Father and the Son. On Saturday we had a great storm. Confinement indoors gave me an opportunity of preparing papers for the conference. Sunday 17. Easter Sunday. I preached in the Baptist meeting house. The Baptists occupied ours. Theirs was the larger building, and we had it crowded. Conference sat until Friday. We wrought in haste, in great order, and in peace, through a great deal of business. There were seventeen deacons, traveling and local, ordained, and nine elders ordained in the Congregational Church, 
before 1,500 or 2,000 witnesses. I know not where large congregations are so orderly as in the eastern states. There was a work of God going on during the sitting of the conference. The general conference hastened our breaking up, the delegates thereto requesting leave to go. There were deficiencies in money matters, but no complaints. Monday 25. We came in haste through Milford, Stratford, Bridgeport, and Fairfield to Stamford, 42 miles. On Tuesday, a 38 miles ride brought us into New York. We had very heavy showers on the way. I feel my shoulders eased a little, now that I have met the seven conferences. I have lived to minute 552 preachers in this country. The increase this short year is 7,500 in round numbers. New York, Wednesday 27. I preached at the African Church and ordained D. Coker and W. Miller. Thursday 28. We set out and reached a place ten miles beyond Brunswick in New Jersey. On Friday we reached Hancock's. Saturday brought us through Burlington to Philadelphia, where we dined and stopped. At Kensington I preached a Sabbath sermon. At the African Zohar I also preached. Maryland, Monday, May 2. We set out and reached Kegi's, 42 miles. On Tuesday we arrived at Perry Hall. Truly we came to the house of mourning. The master is possibly dying. Mr. Goff is dead. I saw and touched his dying body. When the corpse was moved to be taken into the country for interment, many of the members of the general conference walked in procession after it, to the end of the town. Harry Dorsey Goff professed more than thirty years ago to be convicted and sanctified. That he did depart from God is well known, but it is equally certain that he was visibly restored. As I was the means of his first turning to God, so was I also of his return and restoration. Certain prejudices he had taken up against myself and others, these I removed. In his last hours, which were painfully afflicted, he was much given up to God. Mr. Goff had inherited a large estate from a relation in England, and having the means, he indulged his taste for gardening, and the expensive embellishment of his country seat, Perry Hall, which was always hospitably open to visitors, particularly those who feared God. Although a man of plain understanding, Mr. Goff was a man much respected and beloved. As a husband, a father, and a master, he was well worthy of imitation. His charities were as numerous as proper objects to a Christian were likely to make them. And the souls and bodies of the poor were administered to in the manner of a Christian who remembered the precepts and followed the example of his divine master. Friday 6. Our general conference opened in peace. On Saturday, 129 members took their seats. The new church in Utah Street was opened on the Sabbath day, and I gave a discourse on the occasion from 2 Corinthians 3.12. On the 26th, the conference rose. We have done very little except at making the rule for representation hereafter, one member to the general conference for every six members of the annual conferences, and the electing dear brother M. Kendry assistant bishop. The burden is now borne by two pair of shoulders instead of one. The care is cast upon two hearts and heads. Friday 27. Heavy rain and awful thunder. On Saturday I visited Samuel Owings of S. I baptized G. Howard's three pretty children. At the request of some preachers in England, and the desire of the general conference, I sat to Mr. Bruff, who took my likeness in crayons. Sabbath 29. I preached at Old Town and visited the House of Mourning. In the afternoon I gave the Africans a talk. I visited a grandson of Mother Tribulate. Her house, in my first and early visits to Baltimore, was my home. The young man's mother, Mary, married one Killen. 
she died in peace and joy, and I hope the young man will be brought home to heaven and to God. On Tuesday I rode up to Daniel Eltecott's and preached. It was an open season. At St. James's Chapel, Dr. Warfield heard me, who had heard me thirty-six years ago. Ah, I should not regret riding many miles to be the means of converting this dear man to God. I returned to Baltimore. On Friday I preached at Gatch's Chapel. Sabbath, June 5. Harry Dorsey Goff's funeral sermon was preached. There might be two thousand people to hear. George Roberts spoke first on, He that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. My subject was Acts 14.22. I spoke long, and was obliged to speak loud that all might hear. My subject was very much a portraiture of Mr. Goff's religious experience and character. End of section 28. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 29 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Monday 6. Bless the day. I escaped from a month's location to the pleasant fields. Never were my friends more attentive, kind, and affectionate. But ah, the death of religion. In this, I die. I preached at Cole's Meeting House. Feeble as I was, the people waited and heard with patience, and I delivered my own soul. At Reisterstown I gave them a discourse on Romans 12, 1, 2. It was a time of freedom. After dining at Christopher Carnan's, I came away to James M. Cannon's, Richland. On Wednesday I preached at the Stone Chapel. I went next day to see the wife of William Durbin in her affliction of body and mind. Thirty-six years ago I visited this house. I have seen three generations. We dined with Ann Willis and her aged mother, Honor Willis. I prayed with them and embraced the six children and blessed them in the name of the Lord. Friday 10 At Alexander Warfield's on Sam's Creek I am holy for God. Our fields promise abundant crops. Our stores and barns will be filled with the fruits and productions of field and tree, while they are starving in Europe. O oh, sin! O oh, ingratitude! I spent the Saturday with Joshua Jones. Sabbath 12 At Linganore Chapel, my subject was Ephesians 5, 15, 16. In the afternoon at Liberty New Chapel, I gave them a short discourse. I was feeble, but fervent. I am kept at work by my friends, but they do what they can, Methodists and others, to pay me in affection, in attentions, in honor. Lord, keep me humble and holy. I went to Stephen Shelmerdain's on Monday, preached at Frederick on Tuesday, and returned to this afflicted family. On Wednesday, at Brother Martin's, in Frederick, I met with my old acquaintance of York, Pennsylvania, the Reverend Mr. Wagner. He is now fifty-eight. It is many years since our first interview, and this may be our last. Our meeting ended in prayer, and when going I gave him a book of our discipline, and recommended to his attention the portrait of St. Paul by Fletcher. Oh, that all ministers would read it, and labor to impress it upon their hearts, and show a likeness in their lives and labors. After the rain we pressed on to Samuel Phillips's. On Thursday my companion, Boehm, went to Middletown. I stayed at home and read. Friday, rain. I preached on Revelations 3.20. Brother Boehm also spoke in German. Saturday we rode to Hagerstown. Our German brethren of Otterbeins have shouldered us out, but have failed to establish themselves. Sabbath 19. I preached on Romans 1.16. Henry Bohm spoke in the afternoon and at night. Death without. But there are some lively souls in the society. I feel the effect of riding in the heat. But I have great peace. On Monday I preached at St. Leaguer Neal's, and on Tuesday at Prather's. 
The heat and rough roads have brought on a bilious headache. I begin to fail. Wednesday evening brought us to Richard Dowler's at the mouth of Licking. I preached at Hancock on Thursday. The people were very attentive. Alas, no man careth for these people. We were driven by a storm into Squire Yates's. I talked, prayed, dined, and left a book. Lord, give us this family. At Clark's Tavern on Friday, where I gave a book and prayed, I did not know that my host was a Romanist. It was all one to me. We lodged with Lennox Martin. On Saturday we came to J. Jacobs. Ah, because he saith the old wine is better. King James used to call for his old shoes. They fit me best. Sabbath 26 We had about four hundred souls at the chapel in Old Town. I spoke on Romans 12, 1, 2. Brother Boehm concluded and met the society. It was an open season. Hot as it was, we sung and prayed away the day. On our way to Aquila Brown's, Evitts Creek, on Monday, we were glad, now and then, to stop and shelter ourselves under the trees from the extreme heat. I give advice for the body and soul of the wife of my kind host. At the Lutheran Church, Cumberland, on Tuesday, we had a full house. My subject was Second Peter three seventeen eighteen. I was very pointed on sinners and backslidden souls. I was expected to dine at only three several houses. Only let me declare myself, and work is soon found for me. A serious adult of forty years, and three children to baptize. One for Bell, one for Scott, and one for Brown. Brown was a deist. He is now a brother. Many think Bishop Watcote's prayers were heard for him. We have Georgia Heat. I preached in the chapel at Cresseps Town on Wednesday. We breakfasted at four o'clock on Thursday that we might climb the Allegheny. Friday, July 1. Moved at four o'clock after breakfasting. At five in the evening we landed at Jacob Murphy's. Our twenty-two hours' ride has brought us seventy miles. I have suffered much. I am pained and sore, and poor Jane stumbled so often. But my limbs and my soul are safe. Glory, glory. We rested on Saturday. Pennsylvania, Sabbath 3 I preached at Uniontown on James 5, 1920. We started away for the widow Henthorns, where we spent a solitary Fourth of July in reading, and drafting conference plans as far as Baltimore. My mind is wholly devoted to God. On Tuesday I read Thomas Akempis, and copied off a list of preachers for the Western and Southwestern conferences. Brother Boehm preached to the people in English and German. He also preached at Middletown on Thursday. I spoke for about half an hour at the Widow Stevens's on Friday. My subject was 1 Corinthians 6, 1920. On Saturday I read a part of the seventh volume of Wesley's sermons. Confinement is excessively irksome, but the rain for four days past is tremendous, and I feel my old rheumatic affections. Edward Drumgould, from Old Virginia, is just on his return from a visit westward. He thinks he has seen an end of all perfection. Andy has been preaching at the camp meetings beyond the Ohio. He thinks forty souls were converted. Sabbath 10 At Connellsville I preached in our new house, sixty by forty feet. Brother Bohm spoke in German. The inflammation of my throat I laid aside as well as I could, and spoke on. Page, Doherty, and Boehm each added a few words. And so we dedicated the walls of the house of God. The roof was not yet on. On Monday I went to Colonel Mason's, and was kindly received in his splendid, useful, good house. I was constrained to put a blister to my ear. At William Ball's new house I spoke on Wednesday to about two hundred people. We were satisfied to stop at the Widow Woodfields at the crossings of Monongalia. 
one of my feet was inflamed. My blister was running, and the heat was excessive. Brother Boehm preached. I had a conversation with Asa Shin, respecting a removal to Baltimore. On Friday I preached at Taylor's Chapel. I visited Dr. Wheeler, risen from a dangerous fall from his horse and from apparent death. Rested on Saturday. I am lame and sensibly feel the great heat. Sabbath 17 With the aid of two crutches I hobbled into meeting at Brownsville and preached on John 3, 17. I am sorely lame. I dined with Mr. Hogg, a kind, polite English family. On Monday I had an awfully severe ride to Chalfonts, and then on to John Brightwell's. I am fairly arrested in my course. My knees and feet are so disabled that I am lifted to bed. I can neither ride, stand, nor walk. Sabbath 24 I feel revived this morning, but oh, what an awful night of pain! The people gathered in the house, and I taught them from Acts 26, 18. I have a clean house, an excellent nurse as any in the country, and kindly attentive people. How am I honored? Thornton Fleming paid me a visit, and with him came Mrs. Hebert, and a daughter of Edward Bailey, of Amherst, Virginia. These dear souls came sixty miles to see me. I suppose I must get a four-wheeled carriage. Wednesday was a serious day, but prepare to move we must. Pain and death are nothing when opposed to duty. On Thursday we set off to Washington. We had two hours' rain, but this was not as bad as pain of body. Mr. M. Fadden was as loving and kind as need be. We found a home at John Beck's on Friday. Saturday, rested. Sabbath 31 At Bethel Chapel, Short Creek, I gave them a sermon. I spoke in great weakness. Monday, August 1. I preached in the courthouse at Wheeling. I have great pain. At Colonel Zane's, where I lodged, the aged people were kind indeed. At Newellsville, I gave them a discourse. We first stopped at Gelbert's on Wednesday, and then went on to Moore's. We had a great heat, and I was almost overdone. On Thursday, we came to Wills Creek to dine, and then rode on. There is a great want of water. I rested well last night, but my case is pretty serious. I am so disabled that the riding, and the long hills especially, almost make me cry out. Ohio, Sabbath 7 On Saturday we visited the campground and returned to Daniel Stevens's. Wire and Layton, two young preachers, died lately upon their circuits. I preached today at Bush Creek, upon 1 Timothy 3, 14-17. I ordained James Watts an elder. It was a solemn time. Some wagoners attempted to sell whiskey on the campground. We stopped our preaching. The people soon knew how deeply we felt the insult, and they were driven away. Henry Bohm spoke in German. We had about a thousand people to hear. The house where I stayed was much crowded, which ill suited me in my afflicted state. I paid a visit to John Manley on Monday, stayed there to rest and refit. We moved to the Widow Taylor's on Tuesday, and on Wednesday came into Chillicothe. On Thursday I preached in the chapel. It was quite comfortable to know that people dropped the scythe and laid by the plain to come to the house of God. Chillicothe has been cursed with apostate Methodist preachers. But if I am not deceived, God will yet do great things here. I was invited to pass a night under the hospitable roof of General Thomas Worthington at Mount Prospect Hall. Within sight of this beautiful mansion lies the precious dust of Mary Tiffin. It was as much as I could do to forbear weeping as I mused over her speaking grave. How mutely eloquent! Ah, the world knows little of my sorrows. Little knows how dear to me are my many friends, 
and how deeply I feel their loss. But they all die in the Lord, and this shall comfort me. I delivered my soul here. May this dear family feel an answer to Mary Tiffin's prayers. On Friday we went to the campground at Deer Creek. Saturday rested. Damp. Rain. The work of God went on night and day, nevertheless. There were twenty-three traveling and local preachers on the ground. Perhaps tents and wagons, one hundred and twenty-five. And about two thousand people. Forty souls professed converting grace. We rested on Monday, and on Tuesday came up Short Creek. We found the family of Mr. Wood, at the new purchase, as kind as need be. The prairies have once been, I suppose, lakes of water. They furnish grand and beautiful views still. Oh, the flies, the heat! We dined at Brother Cutler's on Wednesday and came on, through Xenia, to Frederick Bonner's Little Miami, 32 miles. I have more than once put the wrong foot foremost in my journeys to the west. The spring will not do because of wet and deep and dismal roads. The summer's extreme heat, and the small and the green flies make disagreeable traveling. I make a decree, but not of the Medes and Persians, never in future to cross the mountains before the 1st of September, nor leave Carlisle before the 1st of October. On Thursday I rested. Friday at John's Sales. Saturday rested. Sabbath 21 at Xenia Courthouse I preached from Colossians 1, 28. We had about five hundred souls to hear. It was a searching season. On Tuesday left Peter Pelham's and came to Samuel Hitz. Wednesday 24. I preached at the Widow Smith's. On Thursday we passed Lebanon, journeying down the Little Miami, calling at Clark's to escape the rain. It cleared away, and we came in haste by Wall Smith's Mill to M. Grews. Camp meeting commenced at Philip Gatchell's on Friday. Here I saw many whom I had not seen for years. How delightful to see our old friends after a separation, and to find them still on the Lord's side. I spoke twice, then much faithful preaching, and we believe much good done. Fifty souls professed converting grace. I talk more than is truly spiritual. I rejoice to think there will be perhaps four or five hundred camp meetings this year. May this year outdo all former years in the conversion of precious souls to God. Work, Lord, for thine own honor and glory. Thursday, September 1. I preached at the chapel, Little Miami. We had a full house at a short notice. I was grieved to see an unfeeling man take away a poor widow's horse for debt. But Brother Getchell soon relieved me. He paid the debt, and restored the horse to the distressed woman to be hers for life. Friday 2 Great work in Spain. The old king resigning to his son, and his son outwitted by Bonaparte. The old king is persuaded by the enemy of both to make Murat, Duke of Berg, his viceroy. This, I hear, is the news. Ah, the poor Spaniards will have blood to drink. The first victims will be the priests. And the House of Mercy, the Inquisition, what will become of it? Is Europe prepared for free governments and freedom in religion? Bonaparte will establish himself for one year, and then he goes, goes, goes. We cried to God yesterday for rain. Today we have it in abundance. After one o'clock we came away from M. Grews to Cincinnati. The waters of the rivers have failed more than I ever knew them before. I read a book today and wrote two letters. I have advised the Society here to invite the Western Yearly Conference to hold their session in Cincinnati. Sabbath 4 I preached at ten o'clock in great bodily weakness. The heat was great, and the house was crowded. But I felt sensible of divine aid. 
Brother Bohm spoke after me in German. At three o'clock I preached again at Brother Lakin's. Brother Bohm also spoke at six o'clock in the evening, in English. Thus we improved the day. My temptations are hidden but great. I have need of great strength, for I am greatly responsible. Lord, help me. On Monday we had plentiful rain. I rested. I advised the brethren to enlarge the house to eighty feet. On Tuesday we took our flight. It was not pleasant traveling. We stopped and dined at Murphy's, and so avoided the rain. At Judge Sims's new improvement, we crossed the Great Miami. We saw the paraquet here as upon Santee River. After crossing White River, we came to Lawrenceburg, the first town in the Indian Territory. In this wild, there may be twenty thousand souls already. I feel for them. Elijah Sparks received us gladly. We dined with J. Wilson and stopped at Dickinson's. After beating the shore of the Ohio for two hours, we crossed in a crazy flat at the mouth of Kentucky River. Kentucky On Thursday, we lodged at the Widow Masterton's. I sighed over the heaps of dust raised upon the bodies of her husband and children. Nathan Wire, a promising youth upon trial on the circuit, has been called away. He died with consumption. Ah, what blessed numbers have gone home triumphantly within the last forty years! Surely we may praise the dead, for they died in the Lord. Friday brought us through Williamsport, Gallatin, Henry, and Shelby. We brought up with my old friend Billy Adams, grandson of William, son of Simon. We have ridden about one hundred miles in three days. Our fare has been rough, but Sister Lakin and the preachers who accompanied us bore the fatigues of the ride very well. I feel for the people of this territory, but we must suffer with them if we expect to feel for them as we ought. And here are the disadvantages of a local episcopacy, that it cannot be interested for its charge as it should be, because it sees not, suffers not with, and therefore feels not for the people. On Saturday at Edward Talbot's. Sunday 11. At the Brick Chapel, I spoke on 1 Corinthians 15, 58. A more attentive congregation I have not seen. But ah me, to pant for breath, and unable to walk, kneel, or stand up straight to preach, makes public speaking serious work to me. Brothers Lakin and Bohm spoke after me. We were about four hours in the house. I see, I feel, what is wrong in preachers and people, but I cannot make it right. I saw some dear old friends from Virginia and Maryland. We rested on Monday at Edward Talbot's. On Tuesday we passed Shelby and came to Philip Taylor's. The swelling in my feet had returned. I was weary and willing to rest. We called a meeting on Wednesday, and I gave them a sermon from 2 Corinthians 5, 2. Gabriel Mayo received, and kindly entertained us after crossing Salt River. On Thursday, we hasted away to Joseph Ferguson's, Nelson County. I met Benedict Swope by accident. I knew him at first glance, but he would not have recollected me. It was pleasing to meet after so long an absence. But ah! How time and toil and suffering have worn us down, one of us at least. I preached at Ferguson's on Friday. We had a warm, heavy ride to Colonel Thomas's, Hayden Creek, Washington County. Sunday, 18. At the New Chapel, I spoke on 1 John 3, 1 through 4. It was a time of seriousness. I could not stand. I sat to preach. My kind brethren, M. Kendry and Thompson, came miles to see me. On Monday I parted from Sister Lakin, wife of Benjamin. So far from being a troublesome companion, she was very useful to me as a nurse and servant for Christ's sake. We crossed the rolling fork of Salt River, passed Murders Hill, dined at M. Murray's, and then hasted on to Georgetown, 
crossed Green River by fording, and stopped at Noah Lasley's. We have made forty miles today. My lame feet were in a poultice. It was unusually warm, but I enjoyed great peace in my soul. I preached at Lasley's. On Tuesday we had a full house at Sudden Warning. Here I saw William Price and family. Great joy, as if we were risen from the dead. I preached at Robert Price's, Adams Creek, upon Colossians 1, 7. David Rice stepped in whilst I was speaking, and when I had closed, withdrew without speaking to me. On Thursday we came to Glasgow, where I visited Brother Cruisenberry, and Henry and Edward Cowell. Friday evening brought us up at Brother Porter's, from Maryland, now of Warren County. On Saturday we came in upon the camp with Bishop M. Kendry. On Sunday we had preaching as usual, and a gracious rain, in mercy if not in answer to prayer. We came no farther than Woodard's, twenty-two miles, on Monday. On Tuesday we passed through Nashville. This town has greatly improved in eight years. There are several valuable houses built, an elegant courthouse, and a college. We put in at Green Hills, Williamson County. We have important business here to engage our attention. Seven districts there are, and a call for eighty preachers. Tennessee, Saturday, October 1. I began conference. I preached twice on the Sabbath day and again on Tuesday. Our conference was a camp meeting, where the preachers ate and slept in tents. We sat six hours a day, stationed eighty-three preachers, and all was peace. On Friday the sacrament was administered, and we hoped there were souls converted, and strengthened, and sanctified. We made a regulation respecting slavery. It was that no member of society, or preacher, should sell or buy a slave unjustly, inhumanly, or covetously, the case on complaint to be examined for a member by the quarterly meeting, and for a preacher an appeal to an annual conference, where the guilt was proved the offender to be expelled. The families of the Hills, Sewells, and Cannon were greatly and affectionately attentive to us. Saturday 8. We came rapidly to Stone River, and thence to Cranes. At the meeting house I preached on the Sabbath day, from Second Peter 4, 17. I called upon Hardy Hunt. We rose at four o'clock on Monday, and started away for Henry Tooley's. The heat is great. We may give it five months' continuance this year. The increase of the Western Conference for the year will be 2,500. On Tuesday we rested and refitted, preparing ourselves to breast the wilderness. The rain caught us on Wednesday, and fell on us with little intermission, until we got to our home at Shaw's in Carthage. On Thursday evening I came in very unwell to Johnson's. We had not above fifty travelers in company. At Haley's next night we were not so crowded, and did better. There is order observed under this roof. We breakfasted at S.W. Point on Saturday, and then hastened on to Winton's. Since we left the conference ground, we have made two hundred miles. My sufferings have been great. I had the piles, and pains of body, and sultry weather, crowded houses and rough roads, and bad men for company. But my mind enjoyed great peace, notwithstanding my starting, stumbling horse, that ever and anon would run away with me. I preached on the Sabbath day at Winton's Chapel, a crowd within and without. The wind prevented our taking the woods. There is a special revival of religion in the society here. After preaching we crossed Holston and rode ten miles to meet the people at John Saffles. We started in the rain on Monday to Marysville, called upon Mark Moore, and continued forward to Esquire Black's and lodged. End of section 29. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 30 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 3. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Tuesday, 18. Came to Mitchell Peters on Pigeon River. Wednesday, rain. Thursday, rain. We crossed the river twice. I preached at the chapel on Matthew 5, 8. On Friday, James Riggin came twenty miles, breasting the rains, and plunging through the swollen streams to see me. He wept over me, and bade farewell. But shall we not meet where all tears shall be wiped from all eyes? We started away on Saturday, wade or swim, foul or fair, across the east forks of Little and Great Pigeon. The waters were full enough. Sunday 22 at O'Haver's, a camp meeting had been appointed by the preachers and people. Bishop M. Kendry and Brother Bohm spoke, as well as Brother Blackman and myself. Brother Bowman spoke at night, and some souls were affected. On Monday I spoke again. There was a flood of speaking to about three hundred souls, some of whom joined society. It was very cold on the ground. Our party came away to George Wells's. On Tuesday we rode twenty miles to the Warm Springs, and next day reached Buncombe, thirty-two miles. The right way to improve a short day is to stop only to feed the horses, and let the riders, meanwhile, take a bite of what they may have been provident enough to put in their pockets. It has been serious October to me. I have labored and suffered, but I have lived near to God. North Carolina, Saturday, 29. We have rested for three days past. We fell in with Jesse Richardson. He could not bear to see the field of Buncombe deserted by militiamen, who fire a shot and fly, and wheel and fire, and run again. He is a veteran who has learned to endure hardness like a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the Sunday I preached in Buncombe Courthouse upon First Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. I lodged with a chief man, a Mr. Irwin. Henry Boehm went to Pigeon Creek to preach to the Dutch. On Monday, I went to David Jay's. I thought it was unknown, but the woman of the house, the mother of seven children, quickly told me I had joined her in matrimony to her present husband. Here we met with Daniel Asbury. Great news from Georgia, South and North Carolina. Thirty or forty or fifty souls converted at camp meetings. But in old Virginia, the work is still greater, and Brother Bruce's labors have been blessed in an extraordinary manner. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, November 1, 2, 3. I rested, read, and preached but once. On Friday, we descended the heights of Cooper's Gap to our friend David Dickey's. Fasting and the labor of lowering ourselves down from the mountaintop have made us feeble. Bishop M. Kendry preached upon, Cast not away your confidence. On the Sabbath, Brother Bohm spoke in the morning at eight o'clock. I preached from Matthew 17, 5. Exhortations followed, and Brother Bohm ended our Sabbath labors by preaching at night, when there was a considerable move. We came away on Monday by Rutherford Courthouse to G. Moore's. At Moore's Chapel on Tuesday, I preached from Colossians 2, 6. Henry Bohm spoke at night. Verily, we had a shout. Bishop M. Kendry preached at Lucas's Chapel upon Little Broad, and we lodged at Lucas's. A noble ride of forty miles brought us next day to Williams's in Lincoln. I preached on Friday. My mind hath great peace, but my body is weak. The prospects are reviving and cheering in the South Carolina Conference, and they will grow better every year. On Saturday I preached. I ordained Samuel Smith and Enoch Spinks. The Sabbath day was windy and cold. I had taken an emetic and kept the house. Monday 14. Rode 33 miles, hungry, cold, and sick to Harrison's, Mecklenburg County. I came, unwell and taking medicine, to Robert Hancock's, Waxhaws. I suffer, but it is the will of God. Eighteen hundred miles since leaving Baltimore. 
I have ordained Robert Hancock, a local deacon. We came rapidly to Hanging Rock on Wednesday, and next day reached Camden, and lodged with Samuel Matthews. South Carolina, Sabbath 20 I preached in the tabernacle in Camden in the morning, and Brother Boehm in the afternoon, and Bishop M. Kendry at night. Letters from the presiding elders announce great times in camp meetings. Monday 21 This day I renew my covenant with God. To do nothing, I doubt, is not lawful, and at all times, and in all places, to live as if it were my last hour. May God help me so to do. On Wednesday I went to the encampment four miles from the city. Bishop M. Kendry preached. It was very unpleasant weather. I took cold, sitting in the stand. Thursday, dwelling under curtains. I took an emetic. Wrote two letters to Elders Soul and Beale, Province of Maine. I am still at Rembert Hall. I visited and preached upon the campground. We had an exceeding strong wind, but the people were very attentive. The superintendency had a hut with a chimney in it. There were forty tents and cabins. Bishop M. Kendry was three days and nights on the ground, and there was a powerful work among white saints and sinners, and the poor, oppressed, neglected Africans. Sabbath 27 At Rembert Chapel my subject was Revelation 7, 14-17. Brothers Smith and Boehm followed with energetic exhortations. I felt dejected in mind, and my soul was humbled. I suffer much from ill health, too close application to business, and from having preached in the open air. I filled an appointment made for Bishop M. Kendry at Rembert's. On Monday I rode forty-five miles to Mr. Keel's. We crossed Murray's next day, and stopped in the evening at the Widow Kennedy's. Wednesday we had a heavy ride, and I felt it from top to bottom. Great news! Baltimore, taken fire. Bohemia has a great work. Camp meetings have done this. Glory to the great I Am. Sunday, December 4. At Cumberland Church we had a sacramental day. I preached at Bethel in the afternoon. We have a great change and a glorious prospect here in Charleston, and in the neighborhood among both descriptions of people. By our colored missionaries the Lord is doing wonders among the Africans. Monday 5. I am closely employed in reading and writing letters, and receiving company. Our house is a house of prayer ten or twelve times a day. I read Mr. Wesley's journal. Ah, how little it makes me feel! The faithfulness, the diligence of this great man of God! I cannot meet the classes like him, but I have a daily throng of white and black who apply for spiritual instruction. Sabbath 11. I preached in Cumberland Street. It was a serious parting time. At Bethel I also gave them a talk in the afternoon. This was a heavy day. I felt the weight of souls. Some may think it no great matter to build two churches, buy three lots, pay fifteen hundred dollars of bank debt, and raise a growing society. This has been done in this Sodom in less than twenty-four years. O Lord, take Thou the glory. We dined in the woods on Monday, and made it thirty-two miles to Perry's. On Tuesday we crossed Edisto, dining at Coger's, and came into Benjamin Risher's. Next day at the Green Ponds Chapel, Bishop M. Kendry, Brother Boehm, and myself all spoke. We lodged at Lewis's, niece to one who had first received the Methodist preachers. Next day we called on B. M. Lellen, a preacher, and lodged with Benjamin Tarrant. Oh, that it was with him as in years past! Once, how holy and innocent! We reached Benjamin Weatherby's on Friday evening. Cold, very cold weather. We came into Augusta on Saturday evening. We dined in the woods. One disorderly man has given great trouble. An awful Osborne Randall has shot a man. Georgia, Sabbath 18. I preached in Augusta Chapel. My flesh sinks under labor. 
we are riding in a poor thirty-dollar chase, in partnership, two bishops of us, but it must be confessed it tallies well with the weight of our purses. What bishops? Well. But we hear great news, and we have great times, and each Western, Southern, and the Virginia Conference will have one thousand souls truly converted to God. And is not this an equivalent for a light purse? And are we not well paid for starving and toil? Yes, glory be to God. We came away to Weising's on Monday, and next day toiled through a very heavy rain to the Widow Fountains. We remained Thursday and Friday in Sparta, and went on Saturday to Brother Bush's. Sabbath 25, Christmas Day I preached on John 3, 17. We opened our conference on Monday. We had great labor, which we went through in great peace. Between sixty and seventy men were present, all of one spirit. We appointed three missionaries, one for Tombigby, one to Ashley and Savannah, and the country between, and one to labor between Santee and Cooper Rivers. Increase within the bounds of this conference, 3,088. Preaching and exhortations, and singing, and prayer. We had all these, without intermission, on the campground, and we have reasons to believe that many souls will be converted. The number of traveling and local preachers present are about 300. There are people here with their tents who have come 150 miles. The prospects of doing good are glorious. We have already added two new circuits, and gained six preachers. There may have been from two to three thousand persons assembled. I preached once. We had finished our conference concerns the evening before. January 1, 1809 We came away on Monday morning in haste. We stopped to dine with our friend Doughty in Powelton. This is a stronghold of the Baptists. Nevertheless, we have a house to preach in, and a society. We went as far as W. Bonner's to lodge. On Tuesday we dined at Pleasant Tyndall's and reached Augusta about six o'clock. A cold rain and freezing ride brought us on Wednesday to Spires. Next day Arthur's, near Granby. There was an appointment here for a local preacher, and I filled it for him. I ought to record that the good old folks where I lodged gave up their rooms to me. A hard ride on Friday between the hours of eight and five brought us into Camden. I scarcely have time to make these few brief journalizing remarks. South Carolina, Sabbath 8 I preached in our enlarged meeting house in Camden. It was a feeling season, in anticipation of great things here. We came away on Monday morning through clouds and a cold rain, 26 miles to Brother Woodham's on Lynch's Creek. I ordained Stephen Thompson a deacon. In crossing Cashaway Ferry on Tuesday, it was a mercy we were not thrown into the water, like poor Hilliard Judge. We were kindly and comfortably lodged by Esquire Neville. My mind most deeply felt for the salvation of this amiable family. North Carolina Wednesday 11 was cloudy and very cold, but we took horse and made it 33 miles to Lumberton and stopped at the Widow Thompson's. I am most at home when I am housed with the widow and the orphan. We reached Fayetteville on Thursday. My limbs, my patience, and my faith have been put to severe trial. I preached in the morning on the Sabbath, and Bishop M. Kendry and Brother Boehm after. Since Friday morning I have been occupied in writing, forming plans, and occasionally reading. I baptized a daughter for Mr. Newby. Eli Perry came fifty-six miles for deacon's orders. I advised him to tell his father, a backslidden Baptist preacher, that he, Eli, would set apart once a month a day of fasting and prayer for his father's restoration. We set out on Monday the solitary path on the north side of Cape Fear, to the Widow Andrews, forty-five miles. We were in the night, and I was very much disordered. Tuesday brought us to Wilmington, 45 miles, again in the night, and my pain extreme. 
I was compelled to preach on Wednesday at eleven o'clock. I gave them a sermon also on Thursday. My body is in better health, and my mind enjoys great sweetness and peace. We had morning preaching on Friday at five o'clock, to about two hundred souls. We came away afterward, and a ride of twenty miles brought us to the widow Nixon's. The dear old man, her husband, died in Georgia, died in prayer. I gave those present an exhortation and my evening prayers. Saturday brought us to New River, and next day the Sabbath I preached in our enlarged chapel on 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. It was unusually warm, and so great a wind at night that it frequently waked me. We were most kindly and comfortably entertained at Gaius Rose. God is worshipped in this house. Oh, what a change is here! The poor Africans, once oppressed, have now great privileges allowed them. We came to Adonijah Perry's on Monday. May he follow his father, who followed Christ. Newburn brought us up on Tuesday. I preached on Wednesday, and it was an open season. God will visit Newburn again. A cold ride brought us to Washington, a disagreeable place to me. But there are souls here, and God can convert and save them. We have a neatly finished house, in which I preached on Friday in great heaviness of body. It is a day of abstinence. I spent my Saturday at Williams's, a secluded house, and social family. Sabbath 29 I preached at Williams's chapel on Habakkuk 3, 2. I felt myself in the spirit of the work. In the evening we had snow and hail. We set out on Monday and had a very disagreeable ride through deep swamps and snow. At Williamston I preached to a few people. A cold ride of thirty-two miles brought us to Tarboro on Tuesday. Wednesday, February 1. Opened the Virginia Conference. We had eighty-four preachers present, sixty of them the most pleasing, promising young men. Seventeen preachers were admitted. In all the conference there are but three married men. The high taste of these southern folks will not permit their families to be degraded by an alliance with a Methodist traveling preacher, and thus involuntary celibacy is imposed upon us. All the better. Care and anxiety about worldly possessions do not stop us in our course, and we are saved from the pollution of Negro slavery and oppression. Bishop M. Kendry preached an ordination sermon on Friday. On the Sabbath I gave them a discourse on humiliation before God. Bishop M. Kendry ordained eight elders and I thirteen deacons. I suppose we have had two thousand souls to hear us in the two churches, and our friends are very attentive to entertain us in their houses, abundantly better than we deserve. Our increase in members, unless we allow for a great waste by death, and loss by removals, is not very encouraging. The West and South have given more than three thousand each, whereas here it is not three hundred. We are defrauded of great numbers by the pains that are taken to keep the blacks from us. Their masters are afraid of the influence of our principles. Would not an amelioration in the condition and treatment of slaves have produced more practical good to the poor Africans than any attempt at their emancipation? The state of society, unhappily, does not admit of this. Besides, the blacks are deprived of the means of instruction. Who will take the pains to lead them into the way of salvation, and watch over them that they may not stray, but the Methodists? Well, now their masters will not let them come to hear us. What is the personal liberty of the African which he may abuse? to the salvation of his soul. How may it be compared? We adjourned on Wednesday to hold our next session in Petersburg, in Virginia. A general contentment appeared in the preachers with regard to stations. I came away instantly and had a rapid ride of twenty-eight miles to Mr. Lysiom's, near Edwards Ferry, upon Roanoke. We next day crossed the river and breakfasted at Pinner's. We lodged with Jesse Battle, 43 miles today. 
Friday brought us to Isaac Lumford's. We reached Norfolk on Saturday by ten o'clock. Virginia, Sabbath 12. I preached on Psalm 37, 3, 4, and felt liberty and life. Met the Society, and preached at Portsmouth. Preached on Monday at the Western Branch, and at night again at Suffolk. I found Richard Yerbury greatly afflicted with the gout. His hands and feet had burst, but he was resigned and patient. On Tuesday we came away to General Wells's. His brother, Willis Wells, an early Methodist and local preacher, died last year. He died in great peace. He had been led away by the misrepresentations of O'Kelly, but he came back into our bosom. I expected to have found religion more lively in this district, but we are on our lees. I grieve to find that some of the preachers went about visiting instead of being at their work. The spirit of the world, and still worse, politics. O oh, death, death! O oh, Lord God, keep thy ministers faithful! I preached at William Blunt's to a few people who had come through a dark night at a short warning. We had, after meeting, hail and rain. I rode next day, very cold, to Birdsongs, in Sussex, thirty miles in six hours. I have need of patience and courage for the roads and weather. It was exceedingly cold on Thursday. Nevertheless, we reached Petersburg about forty miles. We lodged at Edward Lee's. Joseph Handing is no more. He joined us in Norfolk in 1772. He was a man of labor and sorrow, meek and benevolent. I had hoped to find religion more prosperous, but I find, except a few places in the district, there is great languor and indifference observable. We hope for better times. We have added fifty probationers in the three conferences, Western, Southern, and that of Virginia, and have located twenty. Many of these are the most elegant young men I have seen, in features, body, and mind. They are manly, yet meek. I preached in Petersburg on Friday. After meeting I rode home with John Ryle Bradley, now warm in his first love. He was strangely brought to God. He was alone on a Sabbath day and was reading, what he indeed seldom read, his prayer book. Suddenly he was powerfully struck with keen conviction. He began to pray without book, and with all his might. What followed came, of course. At his conversion he had a stud of racehorses to part with. We reached Richmond on Saturday, and I preached next day in the city and at Manchester in the afternoon. There is a change here for the better. I lodged at A. Foster's. Monday 20. We rode twenty-four miles to Brother Cross's, twenty-four miles of heavy roads. I preached at night to a respectable congregation on First Thessalonians 5.14. The young men prayed, and there was life and feeling. C. Hines is likely to be an instrument of great good in Hanover Circuit. On Tuesday we had an uncommonly large congregation for a two hours' notice. Bishop M. Kendry preached to them. A forty-five miles ride, without food for man or beast, brought us in, after being twice lost in the woods, to Brother M. Gruder's. We reached Frederick Gilliam's, beyond the Green Mountain, on Thursday. We seldom lodge at a house without the company of preachers. We are pleased to see them, but would be better pleased to know they were on their circuits, faithfully at work. On Friday we passed Charlotteville, within sight of Fair Monticello, the seat of Thomas Jefferson. We rested at Daniel Maupin's. His father and mother are gone to rest. We crossed the ridge at Brown's Gap and came to Port Republic and lodged with Dr. William Douglas. Sabbath 26. I preached upon Acts 2.21. We found it dangerous riding through the snow to Harrisonburg on Monday. Thursday, March 2. Our conference opened. Friday, fast day, we wrought with order and industry, and did much in a little time. 
there were traveling and local deacons ordained, and we had preaching three times a day. Sabbath 5. In the morning we had a general band meeting. I preached. We had German preaching also, and a sermon at night. On Wednesday we closed our labors in great peace. We came away on Thursday morning and had a heavy, cold ride of thirty-six miles to Woodstock. We took a by-road on Friday to Stevensburg. We called a congregation who came through frost and snow and mud, and I gave them a talk from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17. There were some unhappy contentions in the society here, but I did not know it, although from my preaching some of the congregation might well suppose I did. God maketh the mind and the mouth of man. We reached Winchester on Saturday, and on the Sabbath I gave them a discourse on Habakkuk 3, 2. It was a season of freedom. An awful storm of snow overtook us on our way to Thomas Keys, where we were made comfortable for the night. We crossed Harper's Ferry on Tuesday, and came to Joseph Perkins's. My friend and neighbor has gone to rest. Next day we had deep roads to Fredericktown. I had scarcely sat down when I heard the bells ring. It was an invitation to the people to come and hear me preach. Well, go I must. About three hundred people had collected in the German Presbyterian Church. They were devoutly attentive. Next day we reached Mr. Helms's, near Patapsco Bridge. A number of workmen were deeply attentive whilst I officiated in the family evening devotions. We reached Baltimore on Thursday. Friday and Saturday received letters and visitors. My soul is greatly humbled in this city. I tremble for the ark and fear my own soul will suffer loss. End of section 30. Recording by Brian Keenan. Section 31 of Journal of the Rev. Francis Asbury, Volume 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Keenan. Maryland, Sabbath 19. At Light Street, my subject was Second Chronicles 15, 2. In the evening I preached again upon Hosea 6, 1. On Monday we went to the camp meeting near Perry Hall, and I preached in the chapel upon Philippians 2, 12 through 15. As I rode by the graves of the elders of the Goff family, the image of my dear departed Harry Goff was very present to me. We stopped in our way at B. Bennett's. His prodigal son has enlisted and gone as a sergeant to New Orleans. The mention of this place kindled strong desires in my mind to send another missionary to that quarter. I wrote to John M. Lur, presiding elder of the Mississippi District, on the subject. Tuesday was cold. We crossed the wide Susquehanna with a gentle breeze. There was no appointment for us, and it was as well thus. On Wednesday I preached at John Carnan's, Back Creek. My subject was First John 3, 1, 2. I preached at Smyrna on Thursday. We went to the state of Delaware on Friday, but there had been no notice given. We, however, gathered a few, to whom we gave a word of exhortation and went on to Chop Tank. I preached on Saturday from Luke 12:40. It is still excessively cold, and we suffer much. After sermon we rode 26 miles to Milford. Sunday 26. At Milford, my subject was Ezekiel 9:4, Very open and alarming time to saints and sinners. On Monday at Barrett's Chapel, I preached and baptized some children. I had powerful feelings of sympathy for the children and grandchildren of that holy man in life and death, Philip Barrett. We felt the wind, on our way to Dover, like the piercing of a sword. My dear friends, Governor Bassett and his lady, came nearly forty miles to meet me. I preached in Dover and baptized James Mollison, advanced in life. I have suffered incredibly by the cold in the last hundred and thirty miles. Souls and their Savior can reward me, and nothing else. Lord, remember Francis Asbury in all his labors and afflictions. Friday I preached at Kagi's. 
Brother M. Kendry and Father Bohm met me once more, and we greatly rejoiced in God together. In Wilmington, I preached on Thursday. On Friday, I spoke at the Bethel Chapel, a beautiful new house, about seven miles from Wilmington. Brother M. Kendry in the evening. I preached at Matson's Chapel. This is a house of much the same kind as the former. I sat down to teach the people, and we had an open season. Pennsylvania, Saturday, April 1. I forestalled a meeting at Derby, but few attended. I dropped them a few hints on the shortness of time. I suffer by the unusual heat and by soreness from riding. We came safe into the city of Philadelphia. I found letters from Savannah, Tom Bigby, Mississippi, Ohio, and also from the eastward. Sabbath 2. At St. George's, my subject was Haggai 1-7. I was fervent. We had a sacrament, and the Lord was present of a truth. On Monday we opened our conference in great peace and good order. I preached on Wednesday, and it was recollected that I had preached on the same subject, in the same place, in 1771. Friday we observed as a day of fasting and prayer. Both elders and deacons were ordained. There was some little difficulty with respect to our money concerns, and some of the members had been rather warm partisans as politicians. This is always wrong for them. Let them take which side they please. There was general satisfaction given as to the stations, about eighty-four in the whole. The Philadelphia Conference has subjected itself to a demand for twelve preachers who have no stations. Six of these are married, and there is a widow's maintenance to be added, making an expense of two thousand dollars. Sabbath 9. I preached at Kingston Chapel on Habakkuk 3, 2. Here I ordained Jacob Tapsco and James Champion, both Africans. I gave the congregation at the Academy Church an exhortation in the evening. With difficulty, we got out of the city of Philadelphia, and ran some risk in crossing the river into Jersey. I preached at two o'clock at Carpenter's Bridge. We lodged with Father Early, twenty-four miles from the city. Here I take a little rest. I am not conscious of indulging or feeling wrong tempers in the mighty work at which I daily labor but I never wish to meet the conference in the city of Philadelphia again. But possibly my time is short. New Jersey On Wednesday I preached at Union Chapel. It is a neat building, two stories high, forty by thirty-six feet, built on the plan I furnished them. I spent a night with J. Abbott, a local preacher. Snow on Thursday. I preached at Pittsgrove lodged under the roof of Joseph Newkirk. Here I found the children and grandchildren of Susanna Ayers, who first received the Lord's prophets in this town. There was no proper notice of our appointment at Broadneck Chapel on Friday, so that we had but few people. I lodged at Hayward's. I rode away to Chohansey on Saturday. Sabbath 16. At the chapel, I spoke on Philippians 3.8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things loss, etc. 1. The object of the Apostle's knowledge, Christ Jesus my Lord. 2. The nature and degrees of this knowledge in the Apostle's own experience. 3. The excellency of this knowledge, a saving knowledge, a life-giving and sanctifying knowledge. It is the spiritual and experimental knowledge of repentance, faith, regeneration, and sanctification, producing a holy life, a triumphant death, a joyful resurrection, and a crown of eternal glory. I had certainly part of a gay congregation. How good is not for me to say. They were serious and attentive. I met the society. Brother Boehm preached in the afternoon. I must needs hold forth again in the evening. I preached as it was desired, and we had an open season. A heavy ride brought us on Monday to Port Elizabeth. I preached on 2 Corinthians 13.5. It was a searching season. This is a new town, and we have a large house built here. 
the Baptists are building a grand house. We lodged at Benjamin Fissler's. At Tuckahoe Chapel, my subject on Tuesday was Ephesians 3, 8. I sat down and taught with pleasure. I dined with N. Swain. Richard has gone to his rest and reward. The people told me that my time of absence on this path was twenty-five years. I feel the heat and labor, and painful, weary nights appointed to me. But God, even my God, is with me. I hear of several spots where the work of the Lord is reviving powerfully. At May's Landing, Great Egg Harbor, there was power in the word, whilst I lectured on Hebrews 12.25. We hasted away to Blackman's, to be there at three o'clock, but we lost our way in the woods, and after riding fifteen miles instead of eight, we arrived at five o'clock, Tuesday evening, closed rather uncomfortably upon us at a tavern. My spirits were low, and my body very feeble. The work of God revives in the society here. Lerner Blackman has been raised up from small appearances, possibly to very considerable consequences. At Absicum on Thursday, I gave them a discourse. We dined in haste at Brother Peacock's, and came on to George Peterson's, Pleasant Mills. At the Forks on Friday, I preached in our elegant chapel on John twelve thirty-eight. It was an open time. Whom should I see but dear, aged Jesse Chu and wife? I went home with friendly William Richards. Dear Sarah, his former wife, so often my kind and attentive hostess. I only saw the marble that covered her dust. Some demur was sent by a certain preacher about his station. These things give me more pain than all the labor of the conferences. On Saturday I called to see Rebecca Sevior on a sickbed, praising God. She is a true daughter of Sarah Richardson. I rode on to Tuckerton, very damp and cold. Sunday 23. At Tuckerton, my subject was 2 Corinthians 4, 2. In the afternoon I preached again. On Monday I preached at Waretown. I stayed a while with Samuel Brown, and then came to Thomas Chamberlain's. I was compelled by uncomfortable feelings to go to rest at six o'clock. At David Woodmassey's on Tuesday, I preached on 2 Timothy 2.15. On Wednesday, after a rain, I set out for Polemus Chapel, where I preached. My friends were exceedingly kind, and I was very sick. I rose unwell on Thursday, and took medicine, and set out for Squam River. My host here, Derek Longstreet, has been married twenty-four years. His wife once had twins, and she has made him the father of sixteen children, all of whom are alive and well. I had a noble congregation here of women and children. The men were generally gone from the neighborhood, either to the waters or to work. I was seriously unwell. On Friday at Newman's, on Shark River, I had women, not a few. I suited my subject to my hearers, and preached from Luke ten forty one and 42. Ah, how many Marthas are there, and how few Marys! In the afternoon I spoke again at P. White's. We have meeting twice a day, and sometimes at night, and the prospects are pleasing. The weather is severely cold. I have read Simpson lately his plea for religion, how strong. If Simpson is right, the old Church of England has the mark of the beast in her hands at least. Great news. The British orders in council are withdrawn, and the American embargo and non-intercourse are forthwith to cease. I fear much that these expected good times will injure us. The prosperity of fools will destroy. Therefore affliction may be best, and God may send it, for this is a favored land. Lord, save us from ruin as a people. I rested on Saturday. Sunday 30. At Long Branch, my subject was Acts 3.26. It was given me to speak strong words, words of God and from God. At three o'clock I preached in the Episcopal Church at Shrewsbury. I came home with John Throckmorton. 
Monday, May 1. No appointment at Mount Pleasant. We came on to James Throckmorton's, and thence through Brunswick to Staten Island. We dined at Drake's, and supped at Elder Totten's. I have had great peace of mind, and have been greatly in the spirit of preaching, of faith, and of prayer. God has visited, and will yet powerfully visit Jersey. Probably in the last five years, five hundred souls have been converted. Glory to the great I Am. He will bear the arm of his power, and save millions in the world. New York I preached on Wednesday at the Tabernacle on Staten Island. My subject was 1 Peter 3, 15, 16. It was a feeling season. My mind was greatly enlarged. Lodged at Gilbert Totten's. Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Baptists. All upon the stretch to be greatest upon the island. The Methodists have a stationed preacher. And they have a camp meeting in contemplation. On Thursday I preached at the old meeting house. There was some tenderness manifested. On Friday I preached in our meeting house at North End. I found Brother Cushon in a languid state. I sought to administer consolation to his mind and body. Behold, the low Dutch have built a church, and the Episcopalians one at the North End near them. There are three local preachers of our order, and a presiding elder. If good be not done, the people must be hardened. I found my old friend Morel solitary. His wife is called home. My attention was strongly excited by the steamboat. This is a great invention. Brother M. Kendry preached at Elizabethtown, and I after him, at six o'clock in the evening. We have a beautiful house here, two stories high, elegantly finished, forty-five by forty feet, and well filled. On Monday I came to York, where I found letters bringing good news from the South and the West. On the 10th our conference began, and continued until the 15th. About 120 preachers present. We had great peace and good order. We had an ordination of elders at John Street Church on the Sabbath day. We had a great deal of faithful preaching. As I wish not to relate the trials met with, I will let everything but what is printed rest in shades. There were some critical cases, but nothing appeared against any member to justify expulsion. There were 115 preachers stationed, and there were few complaints. If I have slumbered five hours per night, it is as much as I have done in the matter of sleep. On Saturday I rode, through excessively warm weather, twenty miles, to J. Sherwood's. I retire to sacred solitude, and great and delightful communion with God. But want of sleep comes upon me like an armed man. Hail, holy day! On the Sabbath I preached at Sherwood's Chapel, afterward at New Rochelle Chapel. We had an open season in both congregations. The Quakers are offended, because their errors in sentiment and practice are spoken against. But they have a higher dispensation. And will this authorize the violation of a positive law of the land, which forbids unnecessary labor on the Sabbath day? Will it justify the putting asunder what God has so solemnly joined together, to wit, the ordinances of God and the influences of his Holy Spirit? So thought not the eunuch, when Philip, sent by the Holy Ghost, preached unto him Jesus. The celebration of the Lord's Supper is idolatry, say the Quakers. So thought not Paul, when exhorting the church of Corinth to the worthy commemoration of our Lord's death and passion. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. A higher dispensation. And had not God already revealed his will before the appearance of George Fox? But hush! The respectable society of people called Quakers. Respectable. Ah! There is death in that word. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. I fear what is properly the reproach of Christ has long been wiped away from this respectable people. O Lord, save thy now despised Methodist children from the praises of the people of the world. On Monday I dined with Brian B. Banks, 
and then moved on, through heavy thunder showers, to Norwalk. I had wished them to build a house here, but Mr. G. N. had told the Methodists they were poor. Poor may they ever be, and it would ruin them. I gave the good folks a discourse on Romans 16.24. Connecticut On Tuesday I came to Pex, Stratford, a faithful friend, and thence on to Father Jocelyn's, New Haven, weary, sleepy, and glad to rest. I dined with W. Griffin in Guildford. Here is a lot to build a house of worship on, and God will work here. In the afternoon I preached at Jeremiah Miners in Killingworth. Thence crossing the Connecticut River, came into New London. I have had great temptations and great consolations. The weather has been extremely warm, and my clothes are too heavy. My horse twice attempted to run away with my chair, so I was obliged to quit it. I must needs preach in New London. I gave them a discourse on 1 John 2, 6. The house was soon filled, and many went away who could not get in. Surely the society, and preachers too, have been blind to their own interests, or they would have occupied every foot of ground. But we have never taken advantage of circumstances as they offered in this place, and have lost by our negligence. We crossed Narragansett Bay on Friday, and came into Newport. Grand house, steeple, pews, by lottery. The end is to sanctify the means. Ah, what pliability to evil! Sabbath 28. I preached twice, in the forenoon on Colossians 2, 1, 2, 1 John 3, 3-5 3 in the afternoon. I spoke with difficulty and with little order in my discourses. From New York thus far we have had dust and rough roads, and I have been much tried and greatly blessed. We have ridden two hundred miles in six days. Last night we had a tremendous storm of thunder, lightning, and rain. This morning, Monday, I visited Captain Bial at Fort Walcott. I preached to the soldiers on Isaiah 57, 6-7, baptized some children, visited the school, prayed with the sick in the hospital, exhorted the poor sinners to turn to God. But ah, I might have said and done more. Here I saw discipline, order, correctness. It was grand and pleasing. What changes I pass through! How hardly shall they who travel much keep a constant eye on duty, the cross, holiness, and God! On Tuesday we came to the pleasant town of Bristol. The Methodists here have a house with pews, and a preacher who has not half enough to do. Poor work. I gave them a discourse on 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I have as much as I can bear in body and mind. I see what has been doing for nine years past to make Presbyterian Methodists. At Warren I lodged with Samuel Childs. His wife is a Shunammite. We had freedom in our meeting here. I preached on Hebrews 2, 3. Thursday, June 1. I had a feeling season at Somerset Chapel, whilst speaking from 1 Peter 4, 2. Brother Brayton's was my home. Levi Walker has not labored in vain, but it seemed as if there had been three preachers to do one man's work. There are here 291 members. We reached Easton, and I was indeed tired. The carriage horse was too wild for me to drive, and the saddle horse started and jolted very much. Massachusetts We reached Boston on Saturday. Our route hither from New York has cost us eight dollars for turnpike gates, ferries, bridges, etc. We called at but one tavern. The family who opened the door for us here is gone, but the house is in the possession of the stationed preachers and their wives. I preached at the old chapel on Sabbath morning, and administered the sacrament. In the afternoon I gave them a discourse in the new chapel. It was an open time of much feeling, and deep attention was paid to the speaker. Had I not spoken sitting, pain and weariness would have prevented my finishing. May the Lord water his own word. 
I hear of a considerable revival in several places, and that the Lord is bringing out some children to do the work of men. Out of the mouths of babes, so let it be. On Monday we had a great show. The governor came to town. I reached wretched Waltham, dripping wet. I found the four generations in health, and I got, oh, how sweet, a comfortable night's sleep, the first I have had for many nights. How good is rest to soul and body, after hard labor for the good of the souls and bodies of our fellow men. Awaking on Tuesday morning, I recollected that in the solemn hour of midnight it was strongly impressed upon my mind that I must go by Lynn. This was from God. I preached to a family congregation. On Wednesday I passed through Menotony, Medford, and Malden to Lynn. In the evening I preached. There have been awful times here for two years past. The preachers are a burden. They do not preach evangelically, do not visit families, neglect the classes. I have my load, but leaning to one side. One story is good until another is heard. Our hard-going horses brought us through the dust to Marblehead on Thursday. I held forth on John eight thirty-one thirty-two. Poor Bachelor is in ill health, and shortly to be bound to a wife. So we go. We rode onwards through a goodly prospect of fine buildings and fine meeting-houses. At Beverly, my host did not quite understand praying in the daytime. At Joseph Weeks in the evening at Greenland. From this unpromising place, and other surrounding towns, God has raised up a society. On Saturday I found a happy, simple-hearted society at Brother Gardiner's. The labors of George Pickering and Brother Stevens have raised up, under God, a promising society here. Sabbath 11. Henry Bohm spoke at six o'clock, myself at ten o'clock, H. Bohm again at two o'clock, when the Holy Sacrament was administered. I gave another discourse in the evening. We had crowded audiences. We returned for the night to Gardiner's. We passed through Berwick on Monday morning, and continuing on, stopped and supped with one Wells. We were here two years ago. We then prayed earnestly for, and with, this kind family. It was not a forlorn hope, it seems. The young woman who waited on us was brought out last August. We rode on through Kennebunk to Seiko. Lodging in a tavern, we were opposed, but persisted in having prayer night and morning. Asa Heath gave us our breakfast, and we pushed on to New Gloucester, making about eighty-four miles in the last two days. On Thursday we opened our conference and sat closely at work. End of section 31. Recording by Brian Keenan.